Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our budget committee meeting, uh, standing committee of the budget on the whole. Uh, standing committee of the whole on budget, sorry, for February 28th, 2024. I would like to call this meeting to order and acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Oh. Are we okay, Mr. Clerk? One more. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Looks like we need one more counselor. Okay, we're gonna try this again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and now we have quorum. Um, call to order, the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties that are signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. Next on our agenda is approval of the minutes of February 2nd, 7, 9, and 13. Motion was? Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Clary seconded by Councillor Mason. Question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Councillor Clary, I think I'm too short to see over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. A motion. There's been no additions or deletions. Councillor Mason, a seconder by Councillor Stoddard. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Hearing none, we can now move on to public participation. We have six persons signed up for our public participation. Um, each person has five minutes. We would ask that comments are, are respectful and they're directed to the chair. When you have 30 seconds left, the Katie will put up that sign. And when your time is up, then you get the red stop sign. So our first person um, is Dr. Monica Dutt. And the doctor is either here or by Zoom. Ah, here, thank you so very much. Welcome to budget. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah, okay. So, good morning everyone. My name is Monica Dutt and I'm here as the Regional Medical Officer of Health for Central Zone, which includes HRM. As a public health physician, my role is to work with others to understand and take action on issues impacting the health of communities. I also work as a family doctor and hear stories daily, as I'm sure you do, of people struggling to access and pay for food. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Nova Scotia Health Public Health in support of the budget ask for part B of the Just Food Action Plan. We appreciate the partnership that we have had with HRM for the past 10 years and the positive changes we have seen in communities related to Just Food. Public Health aims to promote and protect health so that all Nova Scotians can live healthier lives. This requires long-term comprehensive plans and strategic partnerships where local action can lead change. Municipalities are an essential part of this as every municipal decision impacts the health of residents. Part B of the Just Food Action Plan addresses community food security and food access with our, which are shared priorities of public health and a variety of municipal initiatives, many of which we've worked on together. Public Health commends Regional Council for supporting municipal food work. Council's endorsement of the HRM Food Charter and co-development of the Just Food Action Plan in 2019 was a pivotal point in facilitating the development of the plan. 
and this plan was carefully crafted using best practice research and learnings from municipal food action plans across the country and was tailored to our region through extensive engagement with community members across HRM, community-based organizations, and across government. Now, a question you may be hearing or thinking is whether municipalities should be addressing food security. So food security, it's a broad term. It encompasses household food security and community food security. Household food insecurity is a result of inadequate income and is a matter of public policy and requires policy intervention at the provincial and federal levels. Community food security is when all community residents have access to enough healthy, safe, and appropriate food through sustainable food systems, and that can be impacted by municipal programs and policies. Actions taken at the municipal level help address community food security and alleviate some of the pressures facing residents that you see, as well as frontline organizations trying to meet increasing demand for their services. Through funding and implementing Part B of the plan, we can increase opportunities for food production and food access within the municipality. Some examples which will yield immediate benefits for residents include increasing the capacity of community garden programs, implementing a community orchard, and the launch of the community of the emergency food truck. A priority outcome of this funding would be to establish the Halifax Food Council in partnership with HRM. This will set a foundation to advance food work at the municipal level. The Halifax Food Council will facilitate and support community-led action and connect governmental and non-governmental members. Secondly, it will oversee the implementation and monitoring of the Just Food Action Plan. Thirdly, it will establish a collaborative governance space for food system actors to identify and pursue shared goals for the regional food system. And lastly, it will hold and distribute grant funds to organizations or individuals engaged in food system initiatives. So I'd like to thank all of you again on behalf of Public Health for your support of this work over the years. With HRM as a key partner, the Just Food team has continuously built momentum to address community food security, and Public Health remains committed to supporting this work. As we move forward, we hope that you will consider fully funding Part B of the Just Food Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, do have a question for you from Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and De Deputy Mayor uh, Monica. Good to see you. How's my buddy doing? Is he doing well? You, good. you tell him I said hi. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, my question is, if you were sitting here in front of our provincial counterparts, uh, what gaps would you be talking about? And I'm, you know, I, I don't mean that to put you on the spot, but uh, or to put the problems on the spot because you said in your words, you know, what's the role the municipality has versus the other orders of government? Uh, but if you were sitting at Province House to talking to those folks, uh, you know, what are the, the bigger gaps that when it comes to food uh, security and, and insecurity? Yeah, like those are those broader policy issues. So what is our minimum wage? What is our income assistance? Do we have, you know, there's lots of talk about a school food program now. So that wouldn't be municipal action to take on, but those are all, you know, provincial level, you know, imperatives and policies that they should be putting in place to support everybody to be able to pay for and access food. So the type of things that we're talking about, you know, they are different types of initiatives, things like community gardens, emergency food truck, and all the work that's happened over the many years. I've heard stories about councillors when you've gone on bus tours through HRM being able to actually point to projects and initiatives that HRM has been part of funding, and those are the municipal level initiatives that I think you are really key for, while the province, absolutely, there's a lot left that they need to be stepping up on so that people have that foundation that they can then access food mm. because of those broader policies. Good. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Councillor Morse has a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you very much for coming here today to talk about this initiative. I'm, I'm very encouraged that we are going to be discussing it later today, and, and I hope it will be fully funded. Um, I'm wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about how important it would be to have um, assistance, income assistance that's geared to inflation and that takes into account the cost of living and the increases in food costs that we've seen over the last few years and that will probably continue in the near future. 
Absolutely, that's a whole, I think, policy gap that we're missing right now. We know income assistance rates have not been increased at the rate that they should be. We know that, you know, we can see that people are not able to avoid, uh, afford their housing, afford their food. So I think, you know, again, like that base level of being able to have not even just to survive, like the minimum wage, the income assistant rates, it's not even close to thriving, to be able to not only pay for your minimum amount, but to do the things to pay for your child's activities, to be able to go out once in a while. Like those are the things we want people to be able to afford, but food, you know, like I said, I work as a family doctor too, so I see that in my office daily, and then in public health, looking at a population level, we know that our, our rates of food insecurity specifically and also certain populations and groups and communities that are already you know systematically marginalized in a whole range of ways we know that food insecurity is a, a significant issue and the income assistance rates i think are a significant part of that and and is that why why would you say um that we have higher than the national average of food insecurity here <sighs> There's a number of different things. I don't know if any of my team wanna wanna add to that, but I think looking at kind of how slowly our minimum wage has increased, I think that is part of it. Um, our income assistance rates. I know I understand. There's been ongoing kind of work to transform what that looks like, but we don't quite know what that means and haven't quite seen the, the impacts of that. Not to say that work isn't happening. So I know there is a lot of effort to try to figure out. You know, everyone's trying to to see how we can have you know, less poverty, but in the end, we know that Nova Scotia has some of the highest child poverty rates and things like we know the you know, federal child benefit, that actually took people out of poverty. So when we can put that funding into people's, into families, into children, we know that has an impact on their food security. We've seen in Newfoundland and Labrador, when you increase social assistance rates, food insecurity decreased. So we know that that is a key part of, of food insecurity as well as, you know, housing insecurity and all the other areas that we care about. Thanks very much, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and my eye jumped and I missed the first speaker on the list, should have been Wendy Porches. Thank you. <laughs> my apologies. No worries. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Wendy Wilson. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning uh, about part B of the Just Food Action Plan for the City of Halifax. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to do this work in food justice. I am a mother, educator, artist, writer, and cultural advocate. I have worked in public education for over 20 years as a classroom teacher and as a curriculum consultant with the Department of Education Currently, I am a executive staff officer, BIPOC engagement and advocacy with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, and I am a co-founder of the African Nova Scotian Freedom School. I also am a part-time instructor at the Mount for the Bachelor of Education students. I grew up in Uniac Square, and I am a proud African Nova Scotian. I entered the world of food justice and food sovereignty, which is a very important term, through my role as an educator. My work in food justice started as a board member with Food Secure Canada, which later led to my work with the Coalition for Healthy School Food, uh, both provincially and uh, nationally. The Coalition for Healthy School Food's mandate is to advocate for a universal school food program. I am also part of the Indigenous and Black Food Sovereignty Advisory Circle, and I am a member of the Pan-Canadian African Food Sovereignty Network. I am speaking to you this morning as part of the Just Food Action Plan's African Nova Scotian and Black Food Sovereignty Working Group. We are a group of African Nova Scotians who have worked together closely over the last year to create a food sovereignty plan for the African Nova Scotian and Black community, which has led us to host community consultations as well as many conversations in the community to bring to you uh, both Part A and Part B of the Just Food Action Plan as it pertains to the black community. I didn't choose this work, this work chose me. As an educator, I can see how food impacts student learning and student achievement. I see how the lack of healthy food gravely impacts health of black and indigenous communities. 
36% of black children in Canada are food insecure, and over 50% of indigenous, indigenous uh, children are food insecure, secure, compared to 12% of white children. And of course, we want to provide equitable access to food, actually enough food for all children. The African Nova Scotian and Black Food Sovereignty Working Group hopes to see funding available to hire a African Nova Scotian and Black Food Coordinator to begin the work towards creating an African Nova Scotian and Black Food Hub where communities' needs are met holistically. A place to gather, a place to be fed, a place to purchase affordable, healthy, and cultural food, a place to pool our buying power, a place to gain knowledge and to pass it along, a place for all, both young and old, and a place to grow food as well as capacity. Creating the Food Hub will be a process, and the African Nova Scotian and Black Food Coordinator is integral to its creation. In the interim, we are asking to give the community an opportunity to grow their own food with the Kaja uh, container program. We also uh, would like to see a meal prep program that focuses on plant-based meals through a cultural lens. I fully support the Just Food Action Plan in its entirety and hope the plan is fully supported by the city of Halifax. Food not only nourishes our bodies, but it is foundational to our culture and connects us to our communities and more importantly, connects us to the land. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see no questions on the board. Appreciate your time. Our next speaker is Paul Service. Good morning, Madam Chair and Councillors. Uh, before I start today, I'd like to acknowledge the tragic loss of life in Sheet Harbour this week and recognize the incredible effort of Sheet Harbour, Eastern Shore, East Hants, Colchester, and Halifax SAR members that responded together to find the subjects. Sadly, it did not end the way that we hoped. Our thoughts were, are with her family and with all those that knew her and knew them. I'm Paul Service. I'm the Chief Director of Halifax Search and Rescue. I'm appearing today representing not only Halifax Search and Rescue, but Eastern Shore, Muscat Abbott, and Sheet Harbour Ground Search and Rescue. Together we make up the RESAR teams for the regional search and rescue organizations. A total combined strength of approximately 300 highly trained volunteers dedicated to public safety in our communities. Ground search and rescue teams play a vital role in our community, often operating under perilous conditions to save, save lives, provide aid, and ensure the safety of residents and visitors alike. GSAR volunteers have often been been referred to as the duct tape of the emergency response system, tirelessly dedicating themselves to serving others in times of crisis, stepping in to provide specialized skills and surge capability to emergency responders when our communities are facing adverse challenges. A few months ago in, council, in the council meeting that approved our 23-24 funding, Councillor Mancini referred to the three Fs of our responses over the last year, Fiona, fires and floods. I can now say that we've upped that to the four Fs with the inclusion of flurries. During the recent snow event, our, our members, <laughs> significant flurries, <laughs> uh, our, unhoused neighbor, uh, our members supported our unhoused neighbors in intense snow conditions and we responded to the first calls of HRN's Voluntary Vulnerable Person Registry. Eastern Shore also responded to support Cape Breton SAR in clearing snow for their vulnerable residents. We are neighbors helping neighbors. Through all of this, we have maintained our core mission to aid the lost, missing and injured person in the municipality. While our funding hasn't changed since the inception of the Search and Rescue Administrative Order, our call volume has drastically increased. With less than five weeks remaining in the fiscal year, Halifax SAR has exceeded its annual operational period count for last year. We have conducted 74 operational periods, 14 of those were for missing persons in our primary response area, and I'll note 75% of those are for individuals in mental health crisis, 15 were for mutual aid um, outside of our coverage area, and 30 time, 31 times we supported Halifax Emergency Management Office. All teams in the municipality have been providing mutual aid support as well as responding to the calls in their own area. We've been busy. During the wildfires and in the face of the fire, our volunteers worked with the RCMP 
to conduct evacuations of our communities. As fire operations continued, our members staff roadblocks with the RCMP, helping keep individuals out of the fire affected areas. Our marine crew, utilizing sonar, located a helicopter firefighting bucket in 30 feet of water that was dropped after a reported mechanical issue. The bucket was subse sub subsequently returned to the surface by our members and went back into active firefighting duty. A few months later, during the floods, our marine crew and their swift water rescue capabilities would again be tested as they helped rescue 30 people in Bedford. However, during their unwavering commitment and invaluable service, our search and rescue teams faced significant challenges, particularly when it comes to sus securing sustainable funding. All teams have transitioned from operating in the wilderness area of the municipality to regularly operating the streets of our communities. Teams now face increased pressure to provide basic identification clothing for all of our members and PPE so that they are readily identifiable to the public during emergencies. All teams are facing incredible capital expenditure pressures in the coming years. Several of the teams have immediate needs to replace aged vehicles. All teams have pressures to either complete building projects or have building project looming. Many of these projects have been continually pushed to ensure that we have the operational equipment required to respond when called. Fundraising hasn't been possible to the extent prior to COVID due to the high operational tempo in our training. Volunteers only have so much time. We have been working with community safety, uh, emergency management over the last year to update the funding model for the team. We had expected that this budget would be the first opportunity to see what the new budget would look like. Instead, we have found that our budget line is no longer showing in the HRM budget process. As Chief Director, this is extremely troublesome, leaving us unable to, to plan for the next fiscal year. All teams share the similar concern. Sustainable funding that we have hoped to see is not just about financial support. It is about recognizing the importance of investing in the safety and well-being of our community. It is about ensuring our search and rescue teams have the necessary equipment, personnel, and training required to respond. And it is about safeguarding the lives of our citizens and visitors, regardless of the circumstances. When a, tw when a hiker twists a knee on a trail, an individual becomes lost in the woods, or a community face flood or fire, or an unhoused neighbor needs transport to an emergency shelter, we have their back. Councillors, today that we ask, we ask that you have our backs uh, as we work through sustainable funding challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby has a question for you, Paul. Uh, first of all, Paul, I want to thank you and the uh, other volunteers of the Ground Search and Rescue teams that worked over the last couple of days on the search and recovery of the two people in Sheet Harbor. I want to thank you very much for that service. Um, I'm hoping that you and the team will, will get whatever therapy for the uh, trauma and stress that this caused. And I was kind of kind of curious about the provincial funding that the Ground Search Rescues may be getting or not getting and or how timely their, their, their um, recovery of expenses is from the province. And I want to know how involved the Ground Search Rescues are going to be with our new Vulnerable Persons uh, Registry, uh, uh, Vulnerable Persons Registry and in regards to doing wellness checks and stuff, I'd like to know what kind of participation you see the Ground Search Rescue doing with that. Uh, based on the first storm event that we had uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we've already been out checking on some of uh, the individuals that have called for assistance, have been relatively uh, either clearing snow uh, to make a trail in so a person can do a critical medical appointment, or it's been in the form of helping a, a senior that uh, couldn't close their door after the door opened uh, in the snow. So. Um, we are, uh, as we do with our unhoused neighbors, we are standing by waiting to support the municipality in whatever ways that we can during these events. So we're, we're at the table on that and we're actively looking forward to responding. Uh, when it comes to provincial funding, um, our experience is that the province has backed, uh, continues to back away from ground search and rescue uh, because it's a municipal responsibility. Uh, the, the funding that's been provided uh, hasn't changed uh, in I've been in the organization for 15 years. We've gotten a $3,000 contribution every year uh, in the form of the cash. The last couple of years, we've received $10,000. But I will say that the province does step up in the form of providing insurance. They provide uh, some of our expenses, like our mileage uh, reimbursements for our volunteers when, when we respond to a call. They do cover that. Uh, but there are no indications or no discussions um, for additional cash funding to be coming to the teams. Um, however, I will note uh, in the coming um, year that they are updating the TMR2 radio system, uh, which we use on a regular basis. Um, and that for Halifax Search and Rescue and, uh, represents an investment of approximately $180,000 into our, into our team uh, for enhanced uh, capability um, in communication, but it doesn't put additional uh, change in the bank to be able to, to fund the projects that we need to fund to, to maintain operation. Good morning. 
Councillor Smith, did you have a question? Thank you, Mayor and, and Paul and all your members for, for your service. Really quickly, can you, uh, if you had a magic number, do you have an idea of what that would be to, to deal with some of the, the shortfalls that you're mentioning? So uh, when we looked at, uh, and when we combine the totals of what we're looking for, I think it comes out to be about approximately $400,000 on an annual basis. Okay. So it's a, it's a massive jump from where we are today, but keep in mind our funding hasn't changed for close to a decade. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Service, very much. Um, was there anybody else? No, okay, thank you. I think our next uh, participant is Sue Kelleher from Feed Nova Scotia, and she's uh, on uh, line. Sue, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear it? Can you hear me? We've got you, yes, indeed. Yeah. Good morning, thanks for joining Brilliant. us. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Sue Callagher. I'm the Director of Innovation and Learning with Feed Nova Scotia. Uh, and I'm here to speak about Just Food and the importance of HRN Council's support to fully fund the staff ask for resources to adequately deliver Part B of the plan. Um, so just for some context, the Innovation and Learning team is a relatively new team within Feed Nova Scotia, and we have a mandate to support community to try new approaches and test new ideas to build food security. Uh, we know that food banks are not a solution to food insecurity, and we know that actions that further a vision of food sovereignty and food justice are core to the way forward. Um, the Just Food Action Plan is a bold and comprehensive plan to support the health and well-being of residents living throughout the Halifax Regional Municipality uh, centered around food sovereignty and food justice. Um, on Council's unanimous support for the report in Part A uh, of the report in 2023 brought the plan to our team's attention and we looked for opportunity to collaborate and support the vision to move forward. This led us ident to identify two key initiatives from the Just Food Plan to help move forward, uh, a social supermarket model and a rural food access program. Uh, and our team is currently in the design phase of these two initiatives, and we're really excited uh, to be launching um, uh, pilots in two communities in Halifax through the summer of 2024. And the learnings we gather from this uh, work will inform potential for further collaboration. So when I think about our team and our team's work, one of the biggest learnings for, for our, our new team we've had in doing this work is is the significant amount of labor and resources it takes back end uh, to convene, organize, facilitate and support community programming and community-based work that, that happens on the front end. Um, and we do understand and agree that uh, uh, Halifax Regional Munis Municipality would not be the sole funding source to implement all parts of uh, Just Food Part B. And we understand also that having multiple and diverse Funding sources will ensure the continuity and sustainability of the work. Um, however, without enough dedicated resources up front to steward the actions identified to support partnership development and advancement of the plan, the potential for the plan to launch and for it to grow to a point that the work can be scaled through provincial funding, through funding from foundations, and through other key focused organizations, including Feed Nova Scotia, may be limited. Uh, so, you know, we know it, it takes people power to push this work forward, and it will take people power to push Part B from a visionary document into action that will build momentum and change. Um, you know, just taking a step back and to speak to some of the points other folks have already highlighted, Halifax and Nova Scotia are facing unprecedented challenges related to population growth, health, affordability, and cost of living, and to climate change as, as well. And we believe the Just Food Action Plan connects these pieces and demonstrates a progressive and just way forward. Um, so we're excited to continue to work in partnership with the Just Food team to move, move the work forward in, in whatever way that Feed Nova Scotia can. And we hope Council will provide the full funding ask from staff for year one for implementation. So thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us. Uh, next, Douglas Wetmore, then Ben Hammer. Mm -hmm. 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Douglas Wetmore. I'm a resident of North End Halifax, and today I'm here to speak to Halifax Transit's proposed budget plan for the upcoming fiscal year on behalf of its Moreland buses. I sent a bit of an email around to, I believe, most of you. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not. But what I want to talk about today is, for starters, the proposed changes to the 1 and 10 are fantastic changes. We look forward to those coming. Long time overdue. Very glad to see. Proposed change to increase service on the 90 is a fantastic surprise to see. This has been a very large pain point for many residents, and we are so glad to see that happen. Uh, what we are here to talk about today, though, is we think Halifax Transit should take it a step further for your consideration. In the budget plan, a proposed change was made to reinstate all currently canceled trips from shortage of staffing. Among these are a lot of express routes, including routes 127, 159, 165, 168, 182, 185, 330, and 370. What we want to highlight is though these trips have not been operating at full capacity for over a year, none of them have passenger loads above 20 to 28 passengers per trip, and the only route among that list to receive any reported overload as of the Halifax Transit's quarter three report was Route 168 with a measly two overloads compared to the overall reported of 683. With that in mind, we request that Council request to amend Halifax Transit's budget to instead reallocate these resources towards the routes that are really experiencing pain points, those that are often overcrowded, those that receive much higher ridership, and those that are struggling overall due to the amount of riders on board and the latency they are expecting. Specifically, we want to highlight corridor routes 3, 4, 8, and 9. For reference, these corridor routes received three 12.9% of all overcrowded reports, four 10.2% of all overcrowded reports, route eight 10.1% of all overcrowded reports, and route nine almost 15% of all overcrowded reports. Among these, all of these routes receive between 45 to 54 passengers per hour during rush hour and anywhere between 40 to 53 passengers it, during the midday, noticeably higher than the proposed express routes that are to be reinstated. Ideally, we would like to see Halifax Transit shift these resources that would go to the reinstated routes to instead support both the peak and midday service of these routes, which are constantly seeing high service. To reiterate, this would be no change or cut back to existing service. These routes are not currently operating, and this, propose, this proposal only requests to reallocate these proposed new resources. Um, to get into some of the points that we expect Halifax Transit may make, as they are unfortunately presenting after me, is they may note that canceling some of these express routes may impact other routes that are also supposed to receive reinstated service. Our response to that is that none of those reinstated routes, this includes Route 55, 59, 65, 68, 84, and 85, also receive nothing close to the ridership of those corridor routes previously mentioned. In addition, none of those routes I just listed have received a reported overload except for Route 65, which likewise also received two overloads out of 680. Um, another comment we wanted to make is, what if Halifax comes back, Halifax Transit comes back and says ridership may not improve due to these changes? Our response to that is, how do we know ridership will improve by putting that service back to the routes that aren't actually getting nearly as much ridership? So without any sort of evidence to support that, we don't see that as a valid argument. Um, additionally, we want to highlight the, support, the question or comment surrounding providing transit to rural communities, which that did come up in our email chains. Our comment to that is that we unfortunately don't see the ridership in our rural corridors right now, specifically looking at the 300s and 400s. Ridership needs to be built on our core corridor network first 
before people in rural communities become more enticed to take transit into the city. And the stats for the routes 400 and 300 represent that. I'm out of time, so I will leave it there. Before you go, a question, uh, if you would entertain it, from Councillor Hensby. In regards to the regional transportation tax that these rural areas pay since uh, 2006, I believe, uh, talking about getting rid of the 300 and the 400 services, then why should we even have a regional transportation service if you want to take away the bus service? Can you clarify that for us? So our response to that is, first and foremost, those are not stats that we have easy access to. I am commenting specifically on the stats that Halifax Transit has been providing based on ridership. So in terms of cutting back service, I want to reiterate again that our request is not to remove any service that is currently operating as of the past service year. Our request is to instead shift resources that would have gone to adding service to these specific corridors into instead the routes that are much more demanding of this service. Uh, most interestingly, which I really hope anyone at this table makes a comment of during Halifax Transit presentation, is they note some of their lowest performing routes and even suggested cutting some of those routes. Among those are routes 26 and 57, which are proposed to be cut. But the other routes that they propose to be cut are routes, I believe, 370, which, funny enough, is supposed to get additional service as part of this. So I would really encourage someone at this table to ask Halifax Transit why they think it's a good idea to put resources onto this route, which a few pages up was suggested to be cut. We'll have that debate later, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason, on a question of clarification. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for coming today and thank you for your letter. It sure sparked a lot of discussion with councillors and in the community, didn't it? So uh, uh, good job there. I'm wondering if you could kind of walk through why your group picked uh, those particular routes. Uh, when you look at the list of trips to be reinstated, there's the whole uh, 130 series of expresses that are coming back, uh, potentially the 183. What, what kind of lens did you use when you picked which ones you thought could potentially not be reinstated versus, versus which ones you would uh, support being reinstated? Thanks. Right. Um, there might be some miscommunication with transit as from what I'm understanding, the 130 Express series are currently running at full service. Uh, the service, the page on Halifax Transit's website surrounding um, what trips are currently canceled is a little unclear. We went by the table at the bottom that had an asterisk that said this is most up to date. So I'm going to hope that, that was the one that was most up to date, but some clarification by transit would be appreciated there. So to reiterate, our request was that every single express route that is currently not operating, we request that those resources be put elsewhere. Um, I wanted to highlight again your request on why we think we, these, were you asking why we want these moved to the routes well, three, four, eight, and nine specifically? Or no, just no, I get it and I agree and you know that I've said okay. that at Transportation Standing Committee, it's just that on page six of the annual service plan, it has a list of everything that's gonna be reinstated and. Uh, so I guess a motion to ask for a supplementary report should say any other route that uh, doesn't meet the policy and moving forward together rather than try and cherry pick. Justin. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Douglas. Uh, ben uh, Hammer next. And then we will go to the floor if there are folks that wish to uh, speak. No problem. And Barrington yesterday morning. Sorry to hear that. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. And thank you for having public participation. Hi, I'm Ben Hammer. I work for the Ecology Action Center tracking active transportation across the province. But today, I'm here to speak to the Halifax Transit Budget and Business Plan. Firstly, congratulations on finally achieving pay parity for Accessibus drivers, but what took so long? Previously, you were paying Accessibus drivers $2 less an hour than conventional operators, and the, back, the pay gap used to be four times that size. And now that Accessibus drivers are on the same pay scale, 
conventional operators have been applying to shift to Accessibus, because it's a job that comes with different challenges, but more predictability and less harassment from passengers. While the operating costs per Accessibus trip are over $50, the convenience of door-to-door -door rides for people with disabilities greatly reduces barriers. While our fully low-floor conventional bus fleets enable spontaneous travel for all, every Accessibus trip reduces dwell time on the conventional bus network while better meeting passengers' accessibility needs, and this value should be considered in the upcoming Accessibus plan this year. Secondly, congratulations on being more transparent. Last year, I requested including staffing metrics like recruitment, retirement, and resignation counts in quarterly performance reports to see progress towards addressing the operator shortage. Recruitment trends are promising, and 38 more transit operator FTEs in this year's budget is a start, but 100 more operators are needed to resume planned service levels, and hundreds more will be needed for the BRT network. While I'm pleased to see that staffing metrics continue to be included, you've stopped differentiating between retirements and resignations. Yes, both are losses of staff, but a retirement indicates success at being an employer of choice, while a resignation indicates a failure at being an employer of choice. Retirement and resignation counts were separated in last May's quarterly report, so I know it's possible, but I'm concerned that they may have been merged in every report since to conceal retention issues. You've also begun to include safety metrics in your report, starting with distance between collisions as a start, but more safety metrics should be included going forward, and we shouldn't have to wait until the safety program plan is complete to include stats like lost time injuries per 100 employees, customer injuries per 100,000 boardings, or number of offenses, harassment, and assault uh, experience per 100 employees. Compared to other Canadian transit agencies' reports, Halifax Transit's quarterly reports are incomplete and illegible. The TTCs have the same page count, but every graph is presented with context, analysis, action items, what job title is responsible for that area of service delivery, and who is currently in that position. We deserve the same amount of transparency, but it may take a few more communication staff to put it together. And with Scotia Square scheduled to close for construction starting this May or June, likely for at least a year or more, we'll also need a few more communication staff who can quickly produce detour maps to better communicate detours to customers. The TTC pay scale for their graphic designers is about 60 to 80K, and two to three should probably be sufficient to make your quarterly reports easier to digest and your detour notifications easier for riders to read. If any counselor believes in transparent government and improving transit's user experience, I would encourage you to motion for a budget adjustment list item of $200,000 for two to three more communication staff to make it happen. The rest of the budget looks reasonable, but there are a few vague items. Uh, materials is up 36.7% and external seven services up 22.4%. What is included in these growing light items? That is my question for you, but you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a toilet seat. I'm not currently wearing a toilet seat. I was told it was a sign, um, permission to put it on. No is a perfectly fine option. I'm getting a no from security, so I won't. Um, but imagine me wearing a toilet seat. Uh, Halifax Transit's bus drivers do not have adequate bathroom access. Three routes on Christmas Day had drivers working eight-hour shifts without washroom access. And drivers on routes serving the Woodside Ferry Terminal only have bathroom access on weekdays and not weekends. Nature's calling is still a source of distracted driving even if no phone is involved. And holding it over the course of a driver's career contributes to higher rates of bladder and GI tract cancers. Designing bathroom access into route design and service planning will better contribute to reduced rates of collisions amongst Halifax Transit operators and improve road safety for all. Thank you, and let the drivers pee. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before you go, uh, Ben, if you would entertain a question from a couple of councillors. Uh, Councillor, Deputy Mayor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and welcome back, Mr. Mayor. Um, ben, you, when you began speaking about Accessibus, um, yay for parity for Accessibus drivers, that was important for us. But you made a second comment there, and it, was just, it went by too quick, and I was just wondering if you could uh, give me that phrase again about a recommendation for Accessibus that you had. So it takes a lot of time for users with mobility bus, mobility aids to board and alight transit vehicles. And whilst our entire fleet is low floor to accommodate that, um, excessive bus trips are a lot more convenient for accessibility needs. 
And so shifting accessible trips to Accessibus uh, for not spontaneous travel, but things seven to 30, 90 days in advance when people can book, that reduces dwell time, the time that buses are stopped to board and alight passengers across the network. And that travel time savings across the system is something that should be valued in what Accessibus offers as part of our transit system. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you so much for the clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you. One more question, uh, Councillor Smith. Hey, thank you for being here, and I hope that toilet seat wasn't from your house and used. I hope it was a, a brand new one and you didn't bring it here for nothing. Um, just really wondering if you can, so, so you mentioned TTC uh, around what your, some of your comparisons, and I don't know, the, the last time I looked it was a two point something billion dollar budget, so are there any other transit services around the country that you can compare to like transparency and, and resources that are more closer to, to us? We don't need to have a population of six million to support two to three more communication staff to deliver the same degree of transparency in our reports. Like it's, we have the tax base to provide as transparent a report as the TTC does. Um, it's not a matter of we're too small a system, we're too small a tax base. It's just, we need a few more communication staff to make it happen. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and, and just to be clear, I, did, I didn't say we're too small. Just, I was just wondering if there was another system that yeah. is doing that in, in comparison to us, but if that, yeah, that's, that's helpful. It's, it's a fairly mixed bag. Okay. The TTC definitely sets a high bar, right. um, but not something we can't achieve here for a relatively modest cost. Okay, no, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Ben. Good luck with your uh, recovery from your injury. That's the list of names we have. If there's anybody else that wishes to speak, you can come forward, just raise your hand and please, yep. Just give us your name and where you live and the floor is yours for up to five minutes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Min Tan, I'm from downtown Halifax. Uh, before approving the Halifax Transit budget and business plan, uh, I would like you to consider challenging Halifax Transit to be more transparent with its information for better public engagement, context, and accountability, and to be more aspirational in setting some of its resource, uh, some of its goals to use its resources better. Keeping its information, performance information to itself is a great way to minimize debate, deflect or eliminate criticism, and skirt accountability. Halifax Transit has a lot of data it uses for its key performance indicators that is neither private nor confidential, but which it does not share, does not share in a meaningful format, and or share in a timely manner. So for example, it shares daily ridership totals, but not peak hour breakdowns necessary for overcrowding analysis that it has and reports on. It shares reports on boardings, but sets ridership targets in passenger, passenger trips on page eight without explaining what passenger trips are. It requests FTE changes on page two, but provides no current totals like with other indicators to show how meaningful uh, the changes might be, especially for operators, despite frequently blaming a severe operator shortage for various forms of poor service. The province lists the name and salaries of every employee by department. So is it too much to ask for just some subtotals as a base context here? If Halifax Transit is sin truly sincere about public consultation, it needs to rectify the situations described, among others, to engage in more meaningful dialogue. So before approving this budget, my first request for council is to consider requesting Halifax Transit commit to being more transparent with its data that could be publicly provided in a timely manner and supplement the examples in the report that I have specified. Uh, with regards to more aspirational goal setting, Halifax Transit is rather tolerant of what, it, what little it gets for its uh, efforts and resources and seems very unmotivated to do better. This is true from its quarterly KPIs to targets in this budget I will focus on for lack of time. So for example, page eight, Halifax Transit has planned for a measly increase of 1.6% in 
in bus passenger trips, population increase would probably exceed 1.6%, meaning it expects people to use the bus less, despite its buses currently being less full than in 2019 on average. Indeed, it expects everyone to use regular bus service 2.8% less, but that's passenger trips per capita, and passenger it serves per hour to decrease by 6.1%. A similar set of unmotivating targets exists for ferry usage. So is this Halifax Transit's idea of excellence? Is this how it sees its role to mitigate climate change? Are there public service values to expect people to use a service less or to do less for more that I don't know about? Maybe there's a moving forward together plan for automobiles, I don't know. Of course, asking people to take the bus less would alleviate overcrowding, sarcasm intended for the record, but did their leadership really think these targets would impress everyone? So my second request of council would be to consider challenging or perhaps demanding uh, Halifax Transit to provide more aspirational ridership, service, and other targets along with details for how it will meet them before approving this 10.7% budget increase request. I thank you for your time and I'm open to take questions. Thank you, Min, very much. Uh, I see no questions. Thank you for joining us. Is there anybody else that wishes to come forward? Good morning, sir. Give us a clue who you are and approximately where you live and the floor is yours. Hey, Colin May, Dahlia Street, Dartmouth. Lived there in only almost 41 years. I wanted to talk about housing, the unprecedented crisis in housing across this country, and to offer an opportunity to develop homes in Dartmouth. On January 29, 2019, HRM declared a climate emergency. I think it's time you declared a homeless emergency time to declare war on homelessness. I believe that the will and determination of three levels of government can be put to a housing development in central Dartmouth, a location close to schools, transit, and a shopping center, a place where children can walk to elementary, junior high, and high school. I'm talking about Brightwood Golf Course. 104 acres, which pays just $54,000 in taxes. My suggestion is that Mayor Savage speak with provincial and federal governments and gain ownership of the golf course. I've been looking at golf courses in city centers in the past week across the country. I've yet to find one in the middle of a city. Citadel Hill is only 46 acres, yet it provides 49 acres, pays $3.4 million in taxes. Acquire Brightwood and then have an open competition for planners, architects to develop a brand new community in there, a community for all people, all incomes, all ages, all abilities. Right now, I wouldn't expect that anything would be built on there for at least 12 months. But if you go back to World War II, the Americans were turning out 10,000 ton cargo ships in 30 days. It's what saved Europe in World War II. And if you bring that attitude that this can be done and this will be done, then you can make a tremendous impact on housing in this area. And if you have any questions, I have even more data, but I'll just quote Maya Angelou. Courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. <clears throat> you can practice any virtue erratically, 
but nothing consistently without courage. And I'd suggest that all of you have the courage and ask the Mayor to talk to Premier Houston and Mr. LeBlanc, our Premier, Prime Minister Trudeau, and outline the seriousness, not just in this community. It astounds me that we have such a homelessness situation. I've seen it elsewhere in the world, but never have I ever seen it in a developed country to the extent that we have in Canada today. It is shameful. We should all be ashamed. Thank you. Oh, if you've got any questions, I can, I can I'll try my best. Just before you go, and uh, we know we can get a hold of you in City Hall uh, most uh, Wednesdays, so. Uh, Councillor Outset has a quick question for you, Colin. Just a quick comment. What do you think about the idea, Colin, that instead of having the wrath of, go of golfers uh, come at us, but could you not make the same arguments and suggestions that you just made for Shannon Park, which we are looking into? Well, I understand they already are going to build homes there. Right. It's not as central as Brightwood. No, but I'm saying there are other options to the golf course, because I, yeah. I like the spirit of what you're proposing. Oh, but, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from Brightwood to the transit terminal and the shops, and it's only 1,800 feet. Right. So, to, there is right. no way. I when I've been look, I haven't finished looking at all the cities in the country, but I was good. I spent hours going through and looking at golf courses. Right. There's it's just, just my, my point was it's just one option. Your, your spirit of what needs to be done, I think, is correct, but there are other locations as well. But but thanks for being here, and hopefully Gloria wasn't listening. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Is there anybody else that wishes to come forward at this time? Is there anybody else that wishes to come forward and address the budget committee at this time? Is there anybody else? If not, I want to thank those who've taken time to be with us in person and uh, online today. Okay. We're going to go to our reports. The first one in, uh, today is Halifax Transit. We have our team with us. Familiar faces. I turn it over to you, Dave Riggi. Good morning. Just one sec to get myself organized. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of Budget Committee, Dave Rigi, Executive Director of Halifax Transit, uh, here to present to you our 2024-25 uh, budget and business plan. Uh, and as, as I always do before I get into the presentation, I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge uh, everybody here from the transit team who uh, plays a huge role in getting this together. Uh, one new face this year, uh, Norman Hendry is our new uh, Director of Transit Fleet. Uh, Patricia Hughes, who you all know, uh, Director of Planning Customer Engagement. Uh, Phil Harrett, Director of Transit Operations. Victoria Pierce Goodland, uh, Director of Employee Support and Engagement. Hannah Forsyth, our Business Unit Coordinator and uh, Jeff Drover is our financial business partner and I want to thank them for all of their, their fantastic work both in bringing this together but also um, everything they do day in, day out to, uh, to lead our transit system. So the mission and service areas, uh, our mission uh, unchanged to uh, work together to provide a safe, reliable and sustainable transit system. Um, and then of course our three service areas, I think everybody knows Accessibus, bus, our, uh, our door to door uh, paratransit service, uh, conventional service is the, the fixed route service. Uh, and then of course the ferry, uh, our, uh, our cross harbor ferry service. 
Uh, going to start off with uh, with success, uh, successes for the for the year, uh, leading off with ridership recovery. Um, you may recall we did get back to pre-COVID levels back in September, so uh, very very happy about that. Um, and we have kind of stayed around that level uh, since then, so we are we are kind of hovering around there. Uh, average was uh, 87.5 uh, for the entire year of, of pre-COVID. So. Uh, I think as uh, for those who were at the uh, Transportation Standing Committee last week, we're kind of at the point where we can stop talking about COVID ridership, I think, and just uh, you know look forward at, uh, at growth, but that was a good milestone. Uh, the launch of our HFX Go uh, Fare app, so I think everybody knows this is the app where you can use to, uh, to pay your fares uh, digitally. Uh, we have seen a significant increase in, uh, in purchases through this app versus regular means. Uh, November we were at 9% when it was first uh, launched and uh, just have data up to the end of January we were at 19%. So we are seeing some, uh, some pretty good growth there. The uh, arrival of our first electric bus, uh, we had an event uh, a week or so ago for those who could make it at Ragged Lake. Uh, we did receive our first uh, electric bus for keeps uh, and expect we will begin on road testing uh, in the next little bit. So we're just going through our own internal processes to get that bus ready for the road. Uh, tied into that, uh, the Ragged Lake expansion, a lot of work uh, is complete. Uh, that's to accommodate the electric bus fleet. Wanted to touch briefly on emergency support. Uh, this, this is uh, probably an aspect of Halifax Transit which is a bit less visible uh, to the public, maybe thankfully, um, but we do have a significant role in emergency management. Um, and this year uh, our employees did great work uh, supporting our community both through the wildfires and floods, uh, evacuating residents who, uh, who weren't able to evacuate uh, in their own vehicles. Uh, and you know, I, I'm proud of the work we do on a regular basis, but you know, it really makes, you know, makes my heart proud when I see uh, our, our team uh, as a whole stepping up uh, when the municipality um, is in times of crisis. Uh, moving forward together, service changes. Uh, we did introduce four new routes this year and reinstated approximately 50% of the trips that were previously uh, reduced due to staffing challenges. Uh, amendments to bylaw U100 uh, supporting uh, housing and homelessness. Uh, this was the uh, the approval that council gave us to um, basically work with uh, Max Chauvin and his team to uh, provide uh, transit fares to him to help him support uh, the people that he works closely with. Uh, of course, uh, another bylaw, T1200, the transit safety bylaw. This was the, the bylaw that came into effect uh, back in October uh, as an important step towards, uh, towards protecting uh, our operators and the public. Uh, the transit code campaign, a uh, really big push on safety this year. You see the picture on the slide there of one of our, one of our longtime operators. Um, this was the fifth transit uh, code education campaign. Uh, and really the focus here was about helping uh, members of the public see our employees as the people they are rather than just a uniform, you know, behind the steering wheel or on the ramp of the ferry. Uh, new terminal supervisors, uh, these were approved by council at budget last year. So these are the, uh, the more visible presence at uh, some of our terminals that experience the most security issues. Um, and I am happy to say, you know, no data yet on their impact, but we are anecdotally seeing a really positive impact on the facilities in terms of uh, the number of severe incidents dropping. Um, you know, we've had feedback from the operators that it feels more safe because there is that visible uniform presence. and they're really getting out there and engaging with the people at the terminal. So that is very early success, very happy with that. Support for major events, uh, we provided service in support of the uh, CFL Touchdown Atlantic event at St. Mary's last summer, um, and also provided shuttles for the uh, North American Indigenous Games. Uh, tied into that the, uh, with the North American Indigenous Games, uh, our staff amongst other municipal employees were identified as uh, safe people who attend, uh, participants and athletes could approach uh, if, they, if there were any issues uh, during the event and uh, what we've heard back from the organizers is that they saw uh, athletes being able to actually uh, experience the city and travel through the city more than any other event they've seen, uh, largely due to this, this safe, uh, safe places, safe people uh, initiative. So moving into some KPIs, uh, the first one up is passengers per hour. So as noted, we continue to see increases in ridership um, and uh, our ridership did, re did rebound towards pre-pandemic levels. Um, I will note on the graph, you do see a slight decline in passengers per hour. 
Um, this isn't a decrease in the number of riders we expect, but we are putting in a lot of service hours. So when you do the math, it, uh, be, be, you know, you have an increase in passengers, also a large increase in service hours. Um, it does result in a, um, a decrease in passengers per hour. Uh, moving into service hours and ridership, uh, ridership is projected to grow in 24-25, uh, um, as, as noted on the graph there. Um, and then one thing I would note with ridership, we, we do, when we, when we project ridership in something like a budget presentation, um, it has a direct correlation to revenue and our assumptions around revenue. So we do tend to take a bit of a conservative approach into what we think uh, ridership will come back as because if we project a certain level of ridership and it's higher, great, we have more revenue. If we project a certain amount of ridership and it comes lower, well, suddenly we're looking at a deficit. So that's, uh, you know, when you look at the numbers there, uh, we're in such a period of growth. I mean, yeah, it's quite likely we're gonna exceed that, especially with all the service we're putting in, but um, we do always take that conservative approach when, uh, when putting in ridership. 2425 planned work, uh, first under integrated mobility, uh, working away on a rebuild of the, the Burnside Transit Center. This really is, uh, the, uh, is required for the next step in, uh, in greening our fleet. Uh, the 2425 deliverable will be around detailed planning and design work to really get us into a place to, uh, to apply for phase two funding to actually do the work and uh, fill it with buses. Uh, additionally, we will begin work on uh, the, the next transit service plan, uh, which you would know as the moving forward together plan. Um, looking at a bit of a different approach, I think what we found is that a five-year service plan used to, used to work, um, you know, but now we're at a point where uh, with growth happening so rapidly, things are changing rapidly, a five-year plan, is, it, it can't keep up basically. So uh, looking at having a shorter kind of rolling plan, probably two to three years, allows us to be more nimble, um, it also allows more touch points with council during a term uh, in terms of what the service changes look like. Uh, moving into uh, excessive bus, work will continue to advance new methods uh, for automated and consistent client communications, uh, sp particularly around uh, booking trips, um, along with a review of the eligibility criteria for that service. Uh, the draft safety program, uh, that's, that, was, that, that was here at council back in December, so I won't speak a lot about that, but that's basically the work for us to go away and look at that next level of a, a safety and security program and what that could look like uh, for Halifax Transit. Uh, in the environment, uh, zero emission bus, I mean, that, that's the big one. We, we are expecting to get uh, our remaining 59 uh, battery electric buses delivered uh, through, the, through the fiscal. Um, don't have a firm date for when they're actually gonna be all in service. Uh, it is, you know, it, it is a major change to our operation that we are working through. Um, I would say no earlier than the end of the calendar year, but uh, you know, we'll have more updates to go on that as we, we gain more experience with our pilot bus and uh, everything else. Uh, moving into service excellence, that's uh, fair, phase two of the HFX GO uh, FAIR program. So really that involves um, installation of validators on all the buses and at the ferry terminals. So right now if you buy a fare on the HFX GO app, uh, you show the operator, you show the security guard at the ferry terminal, they let you on. So it is a visual validation and that was always intended to be an, an interim step. Uh, so with the validators, it'll be scanned and the validator will, will either say yay yeah, or nay if it's a valid fare, it takes the human element out of it. Um, and those are installed on about half of the fleet right now, so that is, that is moving right along. Uh, ultimately, that will allow us to pursue what we call open payment, which is basically a fancy word for you can tap your credit card or debit card on the, on the validator and pay like that without even having to have the app at that point. So moving into the annual service plan, so uh, this outlines the proposed service adjustments for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the highlights are the, the final year of the Moving Forward Together plan, uh, addressing some newer pressures related to growth, uh, service reductions on low performing routes to allow better use of those resources, um, increasing resource availability to allow for improved tactical responses to operational and overcrowding issues throughout the service day, uh, and finally, reinstating trips that have been temporarily suspended due to staffing shortages. Uh, you know, th these were basically trips we had to pull out because we, uh, we just didn't have the people to run them. So the result is that on a lot of them, and there, a lot of them are the express routes. We do have these kind of mangled 
uh, service frequencies at rush hour, which is, which is quite difficult to navigate. You have uh, busy express routes that have 40 minute gaps in their service at rush hour. So um, in our view, uh, that, that is a very important thing to do. Uh, and right now it is a bit of a broken service and it is a, a, not a service that's kind of easy to navigate for folks. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the service change that is moving forward together plan, um, so significant adjustments to corridor routes, uh, one Spring Garden and uh, 10 Dalhousie. A big part of this is going to be fixing schedule adherence. Uh, both routes have significant lateness issues, which, you know, uh, cartwheels into a bunch of other issues. Uh, so doing that work, um, additionally, the uh, One Spring Garden will be servicing Gottagen in both directions, which has been a long uh, sought after uh, request of the community, so happy we can do that. Um, the Route 10 will become a branched route, which uh, we have a few of those in existing, uh, the six and the nine come to mind, where basically it allows you to focus a higher service level on the busier part of the route, and the outer part of the route will have a bit less service. So uh, carrying that model over to that. Uh, 192 and 196, uh, providing uh, express peak hour uh, service to uh, communities in Bedford. Uh, now, th the great thing about these, A, it's a much quicker ride uh, than, than taking the 90, for example, um, but also this should relieve pressure on the routes 8 and 90, where we are seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of overloading issues. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, a five-year service plan is, is a bit long for the amount of change we've seen now, never mind the fact that we're about seven years into our five-year plan due to the pandemic and staffing challenges and everything else. Um, so, so with that in mind, we, there are some proposed service changes that actually aren't in the, the, uh, the moving forward together plan, um, but you know, just looking at the timely need for them, uh, this, this is part of our recommendation. Uh, so the first one is around Port Wallace. Uh, as we know, Port Wallace is a new major growth area. It is under construction. We understand uh, this fiscal year, it will be possible for us to get in there. Uh, so the, the initial uh, recommendation here is it is an extension and rerouting of Route 54 to cover off those new areas. Um, and the, uh, the idea is that as that community grows, we can continue to move that route further and further into the community as road connections are available. Uh, Route 90 Larry UTEC has seen uh, consistent uh, and significant overcrowding during peak hours, so uh, the rush hour service on that will double to every 15 minutes. Uh, so to help accommodate these changes, um, it is proposed that uh, some resources be reallocated from routes um, that are well, well below the, uh, the ridership uh, guidelines. Uh, the 178 and 179 are peak hour expresses to the Woodside Ferry Terminal. Um, even pre-COVID, ridership was very poor on those. It never really, it was our attempt to get more people to take the bus to the Woodside Ferry and it just, it didn't pan out. So um, those have been suspended since February 2023 um, and expected that we wouldn't bring those back. Um, and then routes 26 Springvale, 57 Portland Hills have been consistently well below uh, the ridership guidelines, so the idea is that those would also um, be permanently removed and those resources reallocated to uh, some of these other, uh, other high priority items. A final area of the annual service plan I wanted to highlight is a section around uh, service quality and reliability because we are taking a bit of a creative uh, different approach on this one. So typically when we have an annual service plan in front of council, uh, all the service changes are intended to be like permanent in the, perm in, in the public timetable um, and then they're kind of there for you know forevermore or until they're, they're, they're further changed. What we're seeing with the overloads is the Route 90, absolutely consistent overloads, easy to see, time of day. It's, so that one was a no brainer to add, to add additional service. The challenge we're seeing when we actually start digging into and analyzing the, uh, the other overloads in the system, and there are a lot of them, there isn't a very good consistent pattern. I mean, there are some routes that overall have more overloads, but they're not at consistent times of day, um, even days of the week. I mean, like you can look at routes where you'll have a, um, you know, a cluster of overloads one day and then there's nothing for two days. So when we looked at that, it didn't really make sense to try and uh, tackle all of that with some fixed route adjustments. Rather, what we want to do here is set aside a certain amount of resources, so that's service hours, operators, buses, 
to allow our operations team to dynamically adjust to what's happening. Because what's, you know, yes, there is a, a high level of demand for transit, but the other thing that frequently generates overloads is uh, service disruption. So the example I would use, you have a bus that's supposed to come every, every 20 minutes. Uh, one of them gets very late for some reason, there's an accident or whatever happens. Suddenly that bus is so late it doesn't make its next trip and you have a gap in service. So that the next bus is trying to basically pick up the work of two. So what this will allow us to do is our operations team can monitor this um, and actually have spare buses to send out, sorry, to deal with some of these things. So trying to avoid that case where you have one bus trying to do the work of two, therefore will help mitigate a lot of the overload. So that is, uh, th that, that is the rationale there. Now the good thing is um, because it's not actually scheduled work, we have the flexibility to move it where it needs to go. And if we start seeing uh, repeatable patterns developing, then we can actually schedule it in permanently. So we have a bit of flexibility there to best, uh, to best address it. Moving into staff counts, uh, the proposed budgeted FTEs is uh, 1105.4. I think we have a few co-op terms that might be uh, resulting in a 0.4, uh, which is an increase of 49 uh, FTEs from last year. Uh, 42 of those FTEs are directly related to the moving forward together plan and the, the service plan increases. So those are your operators, mechanics, uh, those type of positions um, that really just have to happen for the role. And, and I would note that actually, um, that was actually approved in last year's budget. So because we're because of the staffing challenges and that we are behind in implementing, so that, that isn't actually um, a new ask. The, the remaining seven, um, one position for a project controller within uh, the operations team, um, you've certainly been seeing a, a, lot, a lot of fill, more than you probably did of previous operations directors, and I can say that's just going to continue because uh, the amount of project work that the operations team is now taking on that wasn't the case before, this is a support for that. Uh, two safety coordinators, uh, which uh, would, will, it will ultimately report up to me um, to advise on uh, things around our safety compliance and our compliance with occupational health and safety requirements. Uh, three positions are the ones that we'd brought to council um, back in December around the safety program. So that's a program manager, business analyst, and project controller. Uh, finally, one FTE and outreach and engagement specialist. Uh, that is a, uh, on an 18 month uh, capital funded term uh, to support the electric bus project and all of the uh, you know, customer engagement pieces and communications around that. So getting into a summary of operating uh, budget changes. So the overall, the proposed transit budget has grown uh, approximately 7.9 million uh, over last year. Uh, this is primarily driven by increases uh, in multiple collective agreements within transit. Uh, some of the service enhancements, uh, the service improvements moving forward together plan around 2.2 million. Um, there's a, there's a, an item there, 302,000 uh, listed as safety program. Apologies, it is actually two initiatives. That's the, uh, the two safety coordinators, which I just mentioned, which are really occupational health and safety focused. Um, and then the remaining FTEs are part of the, uh, the, the safety security uh, program plan that, uh, uh, that we had had here back in December. Uh, $50,000 for FAIR solutions. Uh, this is basically an amendment to our, to our FAIR uh, electronic fare collection agreements uh, as the, the electric buses and some changes at the ferry terminals uh, weren't in the original scope, so that is part of that. Um, a few other items of note. Um, so yeah, so I, I talked about the collective agreements piece. Um, th there's, a lot, there's some other kind of bundled inflationary pressures in there, um, 813,000. Uh, materials, uniforms, and security. Um, a big part of that, we are seeing a lot of increased costs on the ferry side uh, for things like dry docking, um, the various things it, it takes to keep the, uh, the ferry fleet uh, going. Um, we are also potentially looking at a regulatory change uh, through Transport Canada next year on the ferry side um, that will uh, basically require some more from us, which will, which will have some cost implications. So that's built into there as well. Um, on the revenue side, uh, so the breakdown of the revenue, there is a uh, $700,000 in there which is tied to a proposed fare increase. 
Uh, so that is uh, 25 cents on the uh, on the single fare, and then you know that average leverage across all other fare options. Um, the assumption around that is a September implementation. Uh, finally, 1.83 million uh, in additional revenue tied to rev uh, ridership growth, and that is based on current trends in ridership. Um, the assumption around that, uh, you know, again, we are we are on the conservative side on that because uh, we don't want to end up with uh, less revenue than we expect. Uh, and that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and we're happy to take any questions. Right, Dave, thank you to you and your team. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, will you lead us off here? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Dave. I'm going to throw the motion on the floor here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I move that the Budget Committee, one, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Halifax Transit proposed 2024-25 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation attached to the staff report dated February 28th, 2024 into the draft 2024-25 operating budget and two, approve the transit service modifications as proposed in the accompanying 2024-25 annual service plan to the staff report dated February 28th. 2024. Seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. And thank you, uh, Dave and team, for all of the work uh, that's been done. There, as you said, there's a lot happening all at once, and it's really fast, uh, especially with uh, JRTA right now uh, out there uh, holding community consultations, uh, meeting with people in these engagement sessions, learning from the communities as far as what are they looking for with transit. And it's wonderful to see them doing this work in our communities, and it, uh, it's certainly getting the conversation going about, wait a minute, what about this, what about that, H how can we make this happen? So, you know, just a few things I want to thank staff for the work uh, with regards to the e-buses, getting those up and running, HFX Go, I love it. <laughs> love the app. It's so easy to use. Um, you know, our ridership numbers are looking good. Uh, uh, addressing the overloads on the 1, the 10, like there's some really good work that's happening. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm looking at this budget and business plan and I'm saying, wait a minute, where are the goalposts, right? Where are the goalposts? So if, if we're jumping from that kind of five-year plan to be a little bit more flexible, which I totally agree with, from an operational perspective, we need to be flexible, we need to be able to move. But at the same time, um, as we heard today, you know, this, this concept of aspirational planning, uh, looking at ways that we can continue to grow. And I know we've got the Joint Regional Transportation Agency doing a whole bunch of work uh, and hopefully helping us do some of that oper operational and aspirational planning. Um, but in this, I see nothing on parking rides. Uh, yes, we've got 14, where's number 15? Like we understand in my area, in District 13, District 14, we've been looking for a new park and ride. We've got the new one in West Bedford, in District 16, but we don't have uh, the connection between uh, Hubley Park and Ride and the West Bedford Park and Ride, and the 433 isn't really connecting them. And we've talked about this last year, talking about it again this year. So I feel like we're missing the boat as far as being able to actually schedule that better so that we can ensure that we increase ridership and stop encouraging people to actually take their car. We've got to make it easier. We'd have to have it, you know, make it reliable. Um, and I think too, like, <laughs> When we look at this overall budget and business plan, I'm gonna put you on the spot, where's the rural? Where is any kind of mention of our community partners advancing uh, work with those community transit organizations? They were here in front of uh, transit uh, standing committee asking for more funds. We've moved forward on that, but I don't see this in the budget and business plan. And so, you know, those are a few questions to start with, but closing any rural corridor routes would mean that we've just given up and said, oh, we don't want to provide rural transit. We don't want to work uh, to, to create um, an increase in ridership or uh, work to, uh, with the community to advance ridership. And that's a problem because that's our business. That's our bread and butter is to get people on transit. That's why we're here and that's why we're doing this work. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Dave, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to committee. So um, a, a couple things there. So in terms of, you know, where the goalposts and, and the, I guess the, the aspirational part, this, 
So today really is a nuts and bolts plan, like, like straight up. It's, you know, the aspirational stuff really comes through, you know, the rapid transit strategy, which council has approved. Um, it comes through the next service plan. Like, like those are the parts where you're really looking forward to go, how are we gonna grow? What are our targets, all that. Today we're talking about what route goes where. So, so yeah, there's not gonna be a lot of aspirational things kind of in this because this is really just how, how, do, we, how do we do it. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of park and rides, um, I mean, so yeah, we did we did open one recently, as you mentioned. Um, the other one, the other one on the books right now is Margerson Road. That's, I think it's 2027. It hasn't changed from where it was in the budget last year, so that's uh, so that's still out there. 2027. Uh, I think I have to double check that, but off the top of my head, I think it's 2027. Um, in terms of rural, so I mean, so the money for rural is built into our into our plan, and uh, you know, we uh, we were happy to see that council approved the increase in funding uh, very recently. Um, the other thing out there uh, in terms of rural, there is a review of the whole rural program out there as well. So that uh, you know that that's kind of the next big thing I think because r right now council's approach yeah. through policy to rural local transit is through the is through the partnership program. And, I, um, and, and my point is it's not in here. Because that rural review is really important. It's underway right now. Uh, staff are working on that policy. Whatever policy changes come forward is recommended. So uh, you know, my, my point is that these are, the, these are really important things that um, help a community believe <laughs> in, in this transit, believe that change is coming, because as Councillor Hansby pointed out earlier, um, they're paying for it. Yeah. You lost your mic. I'm back. Uh, no, th thank you, Councillor. Uh, point taken on that. Um, and the other thing I would mention, uh, you had mentioned reducing uh, rural routes. I just want to clarify, we're, we're not talking about uh, reducing any, any rural routes through this, through this plan. Uh, we're actually talking about returning service uh, to the 330, 370 uh, as part of this plan, so. It was promised. It, you know, so the 330 was supposed to come back, it was supposed to be yep. reinstated. So that is lost to the community. Um, and I guess I, I'm out of time, but I can come back to that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, just uh, a few questions. Uh, just curious as to how closely do you work with the uh, regional plan team? Does it mean as they do their work gearing up for boundary expansion, I'm just wondering how closely you folks work with that process to make sure that uh, you're, you're ready for boundary expansion when it comes. Uh, Margeson Park and Ride 2027, nice, thank you. <laughs> that is, uh, that's gonna make uh, a world of difference uh, in an area that is expanding rapidly. Um, good to hear that the uh, rural review is underway and uh, uh, I do uh, recommend that uh, one of the places you look at again is uh, North Beaver Bank because uh, I know the community is, uh, is back talking about uh, reinstating the, uh, the Beaver Bank bullet. Uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, you know, we, I don't know if uh, you know, fractured services is what uh, we want, but uh, the, uh, the talk is in the community for sure. They're still a little bit uh, uh, bitter about having uh, the uh, north end or the north portion of the uh, Beaver Bank service cut. Uh, um, and my final question is uh, just how much of your planning work is now in a holding pattern due to the, the JRTA? Uh, and just wondering if, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're in a holding pattern because of their work and, uh, and you know, if, if yes, then what can we do to uh, make sure that our planning work continues down a similar path so we're not left behind? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the regional planning team, we do work very closely with them. Our, our planning team uh, is a member of, of their, uh, their work, um, as well with, I would say, the, uh, the strategic, strategic transportation planning team within planning and development. So we really do work uh, very closely with them. Um, I, I did just, just to make sure I wasn't making a mistake, I did just look. I remember the budget for Margeson is in fiscal year 27, 28. So uh, that is there. Um, in terms of the uh, the JRTA, that, that's not holding anything back that we're doing. Um, I mean, we're, we're carrying on our work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to sit on the board of uh, technical advisory board for the JRTA, so I think, uh, you know, working very closely with them as they do their planning work, and, and I, I, I'm very optimistic there'll be very, very good uh, alignment between 
between what we have in terms of a rapid transit strategy and, and those sorts of things and the work they're doing. Perfect. Uh, I just have uh, just one more uh, quick comment, actually just a single word, Lucasville. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> thank you, um, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dave and team, uh, thanks very much. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments and a few questions. You know, I remember in being elected 2016 and the conversation around Accessibus. Man, we've come a long way, and I'm so proud of the work that we've done, and I'd like to hear from the Deputy Mayor because she's closer to understanding, uh, because of her previous life, uh, about the folks that need to use excessive bus, but uh, where we were having conversations about how terrible it was, and tears, and the impact, and negative impact, man, uh, we continue to do good work there. I'm glad to hear you're doing, looking at that booking trips improvement, so that's fantastic. Uh, Halifax Go, man, that's, that's been awesome, right? And I, so I can't wait for the, uh, the scan and tap. Uh, I will ask, you know, uh, no one's asked so far, but w what's the timer, timeline uh, on being able to tap and uh, if you could give us that. You mentioned in your presentation Port Wallace and colleagues, I think that's, that's huge because typically in the past, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'll look at Councillor Outhead and he can tell you quite well, uh, West Bedford and that area, how quickly it's grown and then trying to figure out transit after the fact, how problematic that is. So the fact that's a change in focus and looking at a big development which is gonna have 4,900 uh, units, 10,000 people, and understanding that we want people to use the buses right off the bat, and if we don't do that, they're all gonna buy two and three cars. So that's fantastic, uh, I'm really excited with that, and I think that's a change as we continue to grow in more and more developments. Um, my questions are, uh, that I have are also around safety. So uh, a lot has happened. We've been in uh, budget meetings and uh, our uh, uh, transit committee meetings and council meetings talking about safety. Lots of conversation in the past year about the unsafe activity at our transit uh, terminals and uh, on the buses. And you know, I even remember uh, uh, my councillor, uh, from my colleague from Coal Harbour, not wanting to go on the uh, on the uh, on the ferry because she felt unsafe. Uh, could you speak to what's happened in this past year when it comes to, uh, I see Phil coming forward, what's happened? Uh, you, uh, you talked about the new terminal supervisors uh, and having that impact. So could you, and, and, and welcome Phil, if you could just talk about where we have been, what we we're seeing, what we're seeing now, and where we are going. And you alluded to some of that, Dave, in your presentation. Sure, I'll, I'll say a quick word, then pass it over to Phil. So I mean, I think, uh, when I compare where we are today to like a year ago when I was in this seat uh, in front of you all, I think we, we've come a long way. Uh, it's probably understated, but we've come a long way. Uh, a testament to the work of uh, Phil and his team uh, and also some great collaboration with, uh, with HRP and RCMP. Um, there's still a lot to do. Uh, I think we've made some good headway. I mentioned the success, early success we've had with the terminal supervisors. Um, and now to me, it's about building on that going forward. But with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Phil for comment. Uh, thank you, Phil Herrick, Director of Transit Operations uh, for Halifax Transit, uh, through the Chair to the Councillor. Um, thank you for the question. Over, over the last year, um, you know, our focus has really, uh, to start with, getting to understand the data and where we're at, and, and uh, through a lot of uh, collaboration, as Dave mentioned, with HRP, RCMP, uh, with, our, with, our, with our own team, including um, Mark Santelli and his team in technical services, um, really realigning how we capture and, and how we measure that data is what's allowed us to come back to council, you know, with, with those uh, recommendations and, and understanding of what's happening out there. Uh, so some of the focus uh, that we've had that, that's brought us to where we are today is an increased focus on the training of the staff we do have. Um, our mobile supervisors in, in the, you know, the last 12 months have received uh, training in nonviolent crisis intervention, situational awareness, verbal judo, and, and that's ongoing. Um, and a lot of that was driven around, you know, again, how the data, what we're looking at, the types of incidents, and classifying those incidents. incidents sorry. Um, in, in December, uh, we put in place the four terminal supervisors that uh, we had approved through budget last year. Um, you know, and those, the, the competition that went into finding the right folks that are gonna go in there and, and really work on building those community relationships, relationships with the youth and people visiting those terminals were really, really important to us. Um, so hopefully in the near future, we'll be back with some data. They've been in place since December. 
Uh, but again, as Dave mentioned, anecdotally, we are seeing a difference um, in the, the reality of what's happening at those, at those uh, terminals, at, in the atmosphere that's there. Um, I'm a boots on the ground kind of person, spend some time down there with them and, and you know, being approached by, by those supervisors, by the operators and, and by uh, the public um, in just a, what a different feel, uh, you know, those places are now that there's, there's the, that uniformed uh, presence and, and again, you know, it's not just about the safety and security, it's about customer service. So having knowledgeable transit people there, you know, throughout the day that folks can approach and, uh, and have those conversations with and, and help, um, you know, different folks get through, get through those supports they need to use the system. Um, as Dave mentioned uh, in this budget, we have a few positions that will be tied to the creation of the safety program. Um, those are important to us and they'll, they'll focus on the actual creation of the safety program and, and just uh, I guess a high level highlight on that. Um, you know, it, it, we're calling it safety program. There is security tied to it. Um, you know, we're working with our partners in community safety, um, you know, on, and how, how that's gonna work and, and how we're gonna address that with the main intent as we bring this in is support, support, and support. Support for the public, uh, support for the service, support for our staff, um, and with that enforcement piece being the, the absolute last tool in the toolbox. Um, so with those positions, we'll get underway quickly to start uh, building that program, modeling after you know, what we're seeing in Vancouver. Uh, the city of Winnipeg uh, just released their safety officer program. They're on the, on the ground now, or on the buses actually, um, with that. So that's, that's um, you know, where we're at and, and uh, happy to say from where sitting here a year ago having this conversation mm -hmm. about those positions, uh, I'm really happy to be part of the team that is uh, moving some of those things forward. Great stuff. We'll come back. Thanks, Mr. Thank uh, and uh, thank you. I just actually forgot to answer the question about the timeline for oh. uh, for TAP. So uh, that's really or it's really back end work. Once we get the installer or the uh, validators on, it's about working with the financial service providers. So uh, I'm going to say end of year right now, um, okay. and we'll, we'll refine that as we as we work through the process. I'm I, I'm going to I'm going to under promise on that one a bit. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Councillor Outhit. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you. Uh, to, to Dave and to team. Uh, Lisa brought up my uh, concern about the GRTA and what an opportunity that might be uh, if we were working together sort of hand in glove on that and it sounds like you've, you are and that's encouraging and I support that, I think it's important. Uh, I also wanted to, and Tony touched on this, to just a little bit of update on the impact of, of the supervisors and, and T1200 and it sounds like we're heading in the right direction there as well. So I can knock those two things off my list. I wanna thank you uh, first of all because I think it would be safe to say that we've chatted more than a few times over the last year about challenges with the 90. And it's a good problem to have in theory. Uh, the, we have people that want to use uh, a bus to come in from the, to the suburbs and, uh, and uh, I think that with making that 15 minute service plus the addition of Hemlock service and the uh, increase to Basin View, I hope that we're gonna have some happy people. I certainly be planning to uh, be, uh, I'll be doing some, some publicity of that very shortly and there'll be some very happy people out there. Um, my, uh, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here because both Douglas and there's an upcoming, I think, amendment coming from, from Way to talk about uh, taking some resources away and, and trying to increase the service on 3, 4, 8, and 9A. So I'd like to get your thoughts on, on Douglas's comments, first of all. And secondly, what I'm wondering is if we decide to do that, would it not be better to, are we being a little too prescriptive though, specifically saying three, four, eight, nine, a versus where we have other needs? Or because I mean, we could see the 90 still is bad. We could see that something is needed sooner than we thought in uh, Port Wallace, you know, what have you. So I'm just wondering what you think of Douglas's comments and of course, you know, ways, ways we'll bring this motion forward, but a little more flexibility maybe with that, or indeed, do you philosophically have a problem with taking, reducing those services because we do have people in those areas de dependent on it. And it's all tied in with affordable housing too, so it's a, it's a real sort of hot potato on removing service. So anyway, I'll shut up and give you a chance to respond. So. Great, uh, thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll make a few comments and then I'll ask yeah. Patricia to jump in on that. So, so the recommendation in front of you is, is to restore those cuts to right. the to the suburban expresses. Um, 
and, and that, that is my professional advice to council. Uh, I, I think it is crucial to do. It, it, it's, you know, there's no doubt that we are seeing overloading on some routes. Uh, as I've outlined the presentation, um, we, we, we have a plan to, to help deal with that. You know, we, and it's, so, so I think what, when you look at the whole thing holistically, we, we have routes, and so the suburban express routes are really there to get people who are probably um, the most challenging to convince to take a bus downtown, to actually take a bus downtown so that they're not sitting in traffic and they're not being part of the traffic congestion. So when, when I look at routes, I mean, so first of all, the cuts are only meant to be temporary. So right now we have, um, we have some routes where the schedule is frankly butchered because the the, uh, the headways of the routes or the frequencies are inconsistent, which is a, a really poor way to plan a transit route. So um, f from, from my perspective, it's really important to get those back in there. Um, you know, ha having an express route that goes 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes is, is really bad and, and it's not gonna do much to get people on it. So um, that would be my overall view. I, I do think it is important. What we have to do is look at the system as a whole. We, we can't really focus on, on one part of it, but um, with that, I'll pass it off to Patricia for any other thoughts. Sure, Patricia Hughes, Director of Planning and Customer Engagement at Halifax Transit. Uh, I think Dave covered a lot of what I wanted to say, but I think just generally those express routes, uh, the 100 series, they are all meeting standards, uh, you know, it, generally speaking. So the standards are different than they are, and the expectations were different than for corridor routes or for other routes, but the standards we established in the Moving Forward Together plan, uh, they're, they're generally meeting. The trips to be reinstated, uh, the routes that aren't meeting them are the 370 and 330, which are discussed in the annual service plan. Um, even the 330, uh, it was meeting standards before the pandemic. Uh, the service, I guess, I, I wasn't gonna use the word, but Dave did, butchered is a good word, right? Um, the service is not nearly uh, the quality of service we would like to provide or were providing pre-pandemic. There's no reason, you know, we can't predict the future, but we would expect if we put those trips back in, it, it'll meet the standard as it was doing before the pandemic. Um, the other thing I'll say about the express routes, which are the, you know, anything that starts with 100, um, overall, if you look system-wide and, and there's different types of routes for different reasons that are serving different functions and helping different people in different ways, they are pulling their weight uh, in that the amount of resources dedicated to expresses, it's about 6% of what we do every day and it's, it's about 5% of our ridership. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's actually not bad when you think about how you're allocating resources in your, your bang for your buck. Um, and they are getting, you know, the riders they have are ones that might get on the bus and stay on the bus for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on what express you have. So they're not getting the turnover and they're still generally kind of pulling their weight. Uh, the other thing is that when we cut them, we pulled the trips out. Uh, we, we did it across all of them, regardless of, of the performance, some expresses do better than others, um, and we spread them throughout the peak. So we pulled out some pretty important trips. And so the Route 159, for example, if you are downtown, you're getting off work, you're a student, you're ready to go home, it runs at 3, 324, 420. Um, 3, 320, 340, 4, 420, 40. The five o'clock trip is skipped, and then you go 520. So if you don't make that 420, you're waiting 40 minutes. We, like, we pulled them right through the middle of peak to reduce the volumes. So if we were to have purely looked at, you know, here's the Route 159, which is the trip that has the least people, we would have picked either the first or last every time, and that wouldn't have helped us resource-wise. So we pulled out some pretty productive and useful trips, and also ones that make the, uh, the service a little bit, you know, gap broken tooth, I would say. Uh, and we do think that, you know, passengers want those trips back. Um, but the other thing is, you know, if we were to go away and say, you know, which are the unproductive trips? Is there trips we could pull on those routes? We would be probably pulling the first and last every time, um, which I think is a, a bit of a separate conversation because even if that very first trip in in the morning only has 10 or 12 people, that's, you know, getting downtown before six o'clock and it's a lot of potentially healthcare workers, shift workers, you know, so, and there's not a lot of people on the road at that time of day and I'm probably not a better place to have that bus at that time of day as well. So I think it's it's a bigger conversation. As Dave said, it was meant to be temporary. Uh, we wouldn't strategically recommend pulling those now. Yeah. No, it's an important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> 
excuse me, my voice is going. Um, thank you very much, Dave. <coughs> excuse me, and Patricia. Um, so I'd start with some excessive bus uh, comments. Um, not surprising, Councillor Mancini. Um, the, the real concern just around the notification of times that people might be picked up, like the window, I think the current window right now can be a half hour, and sometimes it's even extended behind that, which really affects people then being late for appointments, all of those kind of things. So um, trying to figure out how we can close that gap and communicate to persons who are needing the accessible bus trips is gonna be really important. One of the things that I was really disappointed in is as much as we've improved on the registration, so for example, people in Fall River, you've got the uh, airport bus that comes out onto the highway, but if you wanna register for accessible bus, automatically you're told you're outside the service boundary. And so you're denied automatically, and then you have to call back and say, but there is um, the, airport, the airport bus, so we can get up to there so we should be able to have accessible service. So I'm hoping that when you're looking at that redesign of the plan, you're looking at that automatic denial that happens um, and that there ca something can be done about that. Because one of the things that it does, it just, it makes a person with a disability feel again, uh, a recipient of charity in a way that I have to go this other loop or this other step to be able to get a service that they have a right to. So it's, it's disappointing uh, for a lot of people. And I do know that we've got a motion and there's a staff report that's gonna be coming about how we could extend the kilometers that Access Bus may be able to go on some of those bus routes that end right at uh, service boundaries. So I didn't see any mention of that in the report. And I know in one of your answers, you said like, this is what is, but there's also stuff in here about, you know, what the future of transit is going to be. So uh, it would have been nice to have seen even that it is a consideration that it's being looked at and there might be a recommendation. So that's my accessible bus ones. Um, and then, so Route 55 <laughs> and um, Port Wallace and the changed Route 55. So I remember last year and the year before we were talking about the change to the route that the Waverly Road got cuts to Spider Lake and then the loop came into Craigburn and when it was my understanding at the time, maybe incorrectly, that when you're looking at the route for Port Wallace, then that loop into Craigburn would be taken out and that you'd be looking at something else. So I also didn't see anything about that in there. So I'm wondering where that might be. And uh, you know, the service, the electoral boundaries changed. So I don't know, Councillor Mancini, you might be interested in what happens with the Craigburn Loop. Um, and then when we think about the rural review, one of the things, uh, you know, so when is this transit service boundary up for discussion? It seems to be a moving target to me sometimes. So um, we're really wondering when we're gonna be able to see that transit uh, service boundary review. And is that all caught up in the rural review? because of course Fall River and Waverly is really interested in bus service and uh, being able to access transit. So even with the Aerotech connector being built, when you look about planning for the future, we're planning well for Port Wallace. Well, we've got the Aerotech connector, we're gonna have the Burnside connector is changing. All of those things are affecting the transit paths that are open to us. I'm just wondering where that belongs in the plan. Um, and last but not least, 48 new positions. Uh, I'm just wondering what your recruitment strategy is because it's looking like uh, there's a challenge in filling those positions. So I'm wondering what that looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. So uh, on the 55, the plan would be to eventually take that into uh, the new areas of development, but those road connections don't exist yet. So that will be a later phase of, uh, of the overall development. Um, in terms of the transit service boundary, that uh, I don't that that is part of uh, the regional plan review. So I don't I don't in front of me know where that is in the process, but that is a regional plan policy, so that would go there. Um, in terms of the 48 new positions, um, and now so so 42 of them are operational. Within that, there's mechanics and things. So those aren't all operators, I guess, is the first thing I would say. But um, we we do feel like we can recruit them. So we, we've seen a really good turnaround in our ability to fill classes, which was a major issue before. Now we're in a good place. 
Um, it, it still is a risk. I mean, like, like that, that's the that's the employment market we live in, but it is something that we're working away at. Uh, we've been able to uh, look at adding trainers and things to help move more people through as we grow. Um, but certainly it's something we'll be looking at very, very closely as we set the time frames in which we can implement the service changes um, that will then need those people. Um, on excessive bus, just so we don't have anything on, on the staff report that you'd mentioned, because that, that is actually the motion was for it to come as part of next year's budget. So uh, that will be a, a staff report, work we'll do in this fiscal year, um, and it'll come as next year's budget. Um, and I'll ask Phil maybe to touch on the other two uh, points within excessive bus. Uh, Phil Herrick, Director of Transit Operations, uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, uh, thank you, I guess just for a little bit of clarity. Um, so transit operations is all the operational modes within Halifax Transit, so Accessa Bus, Ferry Operations and Conventional, so Accessa Bus uh, falls in part of the team um, that I'm with. Um, probably a, a bit of the conversation relies to what Dave was talking about around the tra transit boundary uh, and when we'll look at that and that's part of uh, the pieces we're going to look at that along with the 30 minute window in the motion that came forward uh, for the report uh, later this calendar year. Um, having had experience in, in this property and two others around Accessibus uh, or paratransit, the 30 minute window is something that's used, but one of the pieces that we're going to use, um, you know, looking at that report and that going forward is different types of technology around notification. Uh, right now, everything is, is phone call and, and not automated. Uh, so reaching out to those clients uh, as, you know, we have 20 plus buses on the road across the board is a, is a bit of a challenge, but the technology, technology uh, you know, that we're looking at and that will be coming forward uh, will we'll also ease uh, the way we book. We'll be able to book online and, and through other services, but also notifications um, to the passengers. Um, you know, part of the, the report um, that we're going to bring back is talking about expanding uh, the service area for Accessibus, but also internally we're looking at expansion and expansion in a different way. We've continued to deliver the service the same way for a very long time. Uh, so some of the other work that the team is doing is around diversification of fleet uh, and the vehicles we're looking at. So we, we start looking at ambulatory and non-ambulatory uh, passengers and, and how we can pick them up and how we change the way uh, that we deliver that service, making it, it more inclusive and, and hopefully driving uh, our rides up per hour. Uh, well, you're out, of, you're out I'll, of time. I'll come back. Come, yeah, yes. come back. We've got lots of time. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for the presentation. Um, always good to have a look at what's coming up. Um, I do want to just um, congratulate uh, the great work that was done on the transit code and the safety, you know, taking in the safety concerns of our bus operators and transit staff. I think that's like uh, critical to the recruitment program that we were just talking about, as well as the safety of our passengers on the buses. So if our operators are safe, it also means that our, our passengers are safer. And, um, you know, we've had challenges not unique to us. There's like, you know, similar things across the country, but, um, I, I think the transit coat's been great, and I, whenever I see it on the on a bus, on the back of a bus, I'm like, you know, good work. I, I think it's very encouraging and glad to hear today that it's actually making a difference. So that's that's excellent news. A um, couple questions. Uh, one is about um, our bus terminals. So I note that we have uh, 11 bus terminals here, and we had a presentation, we almost saw a toilet seat here. Um, it's not just the transit operators that need access to washrooms, it's the passengers as well. Um, access to washrooms is, is kind of a human right. When you're on a bus you, and you need to use a washroom, you should be able to access one in our terminals. Not all of our terminals have washrooms. I'm gonna bring up Mumford Terminal again. And, you know, we talk about in this plan, we talk about, um, you know, service quality and reliability. I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about where our transit terminals fit into our program of service quality and, re and reliability. And in particular with the Mumford terminal, I know that that's leased, we don't own it. There's plans, but that's decades out perhaps. Is there a near-term solution at looking at that? What conversations have been happening with the, with the 
the uh, people who own that land and what opportunities are there to improve that because having good transit terminals to me it has to be integrated into the buses like you can't separate them out it's part and parcel and i'd like to know a little bit more about that um as well um Area rate revenue, I see that we're almost at 41 million in area rate revenue, up 9.7%. Uh, I get a lot of questions about the area rate revenue and um, who's paying it and where it's coming from. I wonder if you have a further breakdown of that area rate revenue. I think that would be information that would be useful not only to council, but um, to our taxpayers as well. And um, finally, the back to rural or, or regional transit. Um, you know, I'd say that we have to move beyond the word rural and look at regional transit because we are a regional municipality. I think it's fantastic that the JRTA has stepped in to do some of this work, but as has been pointed out, the lack of seeing any of this in the business plan shows that it continues not to be a priority for Halifax Transit. So if it's not falling under Halifax Transit, who is it falling under? And when we list our like services, our core services, um, you know, none of that, none of that is in there. Uh, we, we don't mention we have excessive bus, we have conventional bus, we have ferries, but nothing about regional transit or rural transit. So it's almost like the whole program just falls between the cracks. And I think if, as we have been saying over the past three years, continuously in this council, we need to start to see regional transit be a priority. It's a, it's not a service obligation we have to the entire municipality. It's not going to be conventional transit. It's separate and independent of that, but nonetheless needs to be acknowledged and recognized. And um, and so even the work with the GT, uh, GRTA, you know, seeing that in the business plan and acknowledging that that that's happening, I think is an is important for um, all of our residents, all of our residents to see. So I'm just gonna leave it there, thank you. Uh, th thank you, so uh, yeah, so definitely a uh, point well taken on the Rural Transit Funding Program and having that included in, in the business plan in, in future years. Uh, we will definitely take that away. Uh, I'm gonna kinda go backwards here. The area rate revenue, I, I guess I would look to finance. I don't know if that's something that they can explain today or whether they need to uh, send something out something out afterwards. Uh, in terms of terminals and, and Mumford, I mean, yeah, so I mean, the majority of our terminals do have washrooms. Uh, not all of them, but the, the majority do. Uh, Mumford is a particular issue. I mean, you're absolutely right. We don't own it. Uh, we really have no control over that piece of it. It, it does come down to the property owner. Um, as the person who maintains the, or the organization that maintains the washrooms, the use of them. So we don't have much control there, which is not the situation we want to be in. Um, we do want to, you know, we do uh, eventually, as to your point, we do want to replace Mumford with a terminal that is uh, a proper terminal, uh, like we've built elsewhere, um, and that we have more control over. Um, I'm just looking back to Patricia. I don't know, I know we have some interim plans. I think they are more oriented towards bus capacity though, I might, yeah. So like, like th there's no, without a major redo of the area, you know, there's nowhere else to put a, a building that we would control, for example. So, I mean, it's, unfortunately I don't have a good solution to that right now. I think the solution will be longer term, but uh, we, we are kind of stuck there for the time being. Yeah, I, I don't think it's acceptable. Councilor, that's, uh, we're well you. past uh, five that. minutes and Jerry wants to speak too. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to the councillor. Uh, just on the area rate revenue, so that would be uh, the revenue charge for the local area transit rate. So if you look at the table, I think that you're referencing in the in the book um, or in the presentation, the it's up 9.7%, but uh, overall, it's it's down about $16 million because uh, I think it was Councillor Lovelace's uh, uh, motion from a couple of years ago that we, we uh, took out the regional area rate and put that on the general rate. But uh, we can certainly probably put together an updated map on, uh, on the, uh, the local area transit rate. Uh, probably uh, we might be able to do it by district, but we can take that offline. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. 
we just had a moment helping out a staffer. Uh, so uh, what a great what a great experience I had this morning coming to work on transit. I took the number one bus. Uh, the bus driver, and I don't want him to be in trouble, made me validate with the validator, which is fine because I was using the app. Uh, and then recently my parents, right, my dad's 82, my mom's 76, have, are much less comfortable driving than they used to be. And this weekend I went over with a printed out map of the number one and the schedule and, and they're going to pay cash, they're not going to use an app and they're not going to use transit to find out or Google Maps to find out when the bus is coming. They're going to assume their schedule adherence, which I broke to them, maybe they're not going to. But, you know, it's been really important to me, you know, all my family now is using the tra transit all the time and it's really important to them and I, I see the usage going up and up and up uh, uh, with different segments that maybe didn't use it before. I also, as I mentioned at Transportation Standing Committee, talked about how great the app is. Like I see a change at the Coburg stop and at Scotia Square where the majority of people, it's either the app or they have a student pass or, or one of the other passes. And I think that's that shows how powerful that's been. Um, you know, a big thing here is that we're kind of back to talking about I, I think our focus needs to be increasing ridership because increasing ridership increases revenue and revenue means we have more money to reinvest in the uh, uh, delivery of the system. Uh, and we're back into a bit of a coverage versus ridership debate again, which we've certainly had. That was a big piece of moving forward together, a big piece of, piece of the regional plan. And both of those things have merit and need to be supported, but uh, ridership is the one that drives the, the change, brings down the carbon ga uh, gas emissions and creates revenue to do more great things. I think that's really exciting. I will also say about the JRTA stuff we were talking about, really we should have been asking those questions of planning because that lives with Mike Connor and the IMP group more than it does with transit. Like that, that's who's driving the system change and the overall strategic plan for HRM. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, I think probably council needs a briefing from staff on where that's at sooner rather than later, uh, especially as we know things will be coming public shortly. Uh, what I have sent around is a motion, like I'll come back and do that later because there's lots of people still on the speakers list and I don't want to stop debate for a deferral or whatever is uh, talking about whether or not the moving forward principles that were identified that I've talked about at transit uh, stand, standing committee and that were identified by it's more than buses should be more rigorously implemented. That's, that's how I look at it. And the principles were that when we have low use routes, we should consider uh, amending or changing them and using those buses uh, on routes that are bit back before moving forward together, we uh, shut down the old number nine that was the waterfront circulator that went down Lower Water and Hollis connecting the NASCAD campuses, didn't really get used. And that bus and those drivers were put on the number seven and we saw over a 20% increase in ridership, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. So when I look at uh, the number three, the number four, and the number uh, eight and the nine, which are uh, like good for us. The number three, looking at the ridership in the TPI, in the KPI reports, uh, the crosstown connector that so many people were skeptical of when we introduced it is the second most use, used route in the system, right? And, and so for me, it's not just about the overloads, it's also that if we put another bus on and increase the frequency on any of those routes, we know ridership will go up. Those routes are the critical thing. That's why we made the corridors one through 10 uh, so important. And, and you know, if we're not gonna raise taxes and we're not gonna put more money into it that way, we already have a set of policies that say how we should uh, consider these things. So if I make the motion, which I will amend because I understand and hear the concerns about the rural Metro X, I don't wanna have that fight right now. That's not a discussion that we need to get into. But uh, what I hear from you, Dave, could we not change the schedule of the expresses to help, okay, don't have 20 minute headways with a 40 minute gap, have a 30 minute space, right? Like, like to, me, to me, when I look at the amount of people who are boarding hourly on those buses and the fact that those buses have been gone for three years and that we know that we have people, we've been getting emails for six months about people who don't know if they're gonna be able to get work, to work on time because they're way up in Herring Cove and the bus sometimes comes by and it's full and they don't get to get on. Like, it, to me, I, I still, you know, if we're gonna live our values, we're gonna put those investments, we're gonna make the hard decisions, I think we need to be talking about going deeper and reallocating those buses. So uh, that is why the motion would be for a staff report rather than us going in and doing surgery on your business plan right now, because I don't think that would be great. I think we need to have a deeper dive. Uh, can you talk about like what we could do to make that happen, those kind of schedule changes to accommodate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, thank you. So there's, there's a couple things to unpack there. My, I, I think what you've just suggested absolutely needs to happen. Um, but in my view, the correct uh, avenue for that is actually the next service plan. So okay. you want to look at that more holistically. Like I fully expect the focus of the next service plan is going to be what quarter routes need more service because we, when we uh, put in the quarter routes as our they were put in with the resources we had available, knowing that eventually they were gonna grow and grow and grow. So I would suspect that the next service plan is gonna focus on corridor route frequency uh, and the role of expresses. Uh, and and that, that kind of, you know, the dynamics between the two. So, you know, I think the problem is like so, some of them, and I'm going off the top of my head, like, you know, you have some routes that are every 30 minutes that have a trip missing. So are we really gonna start doing those every 45 minutes? Like that's, you know, becomes kind of pointless at rush hour. So th that, that to me, you know, like, I, I, I certainly hear the concerns around the overloads and uh, it, it is a bit of a tug of war with the expresses, but I do think, you know, looking at it holistically is always my preference rather than trying to do something um, kind of ad hoc, and I, I, I would say, you know, certainly the, there there is that discussion. There are some principles in the moving forward together plan that you know we will look at ridership, but coverage is also important. But I think I could actually make the argument that the expresses aren't actually coverage routes; they are they are ridership routes, not the same level as as some of the uh, corridor routes, but. Um, you know, as, as Patricia had mentioned, the, for, for the small amount of resources overall that go into the express routes, they really do carry their weight. Um, and the other thing I would mention, I, I didn't get to mention actually when Councillor Earth had asked this question is, when you look at the number of service hours we're talking about here, not going to make a measurable difference really to the, in, in, this, in the grand scheme of what goes into a corridor route. Um, you know, if anything, we would end up just taking those hours and plunking them into the um, kind of operational tactical pool that I mentioned. But uh, I, I think, and my professional opinion remains, that the, the area of greatest impact right now is to put those expresses back to where they were always meant to be, um, see how they do, and then have the conversation during the next service plan. I'm out of time, I'll come back. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, my concern is about the Rural Express services and trying to maintain them and try to try to grow them. I've been saying year after year, our park and rides have been the, uh, probably the most successful uh, adaptations we've done for transit. Most of our park and ride terminals around Metro are full. And sometimes I even said we should probably put in parking garage structures to make better parking capacity because some park and rides you can't get into because they're full. So I think we need to look at trying to improve our capacity at our present terminals and trying to improve the ridership that way. But also this regional transportation tax that we got rid of last, just like a year ago, um, you know, we put it in place 2009-10. For 24 years, my area was paying towards that regional transportation tax. And all we got was the transit terminal at Porter's Lake. To go back to the, the, to the en route uh, cons consultant report 2007 that talked about exit 18, talked about exit uh, and one of Muscat Albert Harbor at the rink and stuff. Uh, now with the new high school going into Cheswick Industrial Park, uh, the new realignment of a, of a inter full interchange there, it might be advantageous to have one at exit 21 now. So I just find it so frustrating that when we got rid of the tax a year ago on the regional transportation tax, and that's probably when we need some clarification on these area rate zones and stuff that they uh, have for transportation now, is that it took away those opportunities for perhaps having an argument that we've been paying these taxes for years, time to put the park and ride terminals in. Now with the Joint uh, Regional Transportation Authority talking about uh, transit along the 100 series corridors, we're right back to where we were back in 2007. You know, and I find it so frustrating that, uh, that we didn't have the uh, opportunity to, to fulfill those plans and those promises of the amalgamation back then. Because, you know, I can tell you right now during the recent discussions of Porters Lake and Muscat Albert Harbor about uh, rural sidewalks and having a tax rate, area rate to, to pay for it, equivalent to the differential between the rural and urbans, it caused, it has caused a, a firestorm. And people are very uh, frustrated about the amount of taxes they're asking. You know, well, all the tax we've been paying, you know, are we subsidized in suburban and, and urban areas? The people in rural areas are, are asking now because they're saying, what are they getting for their dollar? And transit is one of those things that we've been asking for for years. You know, the 207 project, you know, um, back in 2005, Halifax at that time was supposed to do a, a, a transit study survey for Lawrencetown. 
But then 2006, the regional plan uh, put everything on freeze. We're not going to expand our service territory. So Lawrencetown was left out on the merge. Now Musco Rider has a 20, uh, 207 proposal, but it needs to have funding for it. You know, and uh, will that funding, can that come now out of the general rate funds now? Because, you know, we have the rate now for re our rural transportation. Uh, we have the um, up to 64, 64 cents, I think it is, per kilometer now instead of the 50 cents. But their calculation for the 207 fixed loop service was approximately 75 cents per kilometer for that particular service. Can that project now come forward in, 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 with, these bunch of, with this budget plan? Now that we have uh, written, we changed our tax structure and stuff for that. Uh, so I, I think in terms of that, so, so right now, I mean, Muscle Rider could apply for funding under the Rural Transit Funding Program to do Lawrencetown. Like there's nothing in the program that specifies it has to be or that it can't be a fixed route service. So, I mean, my, my advice would be that if there's something out there, and, and to your point, Councillor, where you're saying it's 75 cents versus the 64 we offer generally, um, you know, it's, it's probably a motion for a staff report to bring back a solution to that if that's something council wants to do. Because, uh, I mean, it, it's not something we could fund from the general rate because it's not a Halifax Transit service. It wouldn't go into our kind of operating budget. Um, but if it's something outside the norm, I mean, that would be my recommended recommended path to, uh, to, to allow us to bring back information for council's consideration. Because uh, they were trying to implement it, but then COVID hit and they put everything on hold for them for two and a half years. And now since that time, we've seen uh, wage, wage increases and stuff. So they have to revisit their business plan and modify it for the new cost realities that are out there. So uh, you'll be seeing something very shortly then in regards to that. But in regards to trying to maintain the services for the 370, I think, you know, I think it's important that we get, you know, if you want to have the rural express service, we've got to provide it. And, uh, and hopefully we can get more terminals on along the major corridors. Like I'll talk about the Main Street corridor, whoever do the Ross Road realignment, great opportunity for a park and ride terminal there at that corner to bring four bus routes together to converge at one point, you know. The Preston Townships, you can't, you can't get from one part of the Preston Township to another by hopping off from one bus to another. All the, the, the buses that serve the area don't converge anywhere except for one little point uh, on, uh, for 68 and 61 by the Black Cultural Center. You know, but so there's, uh, I think it has to be reviewed. I'm looking forward to this rural transit review. Uh, was there a timeline you anticipate that rural, that rural review to be initiated? Uh, I'm hearing uh, fall. It'll be a transportation standing committee this fall. <laughs> Before or after the election? During. <laughs> yeah, during. Yeah. Fall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for the report and the presentation. Very good. I'm uh, very happy to see the overload mitigation plan for uh, helping, helping with that. And also, I like the idea of a shorter moving forward together plan so you're not stuck in a five-year program when things are changing obviously very rapidly around here. I don't think that's going to slow down anytime soon, something tells me. Uh, so just, just some questions, I guess, of clarification. What we heard from some of our public pres uh, presenters this morning, I was listening on my way in because I was, I was a little bit late. Um, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> What uh, challenges, so what challenges stand in the way of providing more information for meaningful context, analysis, and public engagement from content in the report to like data, like ridership during peak, peak hours, and like the correct quarterly KPIs on the dashboard, not the IMP KPIs, and I guess we have some outdated or dated PDFs. So uh, the IMP dashboard appears to be missing most Halifax Transit quarterly KPIs, and I'm not sure if that was, if you guys are even aware of that, it, it, like who, who does the data uh, of the IMP dashboard? Probably, I don't know if that's transit to put the transit um, KPIs on, I'm not sure. I'm wondering if that can be updated. Wondering also if, Halifax Transit can clarify, we heard this from another presenter, uh, your targets for ridership and service. Is it true that 
we're expecting individuals to use less transit on average this next year. Is um, also wondering with the new safety measures and uh, bodies on, on the ground for uh, ho hopefully improving safety, how will you measure and release ongoing progress in correcting and improving this operator and public safety is issues? And last but not least, wondering if we can get a update, a public update on the pilot project for Rainbow Haven Beach to um, be implemented for two months over the summer on weekends and holidays. I was really hoping we could see that this summer, um, but just not sure about the timing on that. So thank you. Uh, thank you. So. So, so in terms of the information piece, um, you know, there's a few things. So, so we do, I mean, like, so th w there's numerous ways we put information out right now. We, we regularly put information out through HRM's open data. So a lot of that just kind of happens automatically and anybody that wants it can go get it. Uh, we do regularly report uh, quarterly to Transportation Standing Committee on our KPIs. Um, and, and I will say, we've always been very open to input from the committee on what they want to see on that report. And um, it has morphed a lot over the years. We've added some things, some things have become less relevant. We've taken them off. So, uh, you know, it, it, that's part of it. I mean, I would say anytime you're regularly putting out public information, it takes staff time. Like, like that's a big part of it. Uh, preparing internal information versus public information is very different in terms of uh, the level of presentability, understandability. Um, as well, I mean, there are frankly some things that we use as internal data that's if someone who um, doesn't work in the industry looks at it, you might go, what does this even mean? So why, why are we putting that out? Um, having said that, I mean, we are very open uh, you know, we do regularly respond to FOIA pop requests and we provide what's asked. Um, you know, I know both the speakers here today, our planning team has met with and said to them like, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. Like, we're not keeping state secrets, it's, it's transit data. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, we're not going to start creating new reports for things that require more staff time. But if we have available data, like, have at it. You know, it, it, it's all out there. Um, in terms of the IMP dashboard, that would be planning and development. So if there's some discrepancy there, we can certainly take that back uh, back with them. Uh, in terms of ridership, I, I mentioned in my in my report the, the the expectation is ridership will go up. That that is our target for the year. Um, the the passengers per service hour are, are we're projecting to decline a bit because we're adding so much service. But the overall ridership we do expect to go up. Uh, and as I'd mentioned, we do take a bit of a conservative approach with that because we don't want to overestimate our revenue uh, and, and risk having, you know, being in a deficit in, in the future. Um, in terms of safety information, I see Phil, so I'm gonna pass it off to Phil. Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, as it relates to how we're going to measure and, and report on safety data, uh, one of the positions uh, in this year's budget is actually a business analyst that will focus solely on safety and security. Um, but one of the things, uh, heading back a little bit, we've talked to, to Council and Transportation Standing Committee, but we, we have reorganized how we capture safety and security, uh, security data starting in May 1st last year, and those are the numbers we've been presenting uh, to Council. Uh, the terminal supervisors went in place at the end of the year last year, just before New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. um, so we're starting to look at and see trending there as to what's happening uh, at the terminals and those locations along with what's happening on the road with a, with a few other uh, things that have been implemented. Uh, so the safety and security data will actually become part of the quarterly KPI reports. Um, but uh, through the building of the safety program, uh, we plan on uh, reporting back to council on the development of that plan and the trending that we're seeing around it. Awesome, excellent. David? Sorry, just uh, I forgot to answer one question, councillor, on the Rainbow Haven report, uh, targeting April Transportation Standing Committee. Is that still, um, but like theoretically, could that still get into this coming year, 2024? That would be after budget approval. Uh, so I mean, that would probably end up, you know, so there wouldn't be any money for anything. Uh, I, I, you know, so that would end up being Great. probably a next, next budget item. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and Dave and team and everyone uh, in between. Uh, big thanks. I've, 
uh, got a new appreciation for, so I've been a transit user my whole life, still use it frequently, uh, but having to use a stroller on the bus <laughs> has really, has really uh, added my appreciation. So, you know, 14 years ago, I had to use a stroller on a bus and it was a thing. But you know now with the with the fully accessible fleet, it's a totally different um, feeling. So you know I think it's 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 great that we're at that place. So so again, you know thank you for all, all the work there. So a couple quick questions. Some have already been asked around transparency and, and whatnot. So I'm not going to go there. So I am wondering just around and you you highlighted this during the presentation uh, around your targets and being conservative. I think we've shown as a service that we can you know you know do pretty well in terms of ridership and, and, and do better than our targets. I'd be interested in, interested in, in seeing maybe if there's a conservative related to um, revenues number, but also I'd love to see like what you as transit could, what you think might ridership may be unrelated to revenue, but more like this is what we aspire to do. I'd, I re I'd love to see those stats that you're, you know, inspiring to, to be a, 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 a better service as, as as kind of communicated. Um, I'm wondering in, you know, we know that uh, after school hours is an issue on our buses for safety and operators and, and users and a lot of a lot of things are being done on the, the ground and in terms of supervisors working with schools and teachers and um, in operators uh, sometimes having to stop buses and also parents and teachers going on buses and yelling at students when, when you know, they know. So I'm just wondering if there's ever been a thought of having a physician or supervisors dedicated to working with schools. I know that there's some that do that, but uh, they are also doing that on the side of their other work that they're doing as, as a supervisor on the routes. So just wondering if there's been a thought of, of maybe having folks, because it, it seems to work when somebody's there working with the teachers, working with the school, working with the parents to deal with those issues. But again, we're also expecting them to do their general duties as a, as a supervisor. Also um, wondering if you can comment on, so we're seeing high, higher numbers related to um, service calls uh, distance in the the stat is because I, I don't want to misquote it here um, mean distance between service calls we're seeing that go up uh, which means there's issues happening for different reasons on our routes but that also means that when a route a, a, a bus does have that call and stops there might be someone on the other end of it who's either missing their bus or doesn't know what's going on. So I'm just wondering with a lot more technology being implemented in GPS and, and a bunch of stuff happening, is there a way that we can be faster on letting folks know that there's a service happening? And you know, for example, a, a resident reached out who waited 45 minutes for a bus and the bus got in an accident. It's not their fault, not the operator's fault, but they were in the cold waiting, not knowing what was happening with that route. So I'm just wondering if there's been thoughts of way to communicate those things faster, because you know instantly, because of other calls that comes into the service center, then someone gets deployed, but is there a way to make close that loop where um, the public somehow can know that that's, that's happening? And I have more questions, but I'll, I'll come back after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so great question around the, the, the ridership. Um, and there is a differentiation. This gives me an opportunity to make that you know, t today we're here talking about budget. So when I look at ridership for the upcoming year, that's where I'm going to be conservative because I don't want to end up uh, torpedoing my ridership targets before before the year even starts. However, the opportunity is through you know the next service plan and when we d and um, you know a lot of the work that JRTA is doing, our own regional planning work, that's where you get into the more aspirational ridership targets. Um, and at the level of regional planning, like what, what modal splits, like what percentage of people do we need you taking their trips by transit? Uh, you know, so, so that's where that kind of comes. Like, like so, so to, your, to your question, the, the conservative part really is for today's purpose and it really is about, about the money side of things. Um, school supervisors, I'm, I'm gonna say uh, we, we, we want to do that. <laughs> uh, and I, I might get Phil to comment on that because I know he has some, some thoughts because it is something we used to do. Uh, right. And just a, as the service grew and demands grew, um, you know, that became an issue. You know, on, on the, um, 
on the service disruptions, that's where, you know, I mentioned today that about the having the pool of resources for operations to tactically deal with those issues. So if we have a breakdown, rather than just being like, well, bus is broke down, you know, sorry, it's not coming, we'll be able to put another bus in its place. So, that, so that's a piece of it as well, is all of those service reliability pieces. Um, you know, beyond that, we do try to get their information out uh, as quick as possible. Um, you know, one of the emergent things we're seeing is that less people are on Twitter. Um, can't blame them, but I mean that that's you know that's become our de facto communications channel. So I think trying to figure out what the other pieces are there. So um, Phil, do you want to speak to the the service calls and the school supervisors? Thank you, through the chair to the councillor. Um, absolutely, as Dave mentioned, uh, in in uh, several years past, we actually had a supervisor. Um, that was not only assigned as a school liaison officer, but they've also worked with restorative justice um, and how we're doing that. In, in the last four months, we've actually reassigned uh, somebody to that work, working uh, with the province specifically on, uh, on restorative justice. And then most recently, mm -hmm. uh, part of those duties have switched into that school liaison officer working with uh, principals and, and parents on, on how we can address uh, some of those issues. And it will be something brought forward through the security plan. Um, when we talk about support, support, and, and really building those customer and, and uh, community relationships, it'll be very important. But right now, uh, much to the councillor's point, we're, we're doing it a little bit off uh, the side of our desk, but we do have now, uh, <coughs> I'll call two people that are dedicated to, so when those meetings are happening, uh, it's the same people having the conversations. Um, related to the, uh, what I'm gonna call tactical service management when those breakdowns are happening, when the notifications are happening, uh, one of the things we're looking at now, kind of falling back to that May data uh, redo we're doing, we're actually looking at the resources we have in place to operationally manage the service, how many calls they're dealing with, time of day, location, those type of things. Uh, so we'd be putting a plan together um, to better align the resources to time of day and when they're happening and, and helping that team uh, define what their duties are and, and level of importance. Uh, definitely a work in progress, but we're, we're doing it from a, a data-driven perspective. Uh, so then we do have those conversations. We, we can actually show you the numbers and talk about where we're okay. seeing them. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you folks. We're gonna have you come back after lunch. We're gonna take a break now, it being 12 o'clock. I just wanna flag for folks that um, this afternoon, the CAO and I are gonna have to leave at three o'clock, uh, maybe you touch before that. To, the Chamber of Commerce is doing a big thing today and we've asked to be at the end to try to do all of budget, but we, I expect we'll still be going. So, Kathy, uh, Deputy Mayor, I'm gonna ask you to come back to the chair at that point in time. Uh, okay, we'll take a break, folks, and uh, we'll come back uh, in May. No, we'll come back in an hour.
Okay, folks, we're going to begin. The last person. Dave, and Hannah, nice to see you guys back. We heard from Councillor Smith. I'll go to Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Dave, and your team for the report and the presentation. I know they work awfully hard. I just had a couple questions. Um, it would be nice to see, I don't know if this was mentioned already, but it would be nice to see the time of day of your ridership. Um, also, I'm having a hard time differentiating between the 23 and the 123. I know the 123 is supposed to be an express bus, but from what I can tell, it goes the exact same place, ex almost the same time as the 23 used to. Also, Beecher Lakeside and Timberley are increasing in population, and there is new development in the process. I was, going to, I was wondering, does your department touch base with planning and development in regards to population increases? so that you may adjust ridership accordingly. Uh, also, has the opening of the new QET hospital in Bears Lake affected the ridership? Has there been any change? How much is time? Okay. Um, to Councillor Smith's point, repa replacing broken down buses and the riders are wait waiting up to half an hour to 45 minutes is the, where does this replacement bus come from? Does it come from uh, Ragged Lake or does it come, I know it wouldn't come from another route, but I just wondered where it was coming from and how long it would take. And, uh, sorry. I guess I'll stop there for now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, through the mayor to committee. Um, so in terms of ridership by time of day, we, we do report on this in the, uh, in our KPI reports, it would be back in the appendices. It's, it's broken down by, you know, not hour by hour necessarily, but it is broken down by, you know, rush hour and, and off peak and things like that. Okay. Um, the 23 versus 123, I might have to ask Patricia to come up and help me up with that one. Um, in the meantime, uh, so yeah, but planning and development, absolutely. We do uh, work with them very closely uh, on an ongoing basis around population growth, uh, but also in terms of uh, in terms of the regional plan and uh, and where that's all going. Uh, the hospital in Bayers Lake, I don't know if we have any ridership for that information for that yet, but it's certainly something uh, certainly something we could get if we don't have it here. Uh, where do replacement buses come from? That's a good question. Um, and the answer is that it varies. So typically we will have standby buses available on the road um, and they, we try to keep them in central locations so that they can kind of respond to where they need to as quick as possible. Um, but if they get, you know, if they have to go uh, fill a trip on one route, then they're going to be over there and we'll try to get them back central, but they could be kind of moving around. Um, I think the key thing with what we're proposing here today is that there would be more of those buses, more of those resources available so that we can basically have them better spread throughout the municipality and quick, more quickly able to, able to respond. Now I'll pass it over to uh, Patricia. Uh, hello, just on the route, uh, the routes in Timberley Lakeside Beachville. So in a lot of areas we've got uh, routes that are partners, so the 185 and the 85 and the 159 and the 59. In, in, uh, in your district, it's a little bit different. Um, there is a local route and a partnered express route, but they don't have the exact same routing. Um, so they actually have slightly different numbers. It's the 21 and 123 um, to reflect that they are a little bit different. So the 21 does come through the community and go through Bears Lake to Lacewood Terminal and stops at Lacewood Terminal. That's as far as it goes. And the 123 has um, basically the same routing in the community, but then it is intended to express route to downtown, so that goes down and through the Rotary and uh, into the into the Halifax Peninsula. So they kind of branch out once they, uh, once they get closer into town and go two different ways. So the 21 is meant to go towards Lacewood and provide connections, and the 123 is more the peak hour express. Okay, I'm not sure I caught all of that. So what you're saying is the 123 is an express bus? going towards the rotary and the 21 goes towards Bears Lake. 
So basically, if you miss one of those buses, you're waiting for half an hour. We, During we, rush hour. They are different. Uh, they do have served different purposes. So most folks would be looking for one or the other, and only a few people would be able to rely on, you know, either one, whichever one comes first. So it would be the 30-minute wait uh, if you're looking for a 21. Yeah. And the 23 on 123? Uh, I believe that's roughly every half hour as well. Yeah. Oh, 30 minutes? It is a 30 minute wait as well. Okay. Um, I'll have to come back, Mr. Mayor, because I didn't quite understand uh, or didn't hear what the difference was. So maybe I'll you want me to come back? No, why don't we just, since you've already asked that, why don't we just clarify that, uh, Patricia or David? Sure, sorry, I was uh, rushing the answer a bit. The, so the 21 is what we classify a local route. Okay. Um, and so it does run seven days a week and it runs in both directions. It goes from uh, Timberley through Lakeside Beachville into Bears Lake and ends at Lacewood Terminal. So if people are looking to go further than that, they'd have to make connections at Lacewood Terminal. Whereas the 123 is our express route um, so that's only rush hours during the week. Um, and that's the one that will take you all the way to, to downtown, um, but only during rush hours and only in one direction. So in the morning it's heading in town and in the afternoon it's heading out of town. So more focused on uh, rush hour commuters. Um, and I do have, we don't have a lot of, uh, we haven't summarized anything about the new uh, healthcare facility yet, but uh, yesterday we had about 15 boardings there. So that's what we, 15 more. 15 passengers boarding the bus at that new uh, healthcare oh. facility in Bears Lake okay. yesterday. So that's Great. kind of the updated. Great. All right, thank snapshot. you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Dave and team. You're uh, having to adapt an awful lot the last year or two. And uh, it's great to see all the work going on with electric buses and improving security um, for people and operators. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the plans for BRT and um, is this something that's going to be done through an internal or external report and will it involve this council or the next council and how will our aspirational goals be worked into uh, the BRT studies um, and also I, I wanted to if you could comment a little bit on September being a challenging month for transit. Last September, we had an awful lot of overloads. Um, I rarely get complaints about transit, but I got complaints uh, last fall. Um, people were standing at the stops and being bypassed by buses that were just too crowded to stop. So I, th I think this is a challenge in September in particular, so I'm wondering if there, there are ways that we can address that, knowing that it will likely happen, and um, why would we make a change in September if we could avoid it? Like why would we add a, a fair change on top of all the other pressures that we have in September? And, and finally, could you maybe give us your um, perspective on what the number one challenge is to increasing ridership? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of BRT, so council's actually already approved uh, the plan for BRT uh, through improvement of the rapid transit strategy. So, so, so that, that piece of work council's already done. Uh, really the next big thing for BRT is the funding piece. And I know uh, the GRTA's work will potentially have an impact on that as well. So, you know, the, the next, next big funding opportunity is gonna be the permanent transit fund, which uh, the federal government is, is currently engaging on. And we expect to be able to start submitting applications uh, within the next, the next year or so. Um, so, so that's kind of the funding opportunity. In the meantime though, there's a lot of work going on. When you look at all the transit corridors that we're currently developing, like, like Bayers Road, Roby, Young, uh, that, 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 that is kind of, that will become BRT basically. So, so even though we don't have the funding in place to kind of do all, all four routes, buy the extra buses, build the stations, um, we are doing that corridor work, the property work to go with it uh, in anticipation of BRT. The other piece of work is actually doing some functional design work this year so we can get a bit of a template of what a station is going to look like uh, and then that will allow us to better do property and, and things like that. Um, 
can't read my writing on that one. Yeah, I'll move. I'll move into. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, this council, next council, a lot of it will be next council for, for BRT. Uh, so, in terms of September, it's September busyness is a bit of a phenomenon. I'm in my 17th year with transit here, and every year September there's a big surge. Everyone, you know, people going back to university, back to work after the summer, we see a big surge for the first three weeks of September, and then it all kind of balances out. So. Uh, in terms of what we can do, I mean, we we kind of know that and we can try to operationally plan for it, but it, it is a big surge and we can't really put, you know, additional service in just for just for the piece of a month. But, you know, I think the, the general service additions we're putting in will help with that, which is why we typically try to schedule new service in the end of August is one of our possible times, so we try to do that there. Um, in terms of the fare increase and why September, that's largely a reflection of uh, some of the approvals that have to happen in order to actually make, make, to, to make the fare increase happen. So we have um, a, user, a user fee uh, bylaw which lays out all the transit fares and, and our ability to charge them. So uh, once we get direction through budget process for a fare increase, uh, then we have to go through the process of amending that bylaw uh, which generally will take out until about September to comfortably do that. Okay. And could you also talk about the main challenge to increasing ridership, please? Sorry. Um, I don't know. I feel like lately we're not having a trouble increasing ridership, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, right now it's capacity. Uh, you know, th that, is, that is the biggest thing. I mean, uh, you know, capacity of the system. But I think for us as well, it's as the municipality grows rapidly, and grows much more densely as we're seeing through the regional plan housing accelerator fund, it, it, it changes the way we have to do it. And I mean, we're, we, we need to get past just doing like, you know, kind of the regular routes we do. And it is things like BRT, it's things like ferry that are really gonna take us to that next, uh, sounds cliche, but that next level of being able to generate ridership as we, as we grow as a municipality. Okay, so in, just to recap on BRT, the design is already in place. There's not going to be, there aren't going to be too many changes in terms of the route design or any of the, fun, you know, it's just putting more on those uh, already designed routes. So there's different levels of design. So in terms of BR, BRT, we have the plan of where it's going to go. So that's, that's a super high level. Uh, the next step is starting to do what we call functional design, which gives us a sense of like what a what a typical station would look like, what a you know a typical higher level station would look like, and that sort of thing. Um, when we actually get funding to proceed, that's when we get to the detailed design because you're going to have kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of roadway that needs to be redesigned to accommodate BRT, the stations, all that. So that's a much bigger design exercise, but that would be more once we get approval to proceed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and through you, uh, my, my thanks, as a lot of my colleagues have done to, to you, Dave, and Patricia, and your whole team. Um, you know, if we look at the amount of work that has to go into bringing the, the service plan and the budget, uh, I would say transit is probably one of the mo more complicated departments that have to come before us. Um, having said that, though, uh, I just want to back up for a second. In the uh, presentation, in the report, uh, you're looking at canceling, I think it was the 57 and the 26. Um, obviously the 26 is in, in my district, so I'll, I'll speak to that just for a moment. If we go back to the predecessor route, which was the five, uh, which had a slightly different route because it was, uh, when it turned into the 26, it got truncated at Mumford, it basically just became a loop, but a 2K loop, uh, which you wouldn't expect a whole lot of people to want to take. Uh, and so to that point, if, when I went back and looked at the KPI reports back to 2016 through 2017, 18, 19, uh, and then in 2020, 21, when it changed to the 26, um, the ridership fell by about a third. Uh, making the change from the five to the six. Not, again, not surprisingly. We used to go to total boardings of 114, 118, 126, 130 uh, per passenger per hours. We used to get like 33, 27, 31. And literally when we went to the number 26, total boardings 27, passengers per hour 11. Uh, now, not surprising again, you're only running three buses in the morning, three buses in the afternoon. Any sense, had anyone ever considered, because uh, one of the complaints that I would get, especially people who would use it, 
because uh, a lot of junior high kids going to St. Agnes, uh, for example, uh, it didn't match up with the bell schedule. So there was no point in taking it. You're either you know at school half an hour, 40 minutes early, or you're risking being late. So that precluded people from really taking the bus. And similarly, going back, service didn't start again until about an hour or so after the bells uh, had released the kids from school. Um, was there any thought given to tweaking it, seeing if, uh, if it could go back to its previous levels where we could get to those 33 passengers per hour? Uh, no, no, we, we didn't look at any amendments. It was, it was just about, yeah, the, the, the idea was to cancel the route. Yeah. So let's make it really bad, no one rides it, and then we can just get rid of it. Uh, is kind of the approach. Uh, fair enough. Uh, it's, like I say, it's a 2K loop. So if I'm walking to St. Agnes, I can walk there in 30 minutes or I could take a bus and I presume if I'm a young teenager, uh, other than crossing Joe Howe, it's not a, not a hard thing to do. Um, on the fare increase, so in the uh, budget uh, information package, uh, it indicates if we do it in September, that's a $700,000 increase in revenue. What is that annualized out to for a full year? What would, what would we be looking at? Because 700 k is not a huge number to really get excited about, but I'm wondering what it's like when you implement it for 12 months. Just to do a quick bit of math here. <laughs> just trying to think of the, the, the impact on the system versus the impact on the rider, because we, we really just did, very recently, increase fares already uh, after whatever it was, 10 or 15 years of not increasing fares. So it's, I it, personally it, don't know if, if we're ready for another fare increase just yet. Uh, yeah, so uh, it works out to about 1.2 million uh, on an annualized basis. Those are interesting numbers then. So September, October, November, December, okay. Um, so are we expecting, so in, in the next line down, it says ridership growth to fair revenue, 1.8 million. So where, any idea what the impact is? Because typically, uh, if you, if you uh, increase the price of anything, demand can go down, depends on how uh, price elastic the good is. Uh, I would suspect transit is not terribly elastic, it's probably more inelastic. Um, so any sense of, of what impact that has on ridership by increasing the fare, I think it was 25 cents you said. So yeah, so we actually do build that into the fare calculations. There is a uh, there is an elasticity factor that we can utilize in a, in a fare increase. Uh, that's the same one we use every time we do it. So uh, that is actually built into the 700,000 or, or 1.2 million annualized number that we're going to go up a bit, but there's also going to be potential a bit of reduction uh, because of the elasticity of price. And so the ridership on the next line, then that's due to population growth and, and other things, uh, and so you're, you're sort of breaking them out on two lines, really. Correct. Um, I'm almost out of time. I'll, I will come back to a couple of these things, but, um, you know, I, I think we really need to get into that long-term or at least two to three-year plan sooner rather than later. Uh, I think maybe that's something we look at, not next year, but sometime over the next number of months. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I've got a couple of uh, comments, and um, uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary, for those points. You know, the, the more that we uh, neglect building up a route, uh, the more uh, people don't use it. And so at the end of the day, they won't be on transit. They'll be using their vehicle. And you know that's what we continue to see in Hammonds Plains and West Bedford. Um, we've got thousands of people there who don't have Lucasville, who don't have access to transit. Um, and so when I look at the moving forward together, we're in year seven. I think I heard you say a five-year plan. We've got lots more work to do to actually build a plan. But the uh, under my understanding is you're looking at a two to three-year term for that sort of. <clears throat> strategic strategic uh, perspective that being said it needs to align with the regional plan um, housing accelerator fund changes it needs to ensure that we're all doing this work in alignment which is kind of difficult for you because you don't have a, a crystal ball to understand where regional plan is going to go how things are going to move forward with site-specific changes and uh, obviously um, density when it comes to housing accelerator funds so good luck <laughs> 
Because, um, you know, I, I, I see this as a really urgent issue. Uh, I have to be frank when it comes to uh, rural and suburban communities who are struggling to get employees. Uh, this is a real ongoing issue. Without those um, transit access routes, we can't support economic development because we cannot get uh, employer, employees to their employers. And so the, you know, and I think we all know this transit, the, the greatest equalizer in a community, right? It certainly uh, adds value uh, to people's lives, um, accessibility uh, to appointments, healthcare, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do think though that when we think about the economic development lens, not seeing it in here, I don't see it in the budget plan. And so when we look at the work that we're doing for, with African Nova Scotian communities, the look the, what we're doing with Halifax Partnership, what we're doing um, you know, to, to advance uh, commercial development in various communities, West Bedford in particular, uh, we've got companies that are getting their own shuttle because Halifax Transit can't meet the needs and we've got 20,000 people in that community. So I'm just wondering where are you, uh, where is transit at with making agreements or negotiating or conversations with our large businesses that need to get people to work? And um, you know, I think it was uh, IBM that had a shuttle mm -hmm. and it didn't work. So they continued not to be able to have employees and these are good paying jobs in our communities. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. So, so I mean, we do engage with, with various various organizations. Uh, I know when you were at the uh, the speech with the Halifax Partnership uh, just a few weeks ago. So, uh, certainly engaging through them. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the biggest ways that we engage with employers, which has been quite successful, is actually our employer pass program. So, uh, for, for those who don't know, the sales pitch is it's basically an annual pass for employees that comes out of their payroll. Uh, the municipality subsidizes one month, and the employer subsidizes one month. So that that's one opportunity opportunity we can have to, um, you know, to entice people to use transit. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we are certainly always willing to listen to what the needs of employers are. It can often be challenging when you have, um, you know, different employers with different needs. Um, and the next service plan really is the next opportunity to do that in a big way, uh, to hear what's changed. Uh, I mean, I've been out, I've, I've spoken with the folks at IBM before in the past, mm -hmm. so I, I have a sense of what the, the issue is. Uh, some things can be fixed by transit and some can't. So we have to focus yeah. on the things that can be fixed by transit. but. But you know, r really at the end of the day, um, the next service plan, you know, the service plans are usually our biggest uh, stakeholder and public engagement exercise of anything we do as it should be. Uh, so that'll really be the next opportunity to, to, hear, to hear input. All right, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Clary asked my questions about the fares and stuff. I was wanting to know if there's gonna be a schedule uh, what the proposed rates might be adjusted to. I see uh, 275 now for adult fares and and uh, 274 if you buy a package of 10. I'd like to know if we're gonna have a, a new schedule of what those fare amounts may be if we're going up the quarter to make a three bucks and stuff and or 450 for express bus. I'd just like to know what that is and what the discounted rates will be for bulk ticket purchases or buying on the app. So if that could be provided, thank you. Uh, thank you, yes, and that will come in hard copy to council when the uh, when the bylaw amendments come forward. That's all kind of laid out in the, in the amendments, but generally speaking, uh, the fare increase would be the 25 cent uh, single fare increase. I'll say single fare because that could be cash or a single fare purchased on the app now. Um, and then we would take that, uh, it's about a 9% increase, I think, and we would just take that and proportionally put it across the other fare categories, uh, a bit of rounding so we don't end up with, um, you know, s strange amounts. But yeah, that's generally the approach. But council will have the opportunity to see that when the bylaw amendments come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to finish on some of the questions I had, actually one of them was related to some of the discussion that happened earlier. So my last one is um, with the Halifax Go app, which again has seems to be very successful. I'm not sure about the data on that, but it seems anytime I'm on the bus, people are using it, showing the bus driver. Now some of the bus have the tap and, and it's, it's funny to see folks kind of like not sure what they should do with their phone as they get used to tapping it. So it seems to be great. I'm wondering 
kind of like what we had with the Halifax Alert app when service operation disruptions were happening in parking and whatnot, is it possible to integrate some kind of notices in the Halifax Go app related to bus disruptions, um, you know, some of the things that we would put on Twitter or Facebook, as we mentioned, not many folks are using that. Can, can that be integrated? Would that cost more money? What's the, what's the possibility of doing that? Uh, f thank you. And yes, in terms of the, 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 the fare app, I, I'd mentioned, I think 19% of our, our fares had gone to the app back in January, and that's growing. And I take the ferry every day, and I see the same thing, people flashing the app, so that's awesome. Um, just before I pass it over to Mark uh, for your specific question, uh, I would mention one thing we are working with our, our colleagues in emergency management on is the ability to potentially use um, the H HFX alert app for major transit things like right. we're pulling service. It was a, a resident who had suggested that. So that, that work is uh, ongoing to see how that might happen, but I'll pass it over to Mark in terms of the, uh, the HFX Go app. Cool. Uh, Mark Santilli, Manager of Technical Services for Halifax Transit. Mr. Mayor, through you to the committee. Uh, the app does have a limited ability for us to message all users. However, the responsiveness is not something that we can, um, it's not something that we can set up quickly. So for instances where there was uh, a major construction project plan that was going to drastically affect certain routes, we definitely could. But for like individual canceled trips, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for that use. Yes. So. I'm just wondering how do we get to, because we are putting information out, but we're putting it on channels that less and less people are using, and we're starting to see more more use of these apps. Um, and are we, do we own the Halifax Go app, or do we do that through a third party? Yeah. It is uh, purchased from a third party. So right. we, don't, we don't own the app itself. It's a white label app that the vendor has customized to our specifications. Right, right. Okay, um, so so maybe maybe at another TSC meeting, maybe I'll join and, and we can maybe dig down a little deeper in, in what we could do here. But thanks for that yeah, information. The, the the other the other app actually where you can get that information is uh, so so we push out all of our it's called the general transit feed specifications. So information on on you know when's the bus arriving, cancellations, all that gets pushed out automatically. So. Um, there are numerous third-party apps. Uh, the one that I think I use is called Transit App, uh, I, yeah. and, and I think that's the one most people use. Yeah. Um, and that, so, so that that would actually be the place to go to see service disruptions and things like that, because they can, you know, to Mark's point, rather than having it broadcast to all kinds of people that may not care about a particular route, um, this allows you to, to dial in a little more. I didn't want to go that deep, but yeah, I, I would if we could integrate with Transit that. Transit app, that would be amazing because I think most people who use transit use the transit app, but I know that that's, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so thank you, and maybe we'll carry this on at TSC one day. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just following through from the safety-related questions, uh, you showed in the past budget we utilized the extra-duty HRP officers. Is that a line item for this year? Do you have that identified for this year and, and to what amount? Uh, yes, it is. And actually, uh, funding for a second officer is in this year's budget. So we'll have two uh, available to us. And, uh, and uh, you're utilizing them in a specific area or as you're, you're going to use them when, when needed or as needed? Yeah, maybe I'll get, get Phil to speak to that. There is a bit of a, a plan that can be deviated as necessary, I think. Yep. Uh, thank you for the mayor to the committee. Um, yes, there, there is a plan right now. The extra duty officer that we have focuses on some of the areas that we're seeing, uh, you know, more incidents in the Lacewood Terminal, Mumford Terminal, and uh, the Dartmouth Bridge Terminal. Uh, through analyzing the data, we've seen a couple of other areas we'd like to focus on as well. Um, and based on volume of calls and things like that, HRP, we've had discussions with them on looking at a second officer there to uh, to increase as a as a visible deterrent. Um, one of the other things we've done along that's in the same type of line item is uh, increased some of the contract security uh, that we're seeing as well through the last right. little while. We've seen uh, an increase in in vandalism incidents at the Sackville terminal. Uh, so about a month and a half ago, we placed some security guards. Uh, there throughout the later part of the service day, and, and we've been seeing a decrease in the vandalism that's happening there. 
Okay, that's good. Uh, I've got a question about FTEs, and uh, on your slide, your presentation, Dave, slide uh, 11, staff counts, uh, and I, I misread this, uh, I obviously. Um, so you've got approved in the 23-24 FTEs, that was a carryover. There's how many positions were, are gonna be carried over? Yeah, they're not that's filled. Uh, 42. 42 there. And then below that, these are the new positions in this, these are all new. And which ones were, you alluded to it when you spoke to it, which ones are related to the safety and security, the safety for supervisor, program manager, and the business analyst, is that, is that correct? Uh, program manager, business analyst, and project controller. The project that related to safety, okay. Uh, project, you've got two project controllers though, is that, what's the other one? So what is a project controller? Can you explain that to me again? Uh, so yeah, there's, there's two project controllers listed in there. The first one is addition to transit operations. Um, that first project controller is helping us focus on the multiple transformational projects that are coming through uh, transit and transit operations. That includes the electric bus project, um, hopefully you know other major projects that are coming through around. Um, you know, the new garage, you know, possibly um, things with the ferry, and the data work that's happening around how we're analyzing and looking at data through the operational lens. The, the second project controller that is tied to the safety uh, program uh, will be focused on the, the um, <clears throat> sorry, the creation of the safety program, the resources required from there, and then the, uh, some of the analytics and managing some of the things that will come work with the work from both the bylaw and the safety program as the appeal process uh, and other things as, as pieces come out of the bylaw. Okay, uh, I'll come back. I do have questions about the other uh, FTEs, so I'll come back, Mr. Mayor. Right, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, committee. So uh, talking to staff, like listening to staff, talking to uh, councillors during this debate before and after lunch, and then talking to staff during the break, uh, what I'm gonna suggest is I'll come back after the uh, main motion has passed, and I'll do a motion asking for that supplementary report. That way we're not holding up uh, budget, but the uh, talking also to it's more than buses during the break, uh, you know, to identify how many service hours are required to increase, actually increase service on one of these corridor routes, and how much the difference is, the delta is between the very small amount of service hours that would be freed up by uh, cutting those express routes, not reinstating uh, rein, uh, the cut runs. Uh, you know, apparently it wouldn't be like half a bus, right? But I think we should get that on paper. Uh, what uh, one staffer said to me is, you'll get a much more uh, clear answer, fulsome answer, if you ask for it on paper instead of, you know, off the top of my head from up there at the mic. So I'm not going to make a motion to defer, and I'll come back with that after this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Outhead. Um, thank you, Mayor. And Dave, as long as I've been on council, so you've heard this before, I'm gonna have to do my usual uh, routine here because every time we talk about a fare increase, and, and Sean touched on this about elasticity and, and whatnot and, and temporary drops in your, you just like after strikes, after increases and whatnot, you sometimes see a, a drop in uh, ridership. So it, it just, it always bothers me because Somebody who uses the bus right now, and we want people to use the bus for economic and environmental and all kinds of other reasons, is really paying three times. They're paying the fare, they're paying in their general tax rate, and they are paying in the rate if they live within a kilometer of a bus stop. And those are the people now that we want to charge more to, <laughs> who are doing what we want them to do, which is use transit. So it, it's always kind of, while we as a council, and I've supported it, have made more and more things free or discounted to, to for the long-term marketing, if you will, of, of transit. And on, on all of those I've, uh, I, I have supported. Um, so I, I'm wrestling with that, and I'll have to see what others think about that. But you know, another increase when we're trying to get people to use the bus, or to some extent, almost rewarding them for using the bus, instead of penalizing them, is, is something that I've always had problems, and you've heard me give this spiel many times over the years, Dave, but I haven't changed my mind on that. The other question I have, with the more automated approach now to, and we've all heard good things about the, uh, the new system, is there finally a chance that we could have staggered fares based on zones? To pay the same fare to jump on 
on Spring Garden to go down three blocks versus Bedford to go X number of kilometers, same fare. Not, no, not an express route I'm talking about. Is there not a way to stagger fares or have zone fares or something, you know, to array to make up the revenue that way, if you will, rather than an increase for everybody? So just a, what, what alternatives do we have to a fare increase? Uh, thank you. So I, I guess the most immediate alternative would be to put on the tax rate. Uh, that, yeah, that would be yeah. the other alternative. Uh, and I, and I, I you know, absolutely appreciate what you're saying. And you know, as, as the head of transit, it's always a bit of a weird position to be coming yep. forward for all the reasons you've mentioned with a fare increase. Yep. Um, one, thing I, I, one thing I can mention, just if, if it helps, is that when you look at the rate of inflation since our last yeah, fare increase, yeah. like even with this increase, we'd be about half of that. So, you know, we're not keeping up with inflation. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's a council decision. You know, do you want that on the fare? Do you want it on the tax rate? At the end of the day, I, I, I spend the money regardless of where it comes from. So, um, well, you don't spend it if it doesn't come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, z zone fares, uh, I, I think I think the app could technically do it, but I, I think. The bigger question around zone fares is more of a policy question, actually. Yeah. And, and is that the way you want to go? I mean, ultimately, you know, we're not restricting people to only pay by the app. So whether the app can do it or not, you yeah, know, we have yeah. to figure out a way to do it otherwise. I mean, there are cities that charge zone fares. Uh, Vancouver's uh, yep. probably the biggest one in Canada. Um, interestingly, on the flip side, Ontario just got rid of all of its multi-jurisdictional fares in southern Ontario. So you can ride from you know, Ajax to Burlington on one bus. They get a lot of provi they get a lot of provincial did. help, though, yeah. don't they? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the, pro the, the province did it. So, so, so I, I think yeah. in terms of zone fares, that'd be you know that, that that's more you know that's more of a policy decision um, than than probably a technology. Well, decision. I'll just have I'll see what others have to say. But the fare increase always kind of bothers me a little bit because, as I say, I do sometimes think we're penalizing those who are trying to do the right thing. And of course, the, the zones, I think, is something that we probably should look at down the road, but we'll see what others have to think. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I sent a couple of amendments to the clerk's uh, email address, uh, so I'm not sure if you guys got that. I don't know if you monitor that while we're <laughs> in our meetings. Um, but I, uh, so I mentioned the, the number 26 uh, being cancelled. Uh, and. I would like us, rather than to just uh, go from a service that had acceptable ridership to a different uh, route and timings that saw a one-third decrease in the ridership, rather than cancel that, see if there's a way to maybe go back up to the ridership that it had before. So the amendment that I have here is a request for a supplementary report so that the Committee of the Whole on Budget uh, request a supplementary report on potential changes to t either timing, service hours, and or routing for bus route number 26 that might be feasible to increase ridership to the levels previously seen on the predecessor route number five. Uh, that would be my, my motion. Yeah. Are you doing that now, Councillor? Are you doing that now, Councillor Clay? I'm doing that now. Is there a second for that? I'm hoping. So that the Committee of the Whole on Budget requests a supplementary report on potential changes to timing, service hours, and or routing for bus route number 26 that might be feasible to increase ridership to levels previously seen on the predecessor route number five. Uh, do you want me to do that through teams? Yes. Okay. So that's not the motion that was made? No, no I'm trying to get uh, a motion to, uh, to the clerks here in the chat. How do I do this? I don't do this kind of stuff. So you've heard the motion. Is anybody? Is there a second for the motion as read? Yeah. Council seconded by Count the Deputy Mayor. So the question for Dave and or Jerry is: What would? What's your, your? What does that do for this motion if this passes with that amendment? How do we? Does that go to the bow? Uh, I have another one coming too on the fairing. Oh, uh, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> Dave or Jerry? So, so I think you know if if we're looking at you know the motion, Councillor Mason's thinking of making and having that be a ballot item. Jerry, this probably makes sense to treat this the same way. I think the, the challenge with this one is, I mean, it, it may or may not actually have budget implications. It may just reallocate that we take some we take those resources away from uh, what we we're planning to use to fix overloads and things like that. Like that would be the because th that would be probably where it would end up coming from, but. 
Yeah, th thank, thank you. So the bell will come back, I think it's March, 20, uh, March 27th and April 2nd if needed. So if, um, you know, if, if within Dave's capacity to bring back that report in time, I would suggest that would be an appropriate place that it would go as a bell item. Yeah, I agree, okay. So the last part of this was that, that, it, that it would go on the bell list if there's a financial implication. Seconded by Deputy Mayor. A discussion on this, Councillor Vancini? No, no. Mr. Mayor. Is there a discussion on this uh, proposal, this amendment of um, request for a supplemental report? You ready for the question on it, colleagues? That passes, uh, Councillor Cleary. My, do I stop time here? I can't see. Um, if I do, yes, I do. All right, <clears throat> so then I have another uh, motion. Now this one will definitely have financial impacts. So we'll see how we deal with this one. Um, that, and I sent this to uh, Katie, uh, that the Committee of the Whole on Budget requests a supplementary report on impacts and mitigating tactics that would allow transit to avoid an increase in fares in 24 25. That's seconded by Councillor Purdy. So in layman's terms, uh, what, what can you rework so we don't have to uh, increase fares? Because Mr. Traves doesn't like that kind of okay. straightforward language. It's, so that's, I, that's the motion that's on the floor. Again, the it will go to the bow list. Just bow. Yeah. Yeah, the BAL list, yeah. Just Budget bow. adjustment list, it's weird. Any, so, I mean, we might be able to avoid a, a staff report here just because, I mean, realistically, we, 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 we've already, thanks to finance, already calculated the tax rate impacts are... 0.1% on the rate. Otherwise, you know, we want to know from council what do you want to shave off for that seven hundred thousand dollars. That's kind of the okay. The answer. What do you What do you make, Dave? I'm kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> A few <Okay>. of those. <laughs> so that motion was put forward and seconded by Councillor Purdy. Ready for the question on that one? Is there no discussion on that? Ready for the question? Councillor Lovelace on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just looking for clarification on that. Are we discussing specifically service impacts? Are we talking oper operational impacts, um, HR impacts, or just all impacts? So I, I just, just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page here. What I take it from what Dave is saying is that they have, they, we pretty much have the information on this. We either will go with the increase or we won't. Dave? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the, you know, if, if if there's a desire to pull back service or something like that to make up the, the difference, that option's there. Um, otherwise, yeah, the, the, the tax rate implications are 0.1% uh, on the right. rate. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to support Councillor Mary's, Councillor Cleary's motion here because, uh, you know, I think even even if the conclusion is, you know, what there's not really either either you're going to raise taxes by to make up the difference in money. There's no real places that you're going to pull this from from transit's budget. Even if that's the conclusion. I think it would still be useful to have this on the bow list so that we can keep our options open until we get to the end of the process and look at the budget in its entirety and then decide where you're weighing because a fare increase is a tax on transit users, 
right? So whether it's there or whether it's a property tax, you're still raising revenue from people. Um, so I think having that as an option open for us to look at when we get to that end of the bow list, uh, bow, <laughs> um, I think is, is totally fine and reasonable, so. Okay, Councillor Arthur. Yeah, just quickly, I'd like to see more come back than just either we raise fares or we raise taxes. I mean, that's pretty simple. Dave's already said that. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more to it than that. It's some more options for us. Uh, you know, well, if we delayed this, if we did that, or if one less person was this, or this vacancy was that, or, you know, a little bit of something rather than just, you know, any idiot can say you can raise taxes or raise the fare. You're not, and you're not any idiot. So, uh. <laughs> I think what yeah, I think what Dave is saying is that they put a lot of work into this budget. This is what they've come up with. Well, if we choose we're not putting to do a lot it, of work into this too, fine. saying we're not so, comfortable yet. Yeah, that's fine. That's our option. Yeah. Ready for the question, colleagues? That motion is carried. Let's go back to our regular list. Council, is it you, Councillor Mancini? No. On the, on the main motion, as amended? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, going back to the FTEs, uh, uh, Dave, going back to the FTEs again. Um, so the majority of the new positions, the 49 positions, are operators. So I guess my big question is, you know, we've had challenges the last few years in finding people to take on those roles. Have things changed? Uh, page 11, Dave. Uh, have things uh, changed? I mean, what's our recruitment like? Are we, my understanding in the past, we were hiring and then they weren't staying and we weren't able to keep them. Where is, what's the, the uh, state of affairs right now when we're looking at hiring operators? Uh, so, so generally in a far better place than we were when I was sitting here that last year. Um, our recruitment, uh, our, the general employment uh, environment has, has changed, I think, uh, as, as we've all seen across all kinds of industries. So it, it, it is more of a risk today than it was uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, that's for sure. But we are seeing our classes fill, like our training classes are full now, uh, retention's better than it was. So we're, we're in a far better place, but it's something we will we will, we will measure and manage and monitor as we go forward. Um, just to clarify, so 42 FTEs are tied directly to the Moving Forward Together plan and the service increases, but those are, that includes uh, like mechanics and maintenance employees uh, and that as well. So it, it isn't 42 operators, just uh, I think it's about, I think it's 30, 35 operators out of that. So, but it is all the positions required. Right, but in addition to that, there's 38 new operators that you're asking for, for support on, is that correct? Or, is that? When you look at that chart, I'm looking at the chart on page 11. Yeah, sorry. So it is, yeah, it is, th sorry, th I said 35, it is 38 oh, right, right. Uh, operators, and then the remaining four are like maintenance employees. Yeah, so when I look at this list, colleagues, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, we have to hire all these positions, these 49 positions, but, you know, I, I support the, the three positions related to safety, and then obviously we need 38 operators, we need probably even more. And then, you know, <laughs> how do you not hire a mechanic if you need a mechanic? So it's pretty slim picking, so uh, on not hiring. Uh, what, what is a uh, hosteler? What is that? Cleaners. A cleaners? Are there? Yeah, those are the folks that uh, fuel and clean the buses, okay. so they're part of the maintenance team. Yep, all right. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Jerry, on this? Well, I'm looking for a gig after October. i pretty good with a broom, so I can handle that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to Councillor Mancini's point, something I'll just point out as well. So when you saw the corporate services uh, budget come forward, and I know there's a briefing note coming back on that, but there was some positions within the HR department that uh, to staff up around recruitment initiatives. Yes. So I think it was mentioned like Halifax, the Housing Accelerator Fund, Transit. So that's part of the, oh, okay. the big yeah. recruitment strategy as well. So okay. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. That briefing note should be coming to you guys soon as well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, seeing nobody else on the list at this, yeah, afterwards. Uh, no, seeing nobody else on the list, ready for the question on the main motion as amended.
That's carried. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I move that the Budget Committee request the Chief Administrative Officer prepare a supplementary report identifying options and challenges for permanently removing proposed reinstatements on low performing stress routes and reallocation of these services to address overloads and increased services on corridor routes. So the intention of this would be, as, as I described earlier, to get the information about how many hours could be freed up and whether that's enough to make a material difference. I also hope that what would happen in there is we get an idea how expensive, how many service hours are required to add a full run of, of route on a quarter route. Because I think it's important that council has a bit of an idea in the public, like it's not five hours, it's how many ever hours it is. So I'd ask for council support so we can get that info. Thank you. Okay, that was seconded by Councillor Clary. Any discussion? Ready for the question. That is carried. Okay. Colleagues, we are do we need to take uh, five minutes before our next uh, presentation? Do we have everybody that we need? I don't see them. Folks, let's just take five minutes and uh, get ready for our next uh, presentation.
Okay, folks. Colleagues and lawyers, if you could take your seats in the interest of, uh, we're gonna proceed in the interest of safety. Okay, folks. We, um, we welcome uh, the distinguished Bill Moore uh, here, um, what, what is your title? Are you executive director? Uh, director? Yeah. President? What are you, what are you, executive director? Yeah. Executive director of uh, community uh, safety and he's got a whole team of brilliant folks with him. Uh, happy to see you all. Uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good afternoon, council and mayor. Um, it's my pleasure actually to bring to you the first Community Safety Business Unit uh, Business Plan and Budget Presentation. Um, as you realize, uh, just about a year ago, um, City endeavored to create a new business unit, bringing together a group of, of just uh, various units across HRM uh, to form the Community Safety uh, Business Unit. Um, I just, oh, thank you very much. My concierge, Chief <laughs> Superintendent Christie. Um, I just bring the presentation up, I guess, please. Thank you very much. So our, the inaugural um, mission statement for the uh, public safety, I'm sorry, community safety business unit is to champion a community, focus, a community focused holistic approach to safety and well-being in Halifax through the implementation of strategies to mitigate, prevent and respond and recover. The business unit um, has undergone a bit of a revamp since the initial inaugural um, creation of it. Uh, probably the, the key piece that you see that you'll see changed from the original unit is the expansion and of the public safety office. So as you recall in last year's budget, you're gonna come take care of yep. oh, thanks. Um, as you can recall, last year the part of the budget process, the public safety office um, Council was gracious enough to provide additional resources to allow them to move into a program delivery model. The public safety office initially was what I would call a think tank strategy session. And as it started to build out deliverable programming, we realized that the structure was not in place. So um, that provided some funding uh, to bring on some additional resources. Um, and through that, very shortly thereafter, was the decision made by the administration to create the community safety business unit. So. What I'd like to do before I get into the service areas here is um, I have a good deal of the staff here with me. So um, maybe I just uh, ask uh, our public safety advisor, Dr. Amy Cicilano, is here with us today. Our uh, director, a new director of programs and partnerships, Lillian Ash. Our director of housing and homelessness who needs no introduction, Max Chauvin. Uh, our director of emergency management and chaos, Erica Fleck. Uh, our lead on food security and food systems, Letitia Smiley. Our director of community standards, uh, who was a new director appointed into the position, she was an acting position at last year's budget, is Andrew McDonald. Our coordinator is Kara Evans, and our financial business partner, who was actually here with uh, Transit, is Jeff Drover. And then in the second level, I have a whole bunch of additional staff in the public safety office. So you're, you're, you're getting a good snippet of those people here with you today. The public safety office now is, is across the business lines um, of research and development, which for all intents and purposes was the previous public safety advisor role. Uh, within the research and development arm, uh, we have uh, the ability to do research through Dr. Cicilano. We have a research assistant in-house, and we also have uh, Song Cheng, uh, sorry, Song Chen, who is our uh, in trainer. 
So we're able to, to start to deliver programming um, out of that particular area. The second piece, as you're well aware, is the housing and homelessness front that Max is leading. Um, I'm sure we'll have more discussions around that piece, and I know that we've been in a, a number of discussions with council recently on what is going on in the city, and I'll leave that for, for a little later on. The emergency management portion of our organization um, under Erica's leadership has been growing and, uh, and has, quite frankly, has been regularly challenged over this year in the response to a number of uh, events, uh, both natural and, um, and uh, weather related, in addition to supporting uh, homeless operations during those events. We were here in front of council not long ago on the Part B food um, secure, I'm sorry, just food plan and uh, some discussions and I'll have more information around that. Our community standards and compliance uh, have continued to provide service to uh, bylaw nature, animal control, uh, licensing uh, across the organization. And the other part is the second part of the public safety, which is the delivery arm of pr programs and partnerships. I'm gonna to briefly touch on uh, a few of the successes that the business unit has enjoyed um, over the last year. Um, the public safety strategy just, uh, about, just about a year ago was approved unanimously by council um, and uh, that has taken life and begin to work on a number of areas across the organization. Uh, I believe council is in receipt of, uh, by, by way of memo, of the public safety update, which will be coming to council officially. Uh, I believe it was well explained, but I just, for the record, is uh, the reason that was done that way is originally my presentation was gonna be coming to you much later on on the budget, and the public safety update was planned to be with council before that. With the change in me coming to see you early, we felt that uh, we'd be beneficial for you to have that information as, as part of your deliberations. Probably the, one of the fundamental pieces that I see uh, coming out of the public safety strategy is the creation of a center of excellence. Um, we, we now have a team, as demonstrated by a number of the players here, that are bringing together a wider range of, of, of backgrounds, strategies, formal education and experiences to really start to build out the role of community safety on a go forward basis. I mentioned the nonviolent crisis intervention training um, to date, uh, we just about 300 people have been trained on nonviolent crisis intervention training in HRM, including some of our uh, partners in the community. Um, we've been uh, actively working with our community partners on having them um, have their own instructors. So we're starting to move that message across the organization. In addition to the public safety strategy, and I'm not gonna go through every piece because I think the, the report does outline it quite well, but one of the things that we're in the process now uh, is the creation of an evaluation framework. Um, unfortunately, in some cases, strategies come and plans come, but they don't have any formalized means of being able to say, are you actually meeting what you said you were gonna do in an empirical fashion? And we feel as part fundamentally to the way we approach things is that if we're gonna do something, we should be prepared to measure and be prepared to use empirical processes to, to be able to determine if we're actually moving the needle. On the emergency management front, as mentioned, it's been, it's been a year. Um, I'm pleased to say that uh, through that year that we have actually been able to increase the capacity. We're not there yet all the way, but we've been able to increase, the, increase our capacity in the emergency management front. And uh, I can, I'll speak to some of the positions that have been added on that. Um, in addition, uh, some new products have come on, or new programs have come online that the hazard risk assessment is still in flight, which will inform where we go into the future. Our voluntary, voluntary vulnerable persons registry is, uh, is now increasing the number of, of individuals and uh, was actually activated as part of the last uh, snow event and we had people actually uh, responding to the calls and check-ins and we were so, so things are starting to move and, and actually the, the rubber is hitting the road, I guess, in relation to some of these concepts. Uh, they're moved from concepts to truly active programs. A 
feel I could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about housing and homelessness, so I'm just going to touch on a few things um, that have been happening. Um, the ability of the organization to mobilize and provide basic humanitarian care uh, to those that are sleeping rough in their encampments it has been an ongoing uh, piece of work. Um, in addition to that, the work of diversion, uh, trying to keep people uh, adequately housed before they reach the point of having living in a tent is a, uh, another area. <coughs> excuse me, another area of work. And I'll speak more to some um, some additional funding requests in that area as we go forward. And then as council knows, there's been an ongoing uh, relationship building and uh, partnership with the province uh, on how do we move in that area uh, to an area that, that some would say is not a municipal responsibility. Um, but we do have a role to play in partnership with our uh, provincial partners and also our federal partners as we look at housing in a broader sense. All of that is being done within a process that we um, of providing a, hopefully a level of dignity to those that are living. So we have an ongoing conversation with those that are living rough um, through our navigator program. They're in daily contact. That's been supplemented this year by the addition of uh, some bylaw officers that are dedicated to the homeless uh, issue. Uh, they've created a, a, rep, a, a real rapport and it really has shown itself to be beneficial uh, even over the last few days and in, in having discussions with individuals on taking options other than sleeping rough. Um, in our programs and partnerships area, our community mobilization, mobilization team um, led by Raven Glasgow um, has been doing some fantastic work in community, uh, trying to build resilience, uh, responding to uh, traumatic events in the community, building out community capacity. Um, in being able to deal with those is, um, issues that, that unfortunately some of our communities are experiencing. Um, this year we'll see a move and in, in, in an expansion into the Spryfield area as the CMT program continues to move ahead. CMT touched over 400 people in communities. So the, the power of the ability of that group to be able to, to help and instill uh, uh, training and, uh, and other, uh, other tools in the community is, is a force multiplier. And um, you know, I, I, it's a wonderful program. They, for I don't believe it's been officially brought to council yet, but they just completed a, a very, very good video that talks about what CMT is, and we'll make sure to get that out around. It's just started to be circulated around now, and we'll make sure the council is able to uh, get an opportunity to see that. The work in relation to the Preston Townships and the trauma rollout plan um, has been uh, showing great dividends and good, uh, good pickup by the community. And the other piece that we have coming out of partnerships there is the, the expansion. We've added an additional staff person this year in the gender and safety area, so the safer communities work. Um, that's work that's been focusing on uh, women, women's safety and, and gender diverse folk. Um, we've seen a um, uh, a real pickup. We've been working collaboratively with transit. Um, we just had transit before us here on how we can support transit. Um, just on that point, we're also doing some work on youth violence that we're working with transit in relation as well. So we're starting to see the community safety function supporting not only community, but starting to work uh, horizontally across the other business units um, in, a, in a consolidated and coordinated fashion. As mentioned, I'm not going to go into a lot. We, I, I do have pages, uh, literally. I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to get the document out to you, but for, for this, suffice it to say, I'll leave a lot of the other details and updates in relation to those to the public safety strategy update that you have. Um, I will take any questions that you have once I finish the presentation in relation to that. So we move on to food security. As I previously mentioned, Part A was approved by this council unanimously last March. Uh, we were back to see with Part B. Um, that plan has continued to grow and evolve, now bringing in members of our African Nova Scotia and our Mi'kmaq community um, into working groups that are starting to work, moving that ahead. The direction of council to become a signatory of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact has occurred. 
and uh, we're actively working towards um, attempting to get Part B approved and uh, resource that to move the Part B of the action plan forward. And our community safety and compliance um, was a bit of a change for this year uh, as a result of the wire, wildfires. Uh, we had to bring a little bit of all hands on deck approach to what we're doing and, and we were able to, to shift our compliance and bylaw officers, by officers into a supporting function in relation to the response and the recovery uh, during the wildfires. Um, I see that there is an ability uh, and a potential uh, option in the future to continue to look at that flexibility to be able to use our resources to their greatest extent possible. Um, and as I mentioned already, uh, already uh, as a result of uh, some work that Parks and Recreation had done in the previous budget, uh, some positions were moved over and now we have a capability in, in, in bylaw to dealing with homelessness and housing issues. When I mentioned earlier about empiricals, um, we, you will not see at this point a number of KPIs in the business plan. Um, as a result of work that's un being undertaken now, this will change. This is, as I mentioned, this is our inaugural business plan report. Um, to be completely honest, this year I, I applaud the, the organization and administration for creation of the business plan, but um, the back room pieces of building a business unit and bringing them together um, were challenging. And uh, I think you'll see, and I'll point out a few things during our business plan here today of things that we're aware of that we still need to, to, to take on. And one of the areas is, is KPIs. The KPI that we're showing you here is, is just uh, around um, food insecurity. And um, I think that one dip in the middle of there it was, we believe, um, uh, related to the use of CERB. I mean, so what that does is it, 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 it graphically demonstrates that income is linked to food security. So um, as we start to come forward, we wanna start making these broader connections. We're doing a lot of work across social equity, being able to look at how these things uh, are moving. So my, my, I guess my promise to you is that you will begin to see more KPIs and more measurements as we've been, but we wanna make sure that we're not just counting for the sake of counting. We wanna be able to count to be able to show that we're actually moving in a proper direction. So I think that's probably one of the key areas that I would say from a business plan, if I was to look at this myself and say, hmm, where are your KPIs? I'm telling you right now, we're, we're, we're light on those, but we're, we realize that that is light at this point. And as we look through the public safety strategy, and as I mentioned, the evaluation framework, some of those KPIs will be coming out, but they're, at this point, because we're new, we're building them. So, some of the planned work highlights for 2024-25, uh, probably the, the fundamental piece of this is partnerships. Community safety, and I've used this as a mantra in discussion, is when we're looking at, looking at servicing and uh, community, if there are already existing community resources in play that need support, maybe our role is to support those resources as opposed to trying to build something new at a government. So the way we do that is obviously at the speed of trust. That was a, a line taken directly out of the policing transformation report that we need to move at the speed of trust. And I, it, it struck me because um, a lot of the work that we are doing is work in communities where trust has been an issue and continues to be an issue. So um, we, we take our time, our staff are very, very in tuned to doing things with people and not doing things to people. So that building strong partnerships is fundamental for us to be able to move forward. And I think the addition of our indigenous uh, social policy uh, position is opening up new doors, just as an example, opening up a number of new doors, our partnerships with the African Nova Scotia community is opening up new doors for us. And um, I would be remiss if I said that we haven't had a few missteps and we've had a reset, but I think that as a result, we are moving in the right direction. And um, so partnerships are, are key. The social, pol sorry, the social equity index is work that we're looking at to try to determine um, are areas of the municipality 
receiving the same equitable availability of services. So we're really looking at both geographically, uh, where, is, where are services being provided, um, things like food security would feed into this. Things about you know access. We're doing, you know, for instance, uh, work around with the capital steering committee on bringing a social equity lens into decision making as to where things are going to be built, because the building or the not building of certain pieces of infrastructure in different parts of the city may have a different impact. So some of that work is being done and trying to be trying to weave this into some of the things that we are doing on a day to day basis in the municipality. Um, coming out of a report that I inherited actually quite some time ago uh, was a, a, a question around senior safety and the senior, senior safety programming. As we looked through the public safety strategy and the work that we were doing, um, we looked, we, there was a number of, of recognizable um, groups in there that needed to be served, but one that was, was not in that mix and it kind of came to fruition was the senior population. We have references in, to senior population in the food, uh, Just Food Action Plan. Uh, we have uh, rec or, sorry, references to seniors in the homelessness framework, but we have not really brought together a comprehensive, I would say, approach to senior safety. So uh, with some work and some seed funding from the province, we will be looking to undertake some uh, work in that area this, uh, this year to determine what does that look like from a comprehensive perspective in the senior safety programming. In the Youth Violence Prevention Program, we've had a youth uh, services review completed. Coming out of that, we've now have a, uh, a, youth, uh, a youth services strategist um, online that's starting to look at, we're looking at a pilot with um, one of the community groups on providing outreach service. And we're working, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with transit to in partnership to see whether or not that may be an assistance to transit and some of the issues that they've been experiencing around some of their terminals and, and the like. We'll be looking this year to move into the mobile outreach and transportation service. So as order of the public safety strategy, one of the pieces we were looking at is being able to take services, support services and transportation services to those in the community in need. Um, there's a, this is a bit of a changing environment. Uh, there are some other pilot projects that are happening uh, on behalf of the province. So as we move forward, we're, we're moving uh, slowly in that area. Uh, but as you'll see in both the presentation, I'm sorry, the budget and also in our BAL discussion, there is an opportunity to exhilarate some of that work if it's so desired by council. The Just Food uh, Part B plan, um, uh, as council recalls, uh, there was a BAL item uh, at moved over uh, from that in the area of $522,000. We went back and uh, as a result of that, we were able to, this is one of the pieces that we find when you transfer different pieces of, of money and we actually found some additional money that was still sitting in government relations that was supposed to be for that program. So we were able to draw that down and by looking at some of the pieces of the program, uh, offsetting hirings and stuff, so that, that we, you will be getting an updated note on that to that reducing that down to about $250,000. So um, I think that's, uh, it was, yeah, so, um, yeah, so so it, it is it is a, a bit of a good news. It, it, there are some there are some I would call um, small changes. As I said, we're probably looking at this point uh, that was achieved through through reducing the grant to a half year grants for the first year out, and also as I said, some delays in hiring. But uh, I think all in all, uh, it's uh, well, I'll leave it to, to council to make the decision. But um, I think that's a good news story. Uh, the additional work on the policing transformation study um, is part of the discussion uh, coming out of the police commission and uh, the the budget um, police budget. There was a, a motion to to assist community safety with uh, the secondment of a couple of positions. Um, with my previous role, I was full time on the policing study, and then as I took on this ED role, uh, the policing study is still on my on my desk. So. You know, working with our HRP and our RCMP partners, I think there's probably a, a role in that for someone to assist in that. So my, my hope would be, depending on what happens with the entire budget, 
would be to look to uh, use one of those two positions as a project manager to continue to move that work uh, between HRP and RCMP, but, but also uh, the intersection of that work with the community safety business unit. So there's kind of a tripartite approach in relation to moving ahead some of these chunks of work that, uh, that intersect and touch the three pieces that are there. Uh, we've received very good support in our, in our shop from Josh Bates, who's doing the, the policy work at the board, but there's still some room in there, I think, to, to be able to, so that's one of the pieces that we're looking at, at potentially doing with this business year. And in addition would be hopefully bringing the hazard risk assessment. Um, I won't say to fruition because uh, the hazard risk assessment process is an ongoing process, but certainly doing the, that heavy forklift uh, work on the front end to be able to get that to a point that we're able to use the information coming out of that to make uh, good decisions into the future. Internally, um, going back to this, uh, there's still work to be done in building the business unit. Um, between that and our people, um, I'm pleased to announce that as part of Employee Appreciation Week that we're gonna have a bowling party with the high score, low score, and best dressed. So, uh, you know, that is a bit of fun to get people on, but, but the other piece of it is actively engaging our people as a standing item at all of our directors' meetings is, is a question around safety. And then safety is not only just near misreporting, but also what are we doing to support our people? We have a lot of uh, people in our business unit that are doing very, very emotionally draining work. And we need to make sure that they're physical, um, uh, they're f they're physically and mentally that they're being supported. Um, as we go forward. Um, you know, as I, I keep going back, but this has been a long year in relation to emergency response and dealing with issues in community. And uh, you know, some people are tired. So we need to make sure we're taking care of our people. So you'll see some work more coming out of those as well. So, um, so. <laughs> this is, this is one of the pieces of work that's still, we're still working on. And if, if council will bear with me, um, school crossing guards are coming over to community safety as per the direction of last year. So that's where we're going. So I, I wanna highlight this, that the 61.4 FTEs at the top are true FTEs. A crossing guard is a 0.4 FTE. So there's about 158 school crossing guards. But when you do the math and just some people in different numbers in there, it comes out to 61.4 FTEs. In some of the earlier uh, material, you'll see down just to new positions, there was five crossing guards added, but they were added as five FTEs. So if we do five times 0.4, this should be actually two. It's two FTEs, but five people. So five crossing guards. That, so um, we are going to endeavor to clear that up because we're, we're using FTEs and body and head counts inter, inter, kind of intertwined here. So the request is um, in this budget is for five crossing guards, not five to FTEs. And uh, the, in addition, when I get to the bow, and I'll speak more to it at that point, um, we've been playing catch up generally in relation to crossing guards on an annualized basis, trying to, can we, do we have the budget? Do we have, that the request is in there for another, because we do know that there, is, there are asks right on the, on the cusp of coming to us. So I'm being very upfront when, in relation to crossing guards, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental decision. Do we want to be uh, ahead of the curve and be able to be nimble, or do we want to wait and try to scrounge budget, not scrounge, it's the wrong term, sorry. Try to, uh, a fine budget later on and have that making a decision on, on whether our guard gets added or not. So going down, that's probably the biggest piece of, of anomalies. Um, you'll see that for the most part, uh, the upper part, um, our business unit was created by transferring a number of employees from other units. So crossing guards from police, uh, my position and a number of other uh, positions came out of the CAO's office. We had a transfer of one position from finance. We had 38 coming from parks, I'm sorry, uh, planning and development. That's the comp uh, community standards compliance people. And then uh, three from fire to EMO. On the three from fire, um, that's actually two funded positions and a position that was a temporary position that's not funded. So in essence, the impact of that was actually only two positions, although there's three position numbers. Again, something else that we'll clean up as we go forward. 
have to be honest with you, council. <laughs> so, so that's where that part is. What we see in the budget looks this year is the five, the first five guards. Um, these were overstaffed last year. These are guards that were in place around the, um, the council road hits area, the guards up throughout the new school um, up there. So we were, these were overstaffed positions so that we're just looking to bring them up to, to bring them part of the wage model. Uh, as mentioned, there's a, another compliance officer for housing coming on board. Uh, looks like we're probably, we've been had a couple of postings uh, for the second position. Uh, we now have a plan to go forward as a, a developmental opportunity with a, an internal staff member. Um, we added uh, a food truck um, a coordinator. If the council recalls from the Just Food Plan, uh, emergency management has a, a five ton uh, refrigerator truck that was used, well, that we have available. And so this position would be to assist not only the food uh, safety, I'm sorry, um, to just food plan. So on a day-to-day -day basis, the truck will be used to assist in the movement of, of additional food around the city. And if need be in an emergency, it would flex into an emergency response to be able to assist with the, the delivery of food in an emergency management program. So that's where that position is. Um, we brought on a full-time hazard risk and vulnerability assessment person this year. They've been working um, on, that, uh, on that plan uh, out of emergency management. We brought on an emergency management administrator to assist um, with the vulnerable persons and the Halifax alert. Uh, there is an emergency management admin assistant to assist with some of the incredible paperwork to be, to be done in that office and an emergency management voluntary program lead to work with all of our volunteers, including GSAR, the GEMS teams as well. So, so we, we're seeing an increase in the staffing model in relation to emergency management. Um, so we are some other things that we're working on in partnerships with our internal business units around looking at supporting us from a GIS perspective and the like, and uh, we'll continue to work through those pieces and through the emergency management planning committee uh, as we go forward. Um, in addition, we also brought on an additional housing and homelessness coordinator um, this year to assist in the placement. That person has been pivotal, especially over the last little while in assisting uh, service providers in, in navigating, helping to navigate some of the individuals who are sleeping rough um, into potentially uh, indoor locations. Uh, and that's been working very, very well. So um, that's our st the staff count. Now go to the, I guess, the, meat of the meat and the potatoes of this thing. Um, the approved budget for 23-24 uh, was about $9 million, a little over $9 million. Most of that budget remained in the home organizations for this year. So most of the work being done was, move, was an internal movement between business units. So what you're seeing now is that uh, Basically, all of those cost centers, if you will, have been now moved into a single community safety business unit budget. Uh, I won't go back through the additional uh, additionals on the top. Um, we do have some inflation service. I will make a note that in collective agreements at the compensation that in within that number is about three hundred thousand dollars of transfer of additional people that were moved from one business unit to another. We're not giving a million dollars in, in raises. That was an internal transfer of some additional monies in there. There are uh, in built in an additional $200,000 um, for in site cleanups. And we did add another $100,000 in relation to an ongoing fund to support the operations of the Emergency Operations Center. So that would include things like the IT upgrades. Uh, for instance, we needed a new floor. And, and the like, so that's being built into the budget. You'll see other transfers here from Just Food, Navigator Program, the like, those are the existing budget line items from other business units. Uh, there was, I mentioned earlier, one position that was returned uh, on a comment that finance was uh, in, we needed some help in, and Jerry and his crew uh, graciously transferred that individual over into our business unit and then some additional miscellaneous changes. As I mentioned, there are a few BAL, potential BAL items that we put on. Um, 
Some of these have been added based on conversations that have come out of the reason why we were moved up in the timing um, through discussions around alternative services um, uh, in the community. Uh, there's a potential if, if council so, so wishes that we may be able to move some of these programs up further. So um, the first one in the enhancing city um, safe, I'm sorry, enhancing the safe city program, there is an opportunity uh, to do some work uh, in response to some of the Mass Casualty Commission uh, recommendations. So in this space, as council members last year, there was two things that were asked about. One was the school crossing guards, and the second thing was victim services. So in victim services, there was a suggestion that perhaps victim services would not have to remain in police. Uh, I met at that point with the previous chief, and, and we went through it, and, and what I really came down to was that I don't think by doing that we would solve what we were trying to solve. I think what we were trying to solve is for those who do not want to engage with police, it was still a means for them to report and get supportive services and provide them with a trauma-informed care, is which I believe that's where the gap is. So if there is, if there is interest in that, and as I said, this does line up very nicely with the a number of the recommendations coming out of the mass casualty where we're taking a women's safety and gender-based violence approach um, on this. There, we feel strongly that with that amount of money and the present safe city program that we'd be able to, to run a, a project, or, sorry, a pilot project to deliver third party supportive trauma informed approaches. The second one is in relation to um, the community crisis response model. With the budget last year, uh, if one was to look at the original public safety strategy, not all the positions requested were staffed last, last year. So what we ended up with one's um, social policy strategist position that was really looking at four different portfolios. Um, with the discussion around mental health, civilianized mental health response and those things, the additional uh, one FTE in relation to community crisis response, we believe would be able to assist in moving that program forward. As I mentioned, there's a number of pilots working with the province right now, working with our policing partners, that we would be in a position to uh, potentially exhilarate uh, whatever future options may happen. So in the public safety strategy, this was scheduled to be done next fiscal, but there's an opportunity to, to, to do that in this fiscal, coming fiscal, sorry. The other FTE, which goes along with the next two items, um, the strategy talks about mobile outreach and transportation. Uh, that was a service of being able to going to those that, that are uh, sleeping rough in the community, um, uh, that are experiencing crises, individuals that, that are, uh, I would call them more of a, a nuisance in some cases, but, uh, or some would consider them a nuisance, but not, not criminal behavior in some cases. Um, we feel that between money that is in the existing budget and the addition of one FTE and that additional amount of $325,000, that we would be able to put a, a small scale pilot on the road this year, being able to support that type of approach. This is a, a similar approach that was started, I believe, in, in uh, Edmonton? Toronto. Toronto, sorry, started in Toronto. And if anybody's been following what's been happening in Toronto, Toronto has actually created almost a fourth emergency service. So Toronto has police, fire, and ambulance. They started as a small pilot, a piloting a community outreach, mental health outreach. Um, it is a multi-service provider model. So not, it's not one big agency, but they are providing services and that has grown to the point where there was actually a motion in front of the Toronto City Council a short time ago to actually officially name it a, their fourth emergency service. So if this is indeed the vision of where council would like us to go in relation to, to alternative response models, this would be the first step in seeing what that potentially would look like. And the reason that money is, is uh, being asked for is again, to speed that up into this coming fiscal as opposed to waiting into the next fiscal year. In the housing and homelessness front, um, I fully expect that we will be back in front of council on a broader discussion on housing and homelessness. At this point, for the sake of the budget, what we've realized is that uh, diversion money um, really has a great return on investment and we're uh, asking for an additional amount of money on diversion money, $60,000.
And then the last piece is the additional five crossing guards, which would put us ahead of the curve instead of playing catch up. Again, that's really a fundamental piece. We, we, if we decide to do it, we'll either be overstaffing or we get ahead of the curve. But I put it in for your consideration. And that is the end of my presentation. I'll take any questions. Thank you, uh, Bill. I just want to note for those following along that um, you mentioned the Public Safety Strategy Annual Report. That is going to be available, I understand, today. Online for people? Available today. That's what I was told just before I came up, Mr. Mayor, but I can verify that. Yeah. So anybody who's looking for it can find it either connected to this meeting or is it on our website now or does anybody know? It is. It is. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, all right. I'm going to ask uh, Wade to uh, Councilor Mason to lead us off and I'm going to ask the Deputy Mayor if she'll come and uh, take the, the chair from me. Thank you, Mayor, and we'll see you later. Uh, I move that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Community Safety Proposed 2024-25 budget, budget and Business Plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation attached to the staff report dated February 28, 2024 in the draft 2024-25 operational budget. I so move. Second. <laughs> <laughs> There's no support in the room at all for what you're trying to do. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I said last year, and I'm going to reiterate it, this is the most important thing that we are doing as a council right now. This is the transformative piece that we need to be doing. Uh, and I look at you, what you've achieved, Bill, and your amazing staff, you know, person after person walks in and we all know you all and you come in, I'm like looking at you all back there and I'm like, oh, they're great and they're great and they're great and they're great and they're all working in one unit and you haven't even had a chance to get to the place where you, you're still storming, you're not norming and performing yet. That's years away and we know that. But the power and the uh, expectation that I have is that when this really starts to gel over the next couple of years, we're gonna see truly transformative things, important things to make this community safer and, and more fair for all. Uh, I have the strongest possible support for all of this. And I will also say, and I, is, uh, is Christy still in the room? Like both uh, the RCMP uh, union uh, a couple days ago and a bunch of cops from HRP have been like, uh, we really support what you said during the police budget because they really want this too, right? Like, like unequivocally want this. Like, when, when, when those meetings and those phone calls came in, I'm expecting them to, them to say, why are you holding up the police budget? And what they're saying is, get us these non-police response things. We need that. So I've heard that unequivocally and clearly. Uh, so here we are talking about a Toronto model as a fourth uh, service, a fourth uh, emergency response service. and and. Uh, you know, an alternative response model is required for us financially. It is prudent, in my opinion, to make these investments now because if we invest heavily now, we are going to slow the increase that will inevi inevitably happen as we grow in police services. If we stand this up and continue to heavily invest in this, this will pay dividends. Not this year, probably not next year or the year afterwards, but we will see the benefit of having non-police response and alternative response to all these things. So, and I've been bugging, if you saw it, Councillor Minchin and I joking around there, it's because I kept saying, I'm gonna move that one, and I'm gonna move that one, and I'm gonna move that one, because he's being the fiscal conservative today, and I was just like, I support every single one of your overs, and I think every one of them should be moved. And I'm gonna start with, uh, I won't do it just this minute, because uh, I'm gonna run out of time, but I, I will definitely start with the uh, uh, mobile part, because I think the mobile outreach is very important. I have questions for you, though. So, just to be really clear, I like, first question is, I love that we're increasing the support for emergency management to by three, it looks like three or four FTEs, it's hard to tell because we don't know what the pay range is. Uh, you know, looking at that chart that you had, 62 full activations of EMO compared to 16 the year before and 12 the year before. Uh, how can we not? We have to make that investment or we're gonna burn staff out perhaps more than they may feel burned out already. Like we need to have those resources there if that's what is happening in our community and it is and it's not gonna slow down, it's gonna speed up. So my question for you is simply, is that enough or do you see a long-term plan for what we're gonna be doing with, with EMO and with that kind of emergency response? Next question on page five, when you're talking about the mobile outreach, there's what's in the budget on page five and then there's an over and I'm still not entirely clear on what the difference is. Like we're going to do work to lay that out but if we don't do the 
over, it's not gonna come as fast as we want, I think is what it is. Some clarity on that. I think you clarified the crossing guards. The, there's five FTEs just to keep our head above water, just to keep uh, uh, treading water. You want another five, not FTEs, another five crossing guards to get ahead of the game. Uh, I, I think I got that. Uh, and then as far as the, uh, the other three go, the uh, uh, number five, number one, number two for the over is the 60K. You know, all of those, I, I don't really have a question, I'm just gonna say to council, I feel like, like how can we say no uh, to investing in a alternative women-centered reporting service for survivors of gender-based violence, mm -hmm. right? Like, we know that's a huge issue and we're not gonna solve it without investing in it. So I guess I would just say, I'll throw it over to questions because I have 15 seconds left, but we are quite comfortable talking about investing 10 million or 50 million more dollars in policing. I think that $800,000 is also required in this place. Thank you. Bill. Great, uh, thank you for your question through the councilor. Um, so on the EMO, no, EMO, that's not enough. No, I think we need to continue to grow that program. Um, we've just, at the last EMO planning committee um, um, meeting, we've brought on Kildoon to start to work through the emergency management accreditation program. So I, I don't know if I mentioned this to, to council at a previous day, but w one of the things for us to be able to look to see if we have a, a robust and complete emergency management program is looking for a metric to, to measure ourselves against. And what we've landed on is the emergency management accreditation program. 73 or 75 attributes that are assessed um, by a not-for-profit group that is made up of emergency managers from across North America to, to, to basically look at your program to see where do you need to put more time and energy. So we're starting that program now with our business continuity plans um, internally, and I, I would expect that that will continue to grow. I expect that uh, as we do that, um, we will continue, and I probably should mention this point is, is, is on, for instance, the GSAR program that reports in their emergency management. I know there was a presentation this morning in relation to that. Um, with the change in the administrative order that happened, so no longer under the grant program, and then GSAR is now an emergency service provider to HRM, there are mechanisms in place there for, for HRM to either purchase equipment and loan it, to emergency service providers or provide loans. And quite frankly, we need to just, we need a little bit more time. I, I just ran out of runway, quite frankly, in relation to that. So um, we will be looking at that and what that program looks like. There is a combination of the list that I've received of some operational items, which I think we may be able to do just internally now. Um, and then there's a longer term question around how do we support some of the larger capital asks that are in there. But um, uh, I've, I've actually, I've spoke, Eric and I spoke just prior to us coming up here today, um, and we'll be looking at, at, at circling back around on that and coming back with a bit of a plan for that piece. So that's the, on the EMO. So th there'll be more to come on EMO um, as we go. Um, on the mobile outreach, um, in the enhancements, mobile is 449,200 400, 449, there, and an additional on the BAL, of three, four, oh, five, three. Well, there's two parts too. Yeah. Like, so, what, so, what's the difference? Yeah, so, so really, that is, if if we want, it, this is time, scope, and budget. So, if we want to move up the the to an actual hit the ground running piece, we're not changing the, the the scope necessarily. This would be about getting that up and running on the front end. If not, it would be probably over. It would not be next fiscal. It would be the fiscal after that that we would be able to hit the ground. So it's not two or three. It's you'd need two and three to hit the ground running. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And that, and that would be, that's based on the, the funding numbers that we've extrapolated out of the Toronto, Toronto, Toronto and, yeah, do you want to come up? Sure. Maybe I'll just get Amy just a touch because she's, she'll have the, plus I want to share the, share the limelight. Thanks, good, uh, good afternoon uh, committee and deputy mayor. Um, so the question around the, the mobile outreach. Um, so we do have money in this year's budget to uh, start a program. When we went to council last year with the public safety strategy and, and the recommendation report, we identified that the amount that we had requested was an estimate because we hadn't done the full cost model yet. 
So over this year, we've done that, and as a result of that, the original amount has been, um, has risen. Um, we also didn't, so, so the budget has increased for that based on the cost model, updated cost model that we were able to do for that. Um, and uh, we only had, have one position right now that is leading um, all of the alternative response um, actions in the public safety strategy. And so with the BAL ask, we are asking for what we would consider adequate resources to oversee the implementation of the mobile crisis response as well as, or sorry, the mobile outreach and transportation service um, and the community crisis response service. Very good. If someone doesn't move them by the time I come back, I'll move them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Or Mr. Moore, were you finished with the answers? Questions, so I'm finished, unless they're repeated. <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Deputy, and thank you, staff. Uh, you know, I'm very happy with the work that's being done in this group. It's, it's one of the one of the or very early moves of our new CAO was to stand this business unit up, and it, to me, it felt like this is exactly what we were needing to do um, to have this kind of coordinated place. And I will note. Um, going to the FCM conference in Toronto this past year. I did sit in on the session that was entirely about Toronto's response and it was very inspiring. So that over to enhance and speed up that work, to me, council, that's an absolutely uh, no-brainer that we should do um, because I think that there's huge payoffs, not just on a financial sense, but just from a fundamentally dealing with people in a much more humane way, um, you know, coming from that. Uh, the questions I want to ask about, though, it all relates to encampments. Um, in the report, um, it talks about the services that we provide at them, water, um, power, garbage, or sorry, water and garbage. Power is not explicitly on the list. So we, am I right then in this budget, we are not budgeting anything for providing power at encampment sites? I just want to make sure I get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is. I just want to verify there is four hundred thousand dollars in the budget from last year that would transfer over to this year for that. So um, there is money available to provide power, and with the removal of power that will eventually occur here, there is an option to do that because we were looking at power as well. We provide a power at the, the Sackville ball field as well. So as things come down, there's an opportunity to look at that and there is funding available. What about water um, at sites like actually running water? Because it just seems to me we've designated a bunch of locations, yep. but then the quality of what existed at various locations was completely uneven, um, yep. with some places receiving you know, some good services and some not. And I'll tell you from, uh, you know, in my district, what I've seen is I've seen people popping up at on, um, on designated locations where you can plug in, such as the Sullivan's Pond bandstand, the light standards at Northbrook Park, and if we're not providing consistent services at all the encampments, we're actually creating incentives for people to go to the sites that we have said, you know, don't go to this one, it's more harmful to the community, go to this one. Um, Deputy Mayor, through to the Councillor. So what I would say is that in, in many cases, some of these things grew organically. You're correct, mm -hmm. that, that there was, a, the provision of water was, is bottled water. Uh, sanitation is porta potty, and then the power, the power work, in, to a great degree, was a result of, of fire concerns and the cold. So, as we move forward, one of the things that we're discussing now is that do we take a much more um, managed, engage, um, managed approach to encampments, and that would mean providing more services to those encampments. Um, so, as, as I said, there there is funding to provide some of those services within the existing budget that will transfer over into the next year, and uh, and so so the, I guess the answer is is that if 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 that makes the, if that's a decision of council that we want to do that, then we can make it happen. Within the existing budget, we have enough money to provide a consistent level of service to all our designated encampment sites. It would depend on the size of the encampment. 
and there is, lies the problem. So, not to press the point, like, it, could, could we put power at all our sites? I don't know physically if we, the, the answer is potentially we could, but I don't know, I don't know what the cost would be. So yeah. for instance, when we provided power at the Greenway, that required a, 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 I would call it a relatively large piece of infrastructure to be put in place to be able to distribute the power from there. So I think it would be a site by site on what the costing would be to do that. Okay, that sounds like uh, me coming back with a motion for a briefing on that so we can get some of those questions answered. Um, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna ask you about compliance quickly. How many folks do we have working in the encampment issue on the compliance side? Because what I've observed is any rules we've had have not mattered one bit, in part because there's been such a, uh, so many people outside, but any idea that like, you know, this site can only hold nine people I mean, to my knowledge, we have not had anybody going around um, on any kind of daily basis saying, well, there's too many t tents here, you need to relocate to this location or to, you know, here's locations where there's openings. It hasn't felt to me like we've had one space at all, but also any staff capacity to do that. Am I correct in that? How many folks do we have? Oh, Deputy Mayor, through to the Councillor. So we have two positions, one of them is staffed and uh, that individual has been visiting encampments on a regular daily basis. Um, so um, to the numbers in encampments, uh, we have seen, a, as, you, as you well know, a, a swelling of the numbers in the Green Road location. Um, but they are, they are visiting our encampments on a daily basis and, and working through there. Um, we have leveraged additional bylaw resources, uh, so those that are not the designated housing people to be able to, to for instance, when we were providing notices and, and looking at those um, aspects. Uh, you know, this again really comes down to, and I, 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 as I started off in my presentation, I think there will be a, a, a broader discussion with council in relation to where do we want to go in relation to the in the encampments and or do we want to be because there's a number of things that are ongoing that to be quite honest um, I could put in a budget ten thousand dollars or I could put in ten million dollars in a budget but I think we need to, to have a, a, additional conversation on, on that particular issue realistically is one with one to still be staffed two people is that actually enough people to manage compliance um, in a situation where this summer we'll probably have 400 people in our parks again? It would, it would, my, it would depend on the infrastructure that we're trying to support. The, and I'm not trying to be cute about it, but it's, it's, it depends on what supports. If, if it was truly just one, if it was one encampment, two would probably be able to do it. If it was multiple encampments across a wide geographic base, um, and pop-ups, then we would probably be looking at uh, uh, moving into the other parts of it, uh, uh, the other parts of compliance to assist. Okay, uh, I'm out of time, so I'll come back. You are indeed, Councillor Austin. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Mancini. Love it. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Bill Thanks, and for the team behind you. Um, boy, um, come a long way with well, a department of one versus what you have now and the responsibility is uh, is truly amazing. Um, I guess I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna jump on where Councillor Austin is on the encampments and I, and I do have a question and I wonder if Max can come forward because I really wanna get a sense because we're talking about budget and, and talking about resources and, and I, I really want to understand and people watching at home to understand. Max, if you could share with us, where are we today when it comes to the homelessness situation and the encampments? Where do you anticipate we'll be in the spring? And where do you anticipate we'll be come summer? Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the council. M uh, Councillor Max Chauvin, Director of Housing and Homelessness. Um, currently, at our last count, uh, we had about 100 people sleeping rough in the community. Uh, that number has dropped as uh, some folks have taken uh, housing options recently. We expect in the spring there'll be a hundred or more new folks uh, becoming, uh, will be coming out of both shelters and out of other options that they've maintained for themselves over the winter and uh, potentially another hundred to 200 over the summer. 
and they'll come from a variety of different circumstances. So we could be in a situation where we have 200, 300, maybe even 400 people living rough in our municipality this summer. Certainly looking for that opportunity, yes. And so the work that's being done now, which is amazing work, uh, really it's not enough. So wh where do we find ourselves in the summertime? I, I mean, we've got a new minister down in the province. Uh, have you had a good conversation with that new minister? Uh, Bill has had a conversation with him, as have uh, the mayor and the CAO. I haven't, no. Wow. Uh, so I know my colleagues are going to bring some motions for it, so I'll wait for them. But I, I've got so many questions on the encampments, but I'll, I'll come back on that piece. So I'm, I wonder if the uh, other questions I do have. Uh, Bill, you talked about the mobile outreach, which really intrigues me. You talked about this being maybe one of the steps to alternative response to model. So you're talking about, you know, when we talk about policing, the conversations are in the municipalities about our police officers being in the hospitals for 12 hours, 14 hours with those that have a mental crisis going on, uh, that there's many people don't want our armed officers in that, uh, in that situation. Um, the police chief is asking for 12 constables that, and, and to have special training so they can deal better with mental health. You know, where does this alternative response model, uh, starting off with the mobile outreach person, how does that lead to that situation? I'm going to refer, I don't have it with me here, but there's a very good schematic in the policing transformation study that, that talks about the present service provision. So uh, where I would say it reaches an example of well-being checks. Yeah. So non-criminal, um, low risk, potentially low risk, well-being check. That's an opportunity for someone to be able to go and look at that. And when and Dr. Cicillana was talking about the outreach, w one of the things that we were looking at is that uh, providing some, I would call it, low-level mental health interaction in relation to some of that. So, you know, if you had a social worker going out, could that social worker go and do a well-being check on someone? It's not police response, um, and and do some of that particular. So, th so that's one particular one that we would do. Certainly, in that matrix, if it's a if it's a high-level, high-risk, I mean, the police are going to be res in that space somewhere. But there are a subset of those that could be done alternatively. Um, in relation to your uh, reference to the emergency departments, I think that's a slightly different issue, I think. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, at this point, uh, police under the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act have the ability to apprehend and take to a hospital. Not sure how, I think most of the work on this outreach would be done on a voluntary basis. I don't think they have a legal standing to be able to do that to force someone who did not want to seek um, support. So there would be some interaction there. Uh, and I do know that there's some work being done at both the provincial level and, and locally here in relation to alternatives to um, the custodial care of individuals in the emergency department. So do you need to have, for instance, a, a fully sworn police, you need to have a peace officer, I believe, but do you need to have a police officer right. there? So, right. and those are right now, they're in the, they're being kind of led on the policing side, but there's, that's what I was talking about, the, the, the intersection between policing, community safety, and all those things. They all touch each other because as we, you know, as you probably well aware, you could have a situation, if you're gonna have an alternative response, the alternative response should be in response, the best response model to the situation presented. So that requires that all of these different facets be linked together in a system right. to allow you to escalate, but also allow you to de-escalate. And that's one of the things in the Toronto model that, um, that I really did like is that they integrated their response mechanisms into the 911 system. So when it comes mm -hmm. into the system, there was a set of triages to make a, 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 the best decision possible as to who, what unit should be the response unit mm -hmm. in there. So this is not a bunch of disparate pieces that right. are there. Here, here. This is about bringing into a, a, a comprehensive system that allows the best response for the situation being presented but also the latitude to be able to escalate or de-escalate is required. Okay, my, my time's up, uh, DM, I'll come back. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Deputy, and thank you, Bill and team. I, I'm sort of gonna, and, and, and Tony sort of got to start it, it's in your last answer there, Bill sort of got us going here, because I'm, my worry is obviously what you're doing is incredibly important, and I support it 100%. But I am, I just have this fear that we have this problem here. 
and we have the province running at it, we have partners running at it, we have HRM running at it, we have the library running at it, we have the bids running at it, we have police running at it, and I don't know who's on first and who should be paying for what. And maybe that will, maybe that will come forward, but I mean, if we were to do this mobile outreach, does that change the role of a navigator? Does it change, change the role of, of police a little bit? Does that change what Paul and his group are doing? Is there some funding to be saved somewhere else? I don't think significantly, we've talked about this about policing, but to be pulled from somewhere else to go in to, to, to your department or to, or to somewhere. I, and, and I wish the, the CAO was here because I, we are doing a wonderful thing and we're all falling over ourselves trying to do a wonderful thing, but I, I'm just not sure yet, and maybe this is coming forward in your plans, but I mean, if there's a plan about to come, then it should have been here, I think, before the budget. Because the plan, to me, dictates the budget. And who's on first, and particularly if we start funding some of these things, and I agree with Wade that there's nothing there that I wouldn't like to fund, but where's the trade-off? Does this mean there's a couple of bodies less at police? Does it mean that Paul's group doesn't need quite as many? Does it mean, and what about the navigators coming in and reporting to us instead of the bids? I think we've been talking about that now as long as I've been here. So I, I, I'm really having trouble getting the, the overall game plan here. Councillor, um, so I, I guess what it would say is we're trying to um, coordinate that space. That's, that's, so Good. the, the, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, it's, it's a changing environment. So for instance, there are pilot projects that are starting to occur now. I know that uh, Dr. Cislano is sitting on some steering committees. So, you know, the, the best case scenario would be, not saying, not that's right, not the best, one of the scenarios could be we come back and go, the provinces decide to stand this up, they're filling the space and we can back off. We don't have to, we don't have to duplicate it. Right, but the initial work around coordinating um, those particular pieces is, is, I think, it's work that needs to be done. Um, you know, the service provision model could be a simple on our end is something too is that we have a service manager, but we contract a third party provider to do that. So, so I think there's a there's enough work to be done in the space, but I think before we decide to go down one particular path, we will be doing that initial work and then basically coming back to say, look, this is our best recommendation on okay. where we think we should go, not to duplicate. Yeah. And you know, your point is well taken that as we're beginning, I think we would be in a very, very bad place if we were to say, if I was to come to you and say, oh, in two months from now, you can tell all those people to stop doing what they're doing because we've got it. That's, there's gonna be a, a point of ramp up and a probably a point where there's two services until we're, we're sure that we're able to with, withdraw another portion of that. And that's fundamentally, um, for us to get to where we want to go, that is the kind of the trajectory I see that we have to do. If, if we want to get there, we're going to have to design, um, be aware of our surroundings, partner, build, and then once we build, make sure we build to be able to either to um, work collaboratively with another process that's going to stay, but be very, very niche and be the two of them would be complementary. Or do we get to a point to say, no, we can probably look to stand down that particular piece because that function is there. But it's it's that ramp up, and and in the void of of having the efficient or having a plan to be able to do that, I think we're we would continue doing these little kind of one-offs that doesn't become part of a comprehensive system. So there's method in the madness. Well, there's certainly madness, and there's a method. Whether they're connected, I don't know. <laughs> no, and, and I don't mean to, and it's yeah. not that I'm not supportive, but uh, you used the word duplication, and duplication irritates the hell out of me. So, you know, we want to make sure, not that there isn't plenty of problems out there to be addressed, and I'm not suggesting, and as uh, others have mentioned, it's going to get worse probably in the better weather. But I, I just, I just, I'd like a chain of command. I'd like a little more control, for lack of a better word, and a little bit more of who's doing what and who's on first, and it sounds like you want that as well. So, All right, so I'm, I'm comfortable with this based on that response, so thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Councillor Rothead. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, so like uh, my other colleagues have said, I too am 
really pleased to have seen this office established and to see it start to take shape and direction around a key initiative. So, uh, you know, th this is great, and I too am very supportive of um, many of the asks here. Um, just a couple of notes around the community mobilization team in Spryfield. Um, you know, it has been good to see that that get off the ground and, and to start. I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. And, um, you know, in particular with connecting with, with community. I mean, that's what really requires kind of on the ground trust and partnership building, which requires hours and requires, and requires the work. So I look forward to seeing how that's evolving over the next year and um, how I can support that as a counselor. Um, you know the the you know you talked about um, kind of missteps I mean, along the way. I, you know I think that's par for the course when you're establishing a new office. Um, you know and and the important part is the course correction as we go forward. So um, you know back to your comment just now about you know method in the madness. Um, yeah, this is this is new and we have to figure things out, but I definitely think it's the right direction. I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how we're supporting um, rural populations in community safety and public safety. That was um, a comment that was made uh, the last time you were before us, and it, it's just, it, it's not clear um, what's happening in that realm around what is the need for the community safety office in the rural communities. I know we have the, the uh, vulnerable persons um, registry, which is which is great, but I'm just wondering, kind of, what else falls under your office in that regard? Um, intrigued to hear about senior safety. I know that's a conversation we've been having in Spryfield lately, and uh, you know, I don't know if you have more to comment on that now, but I will be looking forward to seeing what comes forward in regards to that. With the food, um, with the Just Food Plan. So I think you said, if I got this right, we've got it down in, in the budget document, it's 300 and something. We've got that down to 250. What does that mean ongoing for us? So what do we, what do we approve? Whatever we're approving now, if we approve the 250, what will that mean next year for us and, um, and ongoing? Um, and... Um, Where's my time? Okay, uh, sorry, I know I'm hammering a bunch of questions here at you, but maybe I won't have to come back. Um, I, I just want to uh, just give a, a shout out to the group doing the, um, the hazard risk and vulnerability assessment, community assessment, that they've been great. I know they've been kind of working really hard. That's like a, a lean and mean team there, um, <laughs> going out and doing all that community consultation. So. Um, Look for. I know it's, and that's just the beginning. That will be ongoing. I don't know if there's any more information about what we can expect next from that group, but um, very important work. And finally, the community crisis service team. So I did send a note to everyone on council because we had a presentation at the FCM Public Safety Committee um, on Friday, and um, had a had a presentation. And I mean, what a what a great thing they're doing. I, I great program, great success. Uh, the number of calls that they have been able to divert from the police to the appropriate channels has been significant. It's having a significant impact in, in kind of that public safety delivery, like having the mandate of public safety and being able, being able to deliver it in a different way. Um, I know that program costs millions of dollars. Um, can you just say like what, what what are the next steps in that? You mentioned that a plan will be coming forward to us on the, on what that might look like, what the Halifax version of that might look like. Um, when might we see that plan? And as well, the the one in Toronto relies heavily on community partnerships for helping deliver that service. Um, just any you know back to the cost and to Tim's point about who's responsible, who pays for this. I know in Toronto, a lot of those uh, public partner, the partnerships that they have are provincially funded partnerships and that they are looking for more support from the province to realize the, the, you know, the fullness of that program or the, you know, the, the possibility of that program. So I don't know um, if you have any more comments about that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor, through to the Councillor. Um, so in relation to the rural question, um, certainly the Vulnerable Persons Registry is, is an opportunity that's, that's HRM-wide. Um, our use of GSAR in support of that is also in relation to um, rural as well. Um, the senior safety piece um, started off as a rural-based piece for senior safety from a, a, with a specific program ask around a program that the province runs, a senior safety program, which is a program that has been run by the VON um, in HRM, but the, you know, between long-term care and VON, they both are, have decided that they're not, um, that's not the best spot for them to be. And there was some suggestions that uh, those municipalities um, in the province that run those programs uh, with funding support from the province tend to tend to be run well. So rather than jumping completely on that wagon, I thought the first thing we should do is a bit of an assessment to see what exactly are we providing because you know, um, on the senior safety piece, do we need to have a person that's going to talk about senior safety about scams and then senior safety around food security and senior safety around as opposed to a comprehensive piece that an individual could come speak to a group around a wide range of senior safety issues and have them located. Um, I'd also say that the joint emergency management teams, the continued growth of those in the rural community. Um, I'll uh, let Amy speak to, but some of the mental health pilot work that's being happening now is happening outside of the core of HRM. So, so there are some of those programmings that are being looked at now. And also on the homelessness front, um, we, one of the reasons we did increase our homelessness staff was to actually have someone available to start looking at rural-based homelessness um, as it goes. So, so we're, we are very alive in, and I will refer back to the recommendations in the Mass Casualty Report that, that really does give you a nudge to not to have an urban bias. So um, it, it, we're very attuned on how we provide programming, albeit it may be in a different fashion due to the, due to the geography, whether it's urban or rural, but that the fact that services need to be provided. So they can't be left out. Um, on the just food, just for clarification, the reduction to 250 is 250 from the BAL ask of 522. That's so the, the, there's funding in the budget as it is now. There's a BAL ask that will be going that was 522. We've been able to get that 522 down to 250. That's what that was. The annualized cost for just food on an ongoing basis is a, around $900,000 a year. And I'll leave the community safety question to Amy. Thank you, Councillor Kettle, for the question um, to the committee. So um, just a bit of background, um, it also in relation to the to the question from Councillor Outage, I would say that the landscape uh, is changing very rapidly, even since we, uh, well, Council approved the public safety strategy last year, so we've seen a growth in support. Uh, for folks um, uh, experiencing homelessness through outreach services uh, recently and um, as well as more, um, uh, I would say, work toward uh, uh, community mental health crisis response service led by the province. So I, as of about six months ago, have been invited to sit on a working group that's led by the Office of Addiction and Mental Health and uh, they recently released an RFP. I think it closes on March 11th um, and the intent of that RFP is to establish and fund a community mental health crisis response service outside of the area that is currently serviced by the mobile uh, mental health crisis team. So outside of those boundaries, um, a new service will be stood up uh, this year likely. And so there's, there is work uh, happening underway and, but I also think that, and so, so that's happening and we're trying to keep abreast of all the changes and I think one of the, one of the reasons why we don't have a plan uh, for you yet on a crisis response service or, um, you know, fully a, a, a mobile outreach and transportation service is that um, we haven't had the bodies uh, to do that. And so as part of the ask this year actually is to help us uh, staff up so that we can continue at a quicker pace on the research uh, and design aspects of this work while we are also uh, adjusting to the new services that come online and the changing uh, landscape that we're, that we're presented with. Okay, interesting, thank you. 
Thank you, Council Council um, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, um, Deputy Mayor. So, the animal control services are under your jurisdiction now, are they? <laughs> <laughs> This conversation, sir. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, the, the, the the ghost of Brindy follows you. <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm, I'm kind of wondering about um, uh, the the request that uh, Councillor Morris has in about dangerous dogs and stuff. It's supposed to be has some kind of better judi judicial process to try to resolve dangerous dog uh, situations. I haven't seen anything lately for that report still yet to come forward. So I'd like to know where that may be. You know, as I see this is a post brindy experience, I think that we should try and learn that instead of going through the courts, it's gotta be an easier way for uh, pet owners to deal with uh, their animals instead of going through court systems. So that's one. Uh, in regards to the discussion on the regional search and rescue coordination, it seems like, you, are you consolidating or, or emerging or, or it says, is formed from the four ground and search rescue teams we have across the area. I have three of them in my area. So I'm just kind of curious of, uh, is this uh, uh, an amalgamation of them, or is there, are they going to lose their autonomy, or, or, or are there going to be better just collaboration, cooperation amongst them as there always has been? So I'd like to have clarification on that. And also in regards to our joint emergency management teams, I don't see nothing in here in regards to any money resources being dedicated towards the GEMS and the GSARs. So is those monies somewhere hidden in the budget numbers? I'd like to have some clarification of where that stuff is regards to the, the grants that they normally get, plus requests we had earlier today from the from the Halifax Search and Rescue team, looking for additional funding, but there's also our GEM teams that are, are also out there trying to do their community endeavors, but you know, they don't do any direct fundraising, so they're kind of dependent upon uh, our resources and stuff to, to, to garner and educate and train volunteers to be uh, on our, our community, community safety program, so. Those are my two major questions. Um, Deputy Mayor through to the Councillor. Um, so uh, Councillor Morris and I actually met uh, just two days ago in relation to that report. So um, I'll, maybe I'll leave that to Councillor Morris to speak to you about where, where that, that's going. Um, I won't speak on her behalf at this point. Um, in relation to the autonomy of GCR, so as, as Council um, would, uh, I think, realize the, the, there's, a, there's a been a change in relation from going from grants program to the operational funds for GSAR. As a result of that, there was a change in the administrative, or, I'm sorry, the creation of an administrative order to name the four uh, units and um, the amateur radio as emergency services provider to HRM. So within that administrative order, there is provisions in there for um, the loaning of equipment and those like. So um, in my conversations to this point, I mean, they are, they are autonomous units that we are using to provide a service in HRM. So uh, I have had internal discussions around, um, will our discussions be one to four units or will it be one to one unit? I understand there is a 2007, I believe, MOU that's in the process now of being reviewed. So um, I think as, as these things come together and we decide um, how, are, are, are we going to be dealing with capital items on a one-time basis or am I going to get, I'll just say for an example, am I going to get four requests for four command trucks? That's, you know, we, we, that's I think some of the discussion to be had and I'll be very honest with Ken. So some of this I ran out of a runway on, on something. So the question around the budget, the budget apparently used to be as a, a line for that, that number and the top up is inside the line number. Yes, it's, it is fun, it's $200,000. It was the original amount plus the $58,000, um, I believe in supplemental increases that happened as a result of the change over to grants. It's not listed GSAR, but it's in the budget. Right. And the broader number, and just in relation to the GEMS, at the at last um, emergency um, management planning committee meeting, there was, uh, uh, Eric Fleck had brought forward the question around honorarium and funding for, for GEMS members and the like. What we found doing our internal review is that it's a little bit all over the place and we're trying to figure out exactly how we can do that and that we're not potentially violating any CRA because um, different parts of HRM deal with honoraria and volunteers differently. 
So we wanna make sure that whatever we do is aligned and, um, and, and appropriate. Thank you. With the emergency preparedness period coming up in early May, I think it's uh, vital that we maintain our, our, our connections and connectivity with the, uh, our joint emergency management teams as well as GSAR and all our first responders out there because uh, that time of year coming again. Noticed in the FTE table, there was an addition of a volunteer coordinator to to kind of take on that role and start be you know as 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 well as the emergency management office was relatively small and this was one of a myriad of things that they were doing. So by having a dedicated resource to look at that, we can hopefully build a stronger um, program that that has a little bit more um, directed focus from a staff for a dedicated staff person. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this report. Thank you for all of the work uh, that's been done. Um, thank you to your team. We've, uh, I just feel like we're constantly running and scrambling uh, to get stuff done. And, you know, I think you, it was said uh, by someone earlier about the speed at which we're moving. Mm -hmm. It's pretty intense. But if you go back a couple of years, nothing was happening and now we have this massive housing and homelessness crisis so it's good that things are moving and that people are making decisions to get things done um, and it was only a couple of years ago in 2021 that the province of Nova Scotia actually received an office of mental health and addictions so it takes time for them to staff up it takes time for them to develop policies um, to look at uh, programs and, and, and ways to support people but that being said um, you know in March 2023 I put forward a motion supported by council to develop the memorandum with the province to get this bilateral bilateral and multilateral agreement looking at ways that we could support homelessness and so I'm, I'm looking for uh, an update on that it's not in here but my understanding is we've got a bunch of different operational and administrative agreements with the province when it comes to those kinds of supports, whether it's the modulars, the tiny homes, the pallet shelters, um, you know, looking at ways to, to ensure that the wraparound services are available for individuals who access housing and, and, and get into uh, transitional housing and supportive housing. Um, so that's great. And as for the senior safety program, well, that was something I put forward in 2021. Uh, it's 2024. So, and the reason I did that was because of the inequity. HRP was working with BN, VON, RCMP, and other areas of the province were working with service providers, but rural HRM, RCMP, didn't have a service provider to work with for the for the senior safety program. So I'm, you know, I, I'd like to know, uh, Bill, when we're gonna see that report um, because there's definitely some inequity, which I think is what I'm hearing from you as well when it comes to access to services and support for seniors in rural uh, HRM. Another question for you is the crossing guard. So um, what I heard is, uh, it, it, you know, we're, we're looking at the crossing guards and trying to get ahead of the issue. Well, actually, no. We're looking at adding crossing guards because we need to fill the gap. Uh, West Bedford opened without crossing guards. It has been pandemonium. Uh, and just lately, with the removal of access to the, what do you call it, the kissing loop, uh, parents and people are losing their minds because it's so dangerous to send the kids in. There's no crossing guards there. So I just wanna make sure that when you say crossing guards, um, that that includes West Bedford. And I think that was acknowledged in the report here that that was a gap that needs to be filled. Uh, oh gee, a minute and a half. Um, and so what I'm gonna do then, uh, colleagues, is I'm going, and I do wanna say thank you, of course, uh, we're gonna be talking more about wildfire and wildfire response and community resiliency and how we um, develop a stronger emergency uh, plan for communities, evacuation planning, and so on and so forth. Um, and so with that in mind, I do want to, on behalf of, I'm very pleased to do this, on behalf of the Women's Advisory Committee for HRM, which I am a member of with Councillor uh, Becky Kent, uh, that I wanna put on the motion, alternative number one, uh, I move that budget committee uh, add uh, alternative one to the BAL, 
um, to include an increase of $250,000 for programs and partnerships, enhanced safe city program, as outlined in the briefing note BN004 with the proposed 2024-25 community safety proposed budget to the budget adjustment list as an expense over budget option for consideration. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddart. Unanimously so, seconded, I think. <laughs> sorry? Said, unanimously seconded. Yes, unanimously thank seconded. You. So, you know, we, we all know that there's been a lot of work um, to initiate over the past couple of years to really build and integrate uh, the work of, of the Safe City and Public Safe Public Spaces program. Um, you know, we, we look at um, kind of the preventative measures uh, that are needed when it comes to uh, ensuring that all women are safe in our public spaces and that, um, you know, we clearly uh, look at ways in our responsibility to ensure that we do our due diligence, that we ensure that we recognize our jurisdiction, but also at the end of the day, uh, women need to feel safe. And with the numbers uh, that came from COVID, there was an increase, 18% increase across the country with regards to sexual assaults. That's staggering. And here in Nova Scotia, it's ridiculously high. And we know in particular that young women uh, and, um, and LGBTQ and, and trans people are at a completely different rate. And then we think about the numbers of um, women with disabilities something like 94 incidents of sexual assault for every 1,000 of incidents, and those are reported. So we know that we've got a lot of work that's needed to, 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 to take place. So I'm, I just, my question with regards to that $250,000 is I think it's, it's a great, um, it's a great investment and it's a little bit of a, you know, a push forward, but what is this gonna look like in the future? Because I'm not sure that 250,000 is, is gonna be enough. And uh, you know, I was the counselor that put forward the idea to remove victim services from HRP in particular because criminalized women were saying, we don't want to deal with police. So this is really important for us. And also knowing that human trafficking is at a very high rate all across HRM in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Bill, for your work. <coughs> Deputy Mayor, through to the Councillor. Um, in relation to the, the province, so it was actually uh, as early earlier today, I was in conversation by email with the province on all of our agreements in relation to mapping out, and we're actually going through an exercise um, to determine what we're providing in relation to agreements across all of our, okay. uh, so um, there, I, I can provide some background, I have it downstairs as to the, um, whether they've been executed, whether the amendments have been approved and we're back and forth. And those, our plan is now, with the hope is to roll those into an MOU, an overarching MOU. Okay. And, uh, and I think, um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the, the work to date, uh, I'm seeing very positive um, although maybe maybe slow by some, but being positive directional change in our collaboration on those. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so I, I can say that that's going, and that that would include about um, things like wraparound services and who's providing those and who is helping with coordinated access. So there was a, a there was I, I would describe it as a, a a number of pieces, some more mature than others, but they're starting to coalesce into a bit of a, a, a program where we're identifying, quite frankly, where the strengths are, but also identifying where the gaps are and trying to close those gaps. Excellent. Um, the senior safety report, um, I have the draft downstairs that I'll be turning around. As I mentioned, we, we um, with the uh, kind of the approval of, uh, of Dr. Siliano in relation to him being able to put that into a work plan for next year, we will have some, some funds to be able to, to work through that, so uh, the, the report on the senior safety will be coming back to you very soon to outline that there's a deliverable in our business plan. We're gonna start some of that work this year in partnership with community groups and with the province. And I fully expect, pending on where that comes back to, there'll be a supplementary report with a recommendation on, on whether, for instance, whether or not HRM should step into that role uh, in, a, in a larger coordination role or another service provider. That's really what we wanna do the work to be able to say that we're not, because one of the do things, I'm looking at council, one of the things that I've been told by this, the, the short amount of time that I've talked to somebody is that there are some duplications in the systems okay. and there's some glaring gaps. Okay. So we wanna make sure that we're not adding to the duplications okay. and that if there is a gap that we can help fix, we'll try to plug Perfect. in the, the gap. Um, 
on the crossing guards issue, I, I am aware. So the operationally, oh, sorry, financially, uh, the crossing guards will be coming over in the budget once approved. Operationally, um, I've already started the conversation with um, uh, HRP on some of those operational issues, including getting a stronger connection with uh, HRCE in relation to mm -hmm. where things are coming, and also looking at, um, I'll call it from the pub, I call it the public works side of the house in relation to are there other pieces that we need to have in place because it's traffic flow, crosswalks, crossing guards, yeah. all those things need to come together, including the coordination with the school and in right. and, and going. So um, we will be as part of that bringing on a manager for that program and HRP has agreed to uh, work in partnership with us for the rest of this year. And then once, as you realize at the end of the year, the crossing guards are off for the summer, mm -hmm. help us ramp back up in September. But putting more structure and then the other piece is that once we have that individual on, okay. um, my plan is to hopefully review the, um, uh, the guidelines that are being used for the placements. I, I, I don't know when they were last reviewed to for you know to, to look at those so right. there will be a bit of a work plan coming around those once we actually take operational control um, over so okay um, that makes sense and the women advisory committee um, you know I, at this point I believe it would be looking more around um, a partnership with the Y to, to look at some mm -hmm. of that work mm -hmm. but I think Part of that again is exploring that space be coming back so we may end up with with one but then saying, no, we, we need to do a little bit more here, a little bit more here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think that's really about understanding that space more, understanding what the needs, true needs are, and then building out that program. So, um, could I draw you a picture of what it looks like a year from now? No, yeah. but I can say that we're, we'll, they'll, be, they'll be looking at the issue. Right, we need to get started. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Councillor Smith on the amended motion. Thank you, Deputy. Really quickly, so support this. Uh, I wonder if I can just get some clarification. So on the, um, in the report on the overs, it says on this item, this investment addresses public safety strategy, action 1.2, enhanced safe city program, and then alternative woman-centered reporting service for survivors of gender-based violence and sexual violence. So can you just help me clarify that aspect of, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's part of the Safe Cities program or or you're saying that this program is an alternative to that. So this, I just need a clarity, clarity on that piece. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor, through the Councilor. So if I understand your question, so the Safe Cities program is an existing program right, right within the public safety yes. strategy. Uh, and which is a, um, which is geared towards women and gender diverse folks safety issues. Right. This would be, in addition, they would flex out into a, a broader space, if you will, in relation to some of the gender-based violence pieces to, to look to address some of the Mass Casualty Commission's recommendations for, for looking at. So um, because we do have, because of the women's safety focus of the Mass Casualty, you know, and we have a safe cities that is, is geared to, we're, we're moving that as an expanding, potentially expanded scope of work for that area. Okay, that's where, because yep. in the public safety strategy, it doesn't speak about that no, aspect No, no, so, so that was, when, when we brought the public safety, when Dr. Sistano brought the public safety strategy to council, and I brought the policing transformation, um, and you would know from being in your time on the police commission, we had not had the mass, the mass casualty right. commission stuff was not out, uh, and so what we're doing now is we're taking these reports and re-looking at what we have said and said, so really what I've asked staff to do is look and say, are we able to build out some of the existing programs or could we add on to an existing program now to help to try to address some of the recommendations? Gotcha. And this is an example where they looked at it and said, you know what, we probably could with a little help maybe with them from the Y and some dollars, look at what we can do in that space and that's why it's there like that. So will your update, which I haven't had a chance to look at because it was just on the website, will your update speak on the expanded scope of other initiatives like this one as well? That's a very good question. I actually haven't had that conversation uh, on whether we report those through, I've certainly it'll be reported through the business plan because that's where it would land, but whether it's reported as part of the public safety strategy, I'll take that away and we'll, I'll, I'll get you an answer on that. But one way or the other, we'll, we'll be reporting back on progress. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Thank you, I see no further speakers on the list. Katie, do we take this to a vote? Oh, Councillor Hensby. 
Just a quick question. Could, could you send me a note in regards to the funding for GEM and the GSARS? I, I still try to find the, in the documents. It seems embedded in there somewhere, and, and this is not, it's not obvious to me to find where it is. So if you could send me a note on that. Thank you. So, Madam Clerk, I think we vote on the amendment now. Thank you. Motion is carried, thank you. All right, then we go back to the main motion as amended first. Should I try to put Councillor oh. Morse. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Smith, did I miss you there? Okay. So I was on, then I wasn't on. Uh, so no, no worries, no worries, Chair, and sorry, Councillor Morse, I, I know you're excited. Uh, really, really quickly, because the question that I had was actually, we just dealt with it, and you clarified it just now related to the safe cities, because again, I was excited to see that the women's centered reporting aspect was there, but I just couldn't line it up. So now that that's been clear, I that's, that question has been answered. So um, really, uh, the the one the one question related to budget is I'm trying to still understand the how much has been transferred from in terms of money, how much has been transferred from other business units. So you know we have the nine million that we approved. And then we are at 13 million now. So I don't know if it's just a, a plus minus equation or if there's a number that's that's there that um, uh, highlights how much has actually been transferred in from other business units to public safety. So I was anticipating this question, so I'll just have to go to another spreadsheet just to make sure I get the right number for you. So the the, from what I have, the total amount that was transferred in existing was ten million three hundred thirty-five thousand three hundred. And then the total increases above that was two million eight hundred and twenty-three thousand one hundred. Right. So the two million is increases. Unrelated to internal transfers. Correct. Got you. I'm just gonna. Okay. Um, all right. So that was really the, the two big, the biggest budget questions I had. Uh, I'll wait for the other items in terms of overt. So I'll just take this moment while I, while I have a minute to say thank you to the team and the ever growing, which is very impressive and, and exciting to see how how much growth is happening with the team. And I, the other night, I. Uh, attended the community mobilization a debut movie night for the, the short film about the CMTs. And um, uh, my suggestion was that for, for counselors, we do like a lunch and learn during a council day. And, and uh, we have whoever from the CMT come and speak to us during lunch and show the video, um, which was which really nice to see. And, and I'll just, for folks who weren't here when CMT started, just kind of let you know that the model of CMT actually came from the gym model like that was happening in the rural areas because you know we felt that that what was happening with the rural areas and the gem teams was actually a great model that we could use the only thing we wanted to change it in terms of community mobilization was the fact that we had communities who were dealing with tr tragic events outside of like natural disasters so that's why it was changed to community mobilization team but at the end of the day it's really the gem model uh, that's a good model for those communities that we started in. So, so just you know, shout out to the rural communities who kind of started the community mobilization team in a way, um, alongside the work of the folks within the CMT um, team. So, with that, thank you, everyone, and, and I will speak more when we get to the items on the over list. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Now, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And we're back on the main motion now, right? We are. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, thanks, Bill, and thanks to your team. You're, you're taking on some of the biggest challenges we have in the municipality, and uh, it's great to see the progress that's been made in a, a relatively short time. Um, I, I am concerned, like uh, my, some of my colleagues, about uh, 
a lot of the work you're doing is, is coordinating work, and so sometimes there are overlaps and sometimes there are gaps. Could you just say a little bit more about what the mobile outreach would do, and, and uh, does it overlap with um, the, the health department's uh, mobile crisis unit that is already addressing some of these uh, mental health challenges? Um, also, could you say a little bit uh, about why we need a youth uh, violence prevention strategic plan? I was uh, invited to a community meeting a, a number of weeks ago, and I was told there, there are an estimated 600 youth in our community who are involved in gangs in one form or another, which was a, a surprise to me. So I, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, oh, and... Uh, how will new crossing guards be allocated? Thank you. Deputy Mayor, through to the council. I'll, I'll t take the two second questions and turn it over to Amy for the first one. So the, 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 the youth violence strategic plan really came about on a realization from the youth services review that we have a we have a great deal and we have a very very good program for youth in relation to recreation but there is a there's a small subset of youth that are extremely at risk um, that are not being well dealt with and, and, and I think the best example is when we were experiencing the issues around at Alderney Gate in transit what we found was we, we had programming, we had some things around, but we didn't really have a, 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 a means of being able to action what we were going to do with that s smaller subset. So uh, by taking that, we, we brought um, uh, actually um, a staff person uh, on board to look at that and start to build out how are we going to serve that small use. So we are doing work right now with, um, with Posse a uh, community-based group um, that's doing some very, very good work in that space, but it's it's stability. It's 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 around. You know, this is more than than you know, I'm not going to be very simplistic. There's a couple of kids getting into a fist fight in school. This these are these are uh, kids that are young people that that need some supports, and moving them from one place to another is not solving the problem. Um, so that's the the rationale behind that. Um, in the crossing guard program, there is a, there, um, in my previous life, I did know it because I used to refer to it all the time, but there's a, a count and all those types of things that come together to, to make a determination whether a guard, a crossing guard is, is, is appropriately used. And that's what I was referring to earlier is that I'm not sure when that was last reviewed. So that would be one of the pieces that I would be looking at because I, I remember from my previous life when I was actually the superintendent in, in police responsible for crossing guards and all those things. It was, it was a battle royale every time we, we, we said you couldn't have one. Or if we said, you know, things have changed, we're going to take the crosswalk guard away from that. Well, that doesn't go over well. So I, I, I think we just need to revisit those to make sure that they are still applicable, they're still working, and, um, and they're clear and understandable because I, I go to the you know, basis of procedural justice. People may not always like your decision, but if you can articulate the rationale and the process you use to get to it, um, it, it, you know, it, it becomes at least understandable. And I'll turn over the first question on the crisis team to All right, Amy. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morris, for the question. So um, just a bit of background on the mobile outreach team. So when we were developing um, the business case for the stabilization center, what used to be called the sobering center, mm -hmm. we did a lot of outreach with community engagement with stakeholders on, on that model. And one of the gaps that was identified was um, a lack of ability for um, service providers to get people to where they needed to be. So identify, they may, they may have a need, but they may not be able to get them there. And so there's kind of an informal transportation um, service navigation happening. And so as a result of that, probing deeper, we also realized that uh, looking at uh, the stabilization center, there would be an opportunity in the future, once we got the stabilization center up, to um, actually uh, prevent police from being involved in the first place where it's appropriate to do so because if there's a call that comes in with somebody who may be intoxicated in public 
um, a, an alternative service to police could potentially take them to the service, uh, sorry, to the stabilization center. You don't necessarily at all times have to have police involvement. So it's a way for us to um, kind of reduce the pressures on policing. We know that they're dealing with a lot of uh, non-criminal calls. So that's how uh, it ended up in the public safety strategy. What, uh, what we're asking for uh, with additional funds is to be able to augment that service to, because we know as well that many service providers are informally providing non-emergency crisis services off the side of their desk. And so, and doing that alongside transportation and, and the core services that they're providing. And so with the mobile outreach uh, transportation service additional budget that we're asking for, we, we could add, um, you know, it would be really up to the service provider, but a, a clinician type person that could deal with non-emergency but crisis response in a more appropriate way by having somebody who's trained to deal with uh, those non-emergency crises uh, alongside the um, outreach and transportation services that they would do. Models that we've um, looked at for Inspiration Toronto has been talked about. Toronto is very much the model, the new models, the new services that they're developing are um, really uh, mental health crisis response services, but there's, a, I would say, a spectrum of uh, needs. Um, t uh, Calgary, for instance, has, uh, used to be called the DOPE team, the Downtown Outreach Addiction Partnership team. It's now called the HELP team. Um, and they, uh, <laughs> they, um, they partner with transit, they partner with police, they partner with um, uh, uh, the homelessness team at the city of Calgary, and they're, they're a, an independent service provider, and they do outreach and transportation services. So there, there's an encampment team that's dedicated to going to encampments. There's a team that's, that transit can call when there's uh, issues related to, um, I'd say, problematic behavior in, in, in transit that this team would then and go and respond to. So this service, as you know, today does not exist in Halifax. We do have outreach services, but they're not of the type with, that we are proposing to develop um, uh, w w with this uh, mobile outreach and transportation service. Great, thanks for those examples. Uh, it, you're, you're painting a different picture and I'm understanding it uh, better. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. We were set to go to four o'clock. So our valued staff, um, if we have by consensus continue to 4.30, can you stay to our staff? Thank you. Colleagues, would you like to go to 4.30? A motion by Councillor Otit, second by Councillor Stoddard. <laughs> all those in favor, show of hands, uh, Madam Clerk, is that all right? So we'll continue to 4.30. Thank you very much and thank you to our staff for continuing to stay. Next on our list is uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And, uh, um, you know, I, I know we, we keep uh, hearing about the Toronto example, but uh, I just, I think we do have to caution ourselves that uh, it, it's not a, a pure apples to apples comparison because, uh, you know, the municipality of Toronto, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, they have the responsibility for uh, public health. Uh, you know their their mandates are are much more robust than ours, so it's it's not a, a pure apples to apples comparison. Um, uh, that was sort of beside what I wanted to uh, to speak on, or just what I, the question that I wanted to ask. And uh, as, you know, having served on the uh, the board of police commission for as long as I have now, uh, one of the biggest pieces of work that I was involved in uh, was the uh, the defund the police report. Um, and I know, horrible name, we all hate it, but that's what it's called. Um, and it, it, it's funny because I haven't heard that phrase used once here today, but this is what that looks like. This is what, what the work that we're doing here, the work that you guys are doing, this is what detasking the police looks like. And uh, I know that um, uh, Councillor Mason has got a motion coming forward, uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, the defund the police, the police report came with, uh, you know, a few pages of recommendations. Just wondering how much of the budget that we are seeing here today, uh, or how much of the, you know, how many of those recommendations that were made in the report are we being seen reflected in this budget here today? Because, uh, you know, to, to my mind, this is, 
you know, this is the work of detasking the police in real time. Thank you. There we go. I don't have a, a, an actual number, but, but we've gone through an exercise, and I believe this might have been shared, where we, we went through the reimagining public safety report uh, from, that went to council. We re reviewed the defunding report. We reviewed um, the mass casualty report and started to align those. So you, you, I, I don't have a number, but what we tried to do is, is look across those various reports um, and, and the policing transformation that, that basically created the space for community safety function and look to say, okay, what can we look in there? Um, I think there, you know, I said, I can't give you an exact number, but the big ones obviously are around potential mental health and, and some of the alternative responses there. Things that have not been looked at, quite frankly, are for instance, um, uh, traffic control, civilianized traffic control, um, and some of those other pieces that were mentioned, I don't know if they were mentioned in defunding, but they were certainly mentioned in reimagining public safety. Right. Um, so some of those are still there. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the public, for Amy in the public safety report, but there was, there was a subset taken of those to say, look, this is what we think we can work on now. We can't, we can't, we can't do them all, but we can no. take these first ones. And, and we uh, can't do them all by ourselves. Too. No, There's that's a correct. lot of those recommendations yeah. that required, you know, a combination yeah. of municipal, provincial, and in yeah. some cases federal. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so that's that's really the over the last year has been is is really been trying to get our heads collectively around which ones are going in the same direction, which ones we already have. So if, for instance, going to Councillor Smith's question around where where could we bolt some of this work on the things that were already existing? Where is it is net new work? Where is it that we will we can do some small pieces at this point, but that's really not our bailiwick and we turn it over mm -hmm. to another level of government. So there is, uh, in, internally, we kind of have a bit of a, 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 a Josh and I call it the buckets. So where we have pieces of work that are falling into these various buckets. Yeah. And I suspect as we continue to move ahead, we may take on more of those um, you know, subject to, to direction from council. So, but to really go to your answer, we're, we're trying to deal with as many as we can in, in a fiscally responsible manner. And, and yeah. quite frankly, understanding the capacity if we want to do things that we, we can't take it all on at one time. No, and I guess, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is just make sure that publicly we recognize that, uh, you know, these reports are not sitting on a shelf collecting dust, that they're very active uh, pieces of your day-to-day -day work. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is what defunding, detasking the police looks like. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor uh, Blackburn. Councillor Austin, the past deputy mayor, is going to take the chair so that I could ask a question. Everyone that was on the list first is there, so I just have two quick questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Past Deputy Mayor. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the report. I just have two quick questions. Um, one, actually, Councillor Morse asked, and I'm not sure that I heard the answer, but it was just around the crossing guards. COVID has changed so much around uh, what's happened at our schools. HRCE has made a decision that uh, parents can't do drop off on school property. So it's down, it's sort of moved out onto the street, and there's been a lot of problems with that. And so we're wondering about, I think the last time, when I was doing a little bit of research, I found criteria that came from 2007 about how we decide what schools get um, uh, crossing guards. So I'm just wondering where the, the change that has happened, how that affects where we will assign crossing guards and how that could happen. Uh, so. In there, there more than even in, in District 1, but I know that in a couple of districts, the suburban rural area, where you've got an elementary school and a junior high that are in close proximity or otherwise, uh, there's been a lot, a lot of safety issues there around uh, keeping our kids safe, getting in and out of the school system. So um, how we're gonna look at that would be important. And then the second quick question is, 
So right now on the budget adjustment list for the just food, we've got $522,000. So do I understand correctly that that will be reduced by $250,000, oh, down to $250,000, but, and that's if this budget is approved as it is. Okay, that's what I needed clarity on, thank you. That's all I need. I'm good. Um, past deputy mayor through to the deputy <laughs> mayor and council. Um, so the, so you're, you're, you're correct. I don't know what year it is, but, and I believe that the present, the present guiding document for crosswalks is one that was approved by the police commission. Yes. Is my understanding. Okay. Um, I, and that's my, and I don't know when it was last reviewed. So that's one of, I mean, crossing, crossing guards. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Crossing guards. Um, so that would be one of the pieces of work that I would like to have reviewed to, for, for that. And then as I mentioned before um, in my conversations with uh, Sergeant Palmer is he has a connection with HRC, but I also wanna make the connection with Public Works because uh, if, that's, if there's an arbitrary decision made by the school to not allow cars, then we have an issue on the street, which is the right of way, which becomes a traffic management issue. Yeah. So I think it's the intersection of those three pieces coming together as to how we deal with this because um, my sense is just adding a guard to a bunch of cars on the street is not going to solve the issue. Um, and so um, that's where I'm hoping to go. So the, the short answer is there is a document now. I want to make sure that we that it's been updated and then bring those other two aspects into it because, I mean, there are other things that can be done to um, mitigate traffic issues around areas. We do them all over the city now. So we're just bringing some additional thinking to that. And the other answer that I didn't have a microphone on was, you'll be receiving a new BAL um, um, briefing note in relation to that, reducing the BAL from 522 down to 250. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deputy. We'll go to Councillor Mason. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council. So uh, this may not work, but I think it will. I'm gonna try and uh, expedite things a little bit by putting an omnibus motion on. I will say about the crossing guard piece, I feel like past council, and this is ancient history, past council uh, put crossing guards into police so that they didn't have to field the calls from parents asking why they couldn't get more crossing guards, which is why for years I've been saying, let's bring it back to council so we are the people who decide if there's enough money to have crossing guards and we should be responsible to take those calls. Uh, uh, cross guards, not crosswalks. Yeah, it has to be a crosswalk there. So let's try the omnibus motion. I move that the budget committee include one, an increase of $70,900 for programs and partnerships, one FTE, create community crisis response model for the municipality, two, an increase of $70,900 for programs and partnerships, one full-time equivalent mobile outreach and transportation services, three, an increase of $325,000 for the program and partnerships, mobile outreach and transportation service, four, an increase of $60,000 for housing and homelessness diversion plan, and five, an increase of $50,100 for community standards and compliance for five additional crossing guards as outlined in the briefing note BN004 with the proposed 2024-25 community safety proposed budget to the budget adjustment list as an expense over budget options for consideration, I so move. Second. So if Se anybody. Seconded by Councillor Blackburn? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Hard to keep track. Uh, so I won't speak extensively on this. I think we've talked it all to death. If anyone has any issue with any of those, they can call for the motion to be separated when we get there and we can vote on them separately. But I just thought in the interest of time and uh, getting out of here, uh, you know, not having to make all these fine, hardworking people we admire so much come back for 20 minutes on Friday, that it might be better to just go for that. So I'd ask for your support on the motion. Thank you. And I see a blank board. Call for the question. All those in favor. <laughs> yes.
Motion is carried. So we're back on the main motion. Councillor Mancini. Too late. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I want to tag on to what Councillor Morris was talking about with uh, Dr. Siciano. I, I'm looking for an update on the sobering center, where we are, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving that to us. And also, um, was there not the, the desire from the province to do the drop-in center uh, for during the day? So I wonder if I get uh, updates of both of those. Thank you for the question, Councillor Mancini. So, um, so where we are with the sobering centre? So we have since um, since we were last before council uh, secured funding at a 50% cost share with the province uh, for that project. We have identified a service provider to operate the sobering cent stabilization centre, as well as a service provider to provide uh, limited part-time uh, primary health care. Um, we have uh, we have a, a site identified, well, we do. Yes. Um, and we are very hopeful that we could sign an agreement uh, in the next week. But uh, that's uh, that's out, uh, we're waiting to hear back right now. From them so once we, uh, I'm glad to hear that because I'm slow go to get here. So I'm really happy to hear that. Once we're up and operating, what happens to the existing facility that's uh, at HQ right now at HRP? And how do we distinguish between to go, what goes to one, one location versus the other? Um, so uh, the, the stabilization center um, case, uh, sorry, the, the, the business model is a voluntary um, option, so it would provide an alternative to the prisoner care facility for some individuals. We are targeting folks who tend to um, uh, go to the prisoner care facility um, more than once, so they've, they, um, they may be experiencing homelessness or have challenges with mental health and addiction. That's the population we're targeting because we know that they um, end up in the prisoner care facility more often and uh, they could be better served in a different facility with a different service provider. So, so the, the, yep. as to my understanding that the police do not use the, um, what was uh, colloquially called the, the drunk tank yep. anymore, so. And just so I know that you're gonna answer my question about drop-in center max, is there an opportunity to blend the two, uh, 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 I don't know how big this new facility is, can that also be utilized as a drop-in center too? So Max, I'll let you jump in and answer before the Deputy Mayor cuts me off. Very quickly. I, I am sure the Deputy Mayor would, would be more gentle than that sounds. <laughs> Uh, so Deputy Mayor, through you to the Councillor, uh, the funding for the drop-in centre was a, a partnership between the municipality and the province. Okay. Both groups have uh, committed to continue to bring that forward next year, so it's in our budget and the province has committed their 750. Uh, the problem last year was finding a location. Uh, we are working with the service provider and uh, are looking at, a, at an alternative way to get a location. Uh, so there's still negotiations going on there that, that really uh, 
uh, aren't really something I can share right now, but we're conf they're confident that a space will become available in the coming months that, that we can use for that. Uh, challenging to do both together. Um, a, because of the space that we've found so far. Um, I think we'll provide lots of space for the sobering center, but not enough space for both. Okay. And there are some very differences. So could we be in, could we share a larger property potentially, but that's not what we're, what they found so far for that. And so we're looking with the service provider at an alternative option. But at the end of the day, the issue for the drop-in center is not fiscal or resources, it is finding the, the place. And so the service provider is working with the, us on that with a potentially new idea for how to do that. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Deputy. Uh, so I want to circle back to encampments. I'd already asked about um, the services and the compliance, and I have a motion I'm going to make on that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what Councillor Mancini was driving at. Um, do we have a plan in the public safety? And I'm guessing it's, you know, this is such a difficult issue. I'm guessing we, we probably don't um, for the summer coming, where if we suddenly have three, four hundred people living in our public spaces again and no place for anybody to go, what are we going to do? Because this is the place, this is the department where that budget would live, right? So we, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, through to the Councillor, so we are actively working um, internally and with the province. Um, there is a RFP that will be going out to market to look at a variety of of options to house uh, up to 200 individuals. Um, and we are in discussions, um, uh, once the RFP is out, those discussions are in partnership with the province as to what those coming are coming back to. So there is, there are, we are actively looking at alternatives for those. In addition, we are still in discussions around additional pallets uh, and locations of those pallets to come online. Um, the original, uh, allocation to HRM from the province, as you would know, was for 100. There was 19 of them in Sackville. So the balance of 89, 81, sorry, uh, 81 are still uh, outstanding. We are in discussions uh, around potential locations um, that are coming, and I understand we should be having some more information on, on where those may be ending up very shortly. Um, so between those two pieces and then the other part, would be the continuing, uh, the other part would be coming online is uh, the tiny home community. So tiny home community will be uh, 42 residences um, with the ability to take 62, 52. Uh, 52 residents that can take 62 people. 52 residents that can, because uh, 10 of those are uh, for um, couples. Okay. So those are those are the pieces that are, are presently in flight. So. Um, if we total, and then the additional pieces would be the, I'll call the, the, the knock-on effect as these new um, uh, facilities come online, that will potentially allow some vacating of other existing spaces to allow for, for a flux in there. So, so if you do the, the math, I mean, potentially 200 in one, 62 in another, uh, additional 89, um, so that, that's where the plan is right now, and that's uh, all being um, at this point in discussion with funding to be to be funded by the province. Uh, Mr. Treves has um, comments to add. Uh, just, um, Madam Chair, through you to the committee, remind the committee that the uh, that council's revised encampment approach is in the declassified report from December 21st, which is now publicly available and does set out an answer to a lot of a lot of those questions in terms of, of um, in particular the approach for any remaining encampments, recognizing that the goal is to find suitable housing for people. So there is there is additional detail there. So do we have do we basically have a have a spreadsheet saying here's the spaces that we expect to come online 
and here's a forecast for the number of people that are gonna be outside and do the th two things yeah, equal, because I don't think they do. I personally, I, th I think my parks are gonna, I think the parks in the municipality are gonna be a wash in people again this summer, um, because I don't think there's gonna be enough space, because what we've seen so far, including our own projects, is nothing has ever been delivered on the timeline that's been promised to it, whether it's pallets, whether it's our modulars, it's, it's complicated to do, and they just don't arrive on time. And, you know, I'm struggling with the, how are we gonna do with this, and what's the budget implication because last summer um, things like power at sites right we didn't have a plan for that and now we're kind of we're coming into this next summer and I hear that we have some money but I don't sense that there's any kind of real decision on we're gonna have a bunch of large encampments and how are we gonna manage them? What's it mean for resources? And we need to be thinking about that now. Otherwise, we're just repeating the insanity of doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. Um, so do we have some of that kind of like, here's our list, of, here's our spaces, and here's our forecast for the people that are gonna be outside and do the two things gel? I know these are hard questions, it's an impossible issue and it's, it's more of an issue down the hill than here, but we're left holding the bag so many times. So Deputy Mayor, through to the Council. I would say that we have had conversations with, do we have a spreadsheet right now? I don't think there's a, I can't say, I can't put my finger on a spreadsheet right now that says that, but I know that in the discussions that, that we have and discussions we've been having are the, that potential, that discussion around what is happening today and also what is happening in the near future, but it is live and well in relation to the additional pieces that are coming down the, the, the pipe. I mean, you know, one of the issues is, is, is if, if, our, if our numbers exceed what we have in, right now, we're gonna need other options. So we're exploring those options right now. That's where we are. And, um, you know, I'd, li I'd like to be able to say that I had the crystal ball to be able to say what that is, but, you know, our budget right now for, for um, homelessness is in the two, $2 million range, is that about, I'm looking. And, and a lot of that, quite frankly, depends on our other levels of government and what they're preparing to fund. So we have been given, we have been offered and, and had discussions around funding opportunities to do a variety of things. Um, some of those I would qualify, or qualify them as being kind of outside what our present mandate to be and we've not, we've held the line in those, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't reallocate some of those additional fundings. Councillor Austin, I, I know that you're out of time and you did have a motion. So would you like to come back? Or we could, you, ask, Chair. we could ask uh, Councillor Mancini and Hensby if they would indulge you to be able to put your motion on. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll move then, I move that budget, budget committee requests a briefing note on the cost one of providing running water, daily garbage collection and power at all designated encampment sites and two, staffing for compliance officers to manage numerous large designated and undesignated encampment sites given the potential reality that we could easily have hundreds of people living rough in HRM this year. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. You get to go again for a few minutes there. Uh, I, I think I've, I've largely made my point at this uh, stage. I mean, all I'm going to say is like, I do, I'm sorry for like, if it's hard questions. I mean, it's the challenge that we are in right now. Um, and frankly, I, I just don't have confidence that it's gonna materialize in the way that we hope because experience over the last couple of years is it never seems to. And I think we're going to be into another, another summer of trying to manage an impossible issue. And you know, frankly, I kind of wonder what the point of closing some of the encampments that we just did is. Grand Parade I get because it's a public space, but the rest of them, we're, they're gonna be full of people again next year unless we just leave fences up, so. I don't know what we're doing. I think we need to put some more resources into this, even though we all agree that it's encampments are not the solution. Getting people into options and housing is, but I think we have to be a little bit more grim-eyed realist about this than maybe hoping it's all gonna work out. Thank you. Councillor Rothead. Uh, thank you, and, and certainly I wanna start by saying I share a number of Sam's concerns. Um, the first part of the motion makes sense to me about the uh, water and electricity. The second part, I guess, this, and Sam and I have talked about this many times, goes almost goes back to the smoking bylaw where we bought receptacles, hired people, and know there was no chance in hell of enforcing the bylaw. Uh, and we were proven right. So 
to hire people to tell them that they can't camp there when there's nowhere else for them to go, when council and the courts have said we can't move them if there isn't anywhere else to go, doesn't seem very productive to me because I think Sam is right. We're gonna see a thousand people and they're not gonna to wanna to go inside, some of them because of rules and regulations and frankly, some of those sites will disappear. The temporary sites for winter will, will disappear and I hope you're right, Bill, that some of the, the modulars and the uh, pallets and whatnot, but we're, we're not gonna have 800 to 1,000 modulars and, and pallets and whatnot for people. So we are gonna have people back in the parks, as, as Sam has said. But I just don't understand, you know, we, we've said we wanted to be compassionate. We as a council have set a policy that we want to be compassionate. The courts have said you can't move them if there's nowhere suitable for them to go. So I, I just don't know if I see the point in hiring bylaw. I mean, what do, what do bylaw officers do when they go there and say, well, you can't be here, well, I'm not going because there's nowhere to go, and then they leave. So <laughs> what's the benefit? So maybe I'm missing something. I look, by the look on Max's face, maybe I am missing something, but I mean, and, I, it, and that's fine, but I just, I, I just, and it does, it just doesn't seem, you know, I would rather spend the money on finding somewhere for people to go than hiring somebody to tell them they can't go and, but not be able to force them to go. I think they should go. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Deputy Mayor, uh, perhaps uh, the municipal solicitor might want to comment on the, the legal piece of people can and can't go. Um, I, th I think we are going to have people, people who are looking and, and don't want to go. One of the issues, and this is something to talk about through the RFP, is we don't have the options that will serve everybody Absolutely. well in the way that they want. Absolutely. So um, for example, we need a harm reduction based yep. shelter. Uh, so no single option works for everybody. And because it doesn't work for some people doesn't mean it's bad. Right. People need different things. Um, and so that is one of the discussions that would come out if, if going forward with a, a facility or an option that would serve as a group of people, how do we create options that will yep. meet everybody's needs? Uh, so that's part of that process as we go forward. Can we find something? The other thing, um, again, I, I've cautioned council on this before, uh, the bigger challenge is not necessarily the resources, the bigger challenge is the capacity of the sector to do the work. Absolutely. And that would be my focus rather than compliance, but anyway, officers. Thank you, Councillor Ote. Well, thanks. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. You know, you, you look at this motion, uh, providing running water, daily garbage collection, power. You know we're gonna hear it from many residents. There's residents out here who are saying we're not doing enough, and there's residents saying, what do you mean? You're gonna now provide them with water and take care of garbage of every designated area. But I go back to my earlier question I made, uh, I asked Max about, we're talking three to 400 people this summer potentially, if not more, that's gonna be in our public spaces and our parks. So at least if we're going to, we need to take control. And for those of you that didn't visit Sackville or didn't visit Victoria Park, uh, you missed something because that was not pretty there. Uh, at least out here, we had a volunteer that, and uh, we could debate his value, uh, uh, the good and the bad, but there was some control here. And I had people visiting uh, other elected officials from other municipalities saying, well, that's the best uh, you know, homeless encampment I've seen in the country because there were some controls. So I think that's what Councillor Ross is talking about, some controls. Uh, I agree with Councillor Outhead. I'm not sure compliance officers is what we needed, but it, do we have people that could be there all the time to add that control? And so I don't know if that's a combination of compliance officers. I'm also concerned, you know, can we add to this? There's the volunteers and the unintended consequence of some of the volunteer groups. And Sackville's a perfect example. It, it became very messy there. And other areas too, where food is just being dropped by, encouraging and, and recruiting people to come to encampments and so on. 
That's what was taking place. So I don't know in this motion, Councillor Austin, is there a place for that piece, but we, we need to be able to manage volunteers. I think it, you know, if people want to help and they do want to help, can they go through an organization like Salvation Army or Red Cross so it's controlled, but having volunteers show up and all of a sudden take ownership of it, even though the intention is good for most, not all, for most, there's a negative impact to that, an unintended consequence that causes problems. So I support the motion, but those are my concerns, the compliance officers versus having control on the site and, and the volunteers. Remember, three to 400 people this summer in our public spaces. And that's why we're doing this to all those that are saying we shouldn't be uh, providing that support. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the councillor, I think the language you're looking for, and it may not be, but I think the language you're looking for is a managed encampment. Right. Just to be clear, what you choose to do with that, I leave with you, but right. I think for language, what you're, you're asking about is a managed encampment. By someone's employed by us, or, or province. Well, province, but not a volunteer group. Yeah, yes, yeah, a yeah, professionally yeah. managed encampment is, I think, what you're describing. Yeah. Just how you want, what you want to do with that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor uh, Mancini, Councillor Mason, and colleagues. It looks like we're just going to go a little bit beyond 4.30. Thanks. Gosh, um, this is tough. Uh, when uh, a bunch of business improvement district folks came up from uh, all over the United States and were meeting with mostly Tim Rosesco, but all of them, we had breakfast one morning, Sam was there, and one of the things that we heard from these people from Phoenix, Arizona, and Washington, D.C., and all across the U.S. is you have the cleanest, best organized encampments, all of them that we've seen, because they're all dealing with this on a scale like we've never seen, and we don't want to get there, but we also don't want people living in utter squalor while we're in the in-between. And you know what I'm hearing is there's kind of like the two extremes are what will become basically permanent managed encampments set up looking like a military camp, like you know, like something you've seen post Halifax explosion with rows and rows of tents and uh, sidewalks built ab above the mud out of wood and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the other extreme is we're going to try and treat this as a temporary thing while we rapidly roll out more shelters and more pallet houses and more tiny homes and hopefully the province really deeply invests in more affordable housing. And we do like other cities have done where you can only camp at night, you have to pack up during the day, you have to uh, have all your stuff out of the park by seven or eight in the morning like staff that asked us to do two years ago in some of the encampment sites. And maybe we have, we don't have any designated sites. We say uh, you can only have five tents per, per park, but you can't be near a playground and all that stuff, more like Hamilton. Where I'm starting to have trouble with this right now is I feel like we've gone way out of budget and we're way into a policy discussion. Yep. And I don't think we have the framework to have this discussion today or even as budget committee, uh, even though I agree with Sam and I agree with what I'm hearing and what staff have been saying is we have a crisis coming like a wave this summer that we need to deal with. But I feel like probably we shouldn't approve this now and that we should ask staff as yeah. council to come back with more stuff. Yeah, and if we have to make amendments to the budget or spend more money or go over and run a deficit, I don't care. I really don't, like at this point, that's fine. But I, I understand Sam's frustration. He's bearing the brunt of it right now because of Green Road and and I, we need to support him in that. But I, I just feel like like this right now, looking at that, there's so many implications that we haven't explored and gotten a staff report on. I, I, Sam, I can't support it at this time, even though I agree with you, we're gonna have to do more before we get to next summer. Mr. Traves, would you like to speak? Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, only only from the perspective of, of uh, saying like um, the individuals, look, there is no one size fits all. The individuals experiencing homelessness that are in encampments now are generally those who are unmanageable, frankly, that, that will not accept for one reason or another or are, on or are not able to be accepted into the current shelters. There are sufficient beds, there's, there is opportunities at the moment. 
down the road, there's absolutely no doubt, and that is part of Council's, um, you know, uh, recently adopted plan, which is essentially to disincentivize the use of encampments in favor of, of better options. And so you run the risk without a full policy discussion to, to Councillor Mason's point of, of achieving a goal which is opposite to that which you've sent out for yourself. And so part of what Max and the team are working on, you know, and all of those involved is looking at ways in which we can achieve the policy goals set out for us by council to disincentivize encampments in favor of longer term shelters, which we know are, are in short supply and how that can be fast tracked is a source of ongoing conversation as, as early as last week and this week and every day in fact with the province around you know, uh, quickly standing up longer term pieces. So I think to Councillor Mason's point, I would suggest that rather backing into this through a, a budget discussion, that you allow staff the opportunity to continue to flesh out the direction you set for us in December, on December 21st around disincentivizing, you know, standing that up. And it, and it may mean a number of different approaches. So just, just putting that out there for you. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. <clears throat> well, Madam Chair, I'm in the same opinion. That I think it's premature to ask for this motion at this time. Here we are cutting off power as of uh, March 1st tomorrow and stuff and, and the encampments and stuff. And now to make contingency plans to read state services of water and electricity sometime in the future, I think it's, it's defeating our purpose of trying to do what we need to do is get these folks into proper sh housing and shelter alternatives. Our public places are not supposed to be private campground sites. Simple as that. And uh, I think they're trying to cater to it. I think we have to say we had enough is enough. We got alternative availability now. We didn't have that in the past, but we do have that now. Hopefully there'll be more capacity in the future. Uh, so I, I'm not looking forward to, uh, to, to, to cater this motion any further. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so, I want to pause and just remind, like, I, you know, I get the, I get the, the point about it. You know, are you back ending into a policy discussion here that councillors Mason and Traves raised about um, the policy, like, you know, uh, versus budget? But I don't think that's where we are here. We're not by putting this on the ballot, asking for a briefing. We're not approving anything. We're saying. We should probably be thinking about this and building this into the budget. That's what we're doing. We're not saying, yes, these things are going to happen. We're saying, let's put it in the budget because this is important to do. And you know what I told people last year when they wrote me about Green Road, when the volunteer group there was coming to me saying, well, there's no power. How come you're providing power down at Grand Parade? If you're homeless in Halifax, is your life worth more than if you're homeless in Dartmouth? Why can't you provide power here? And I spoke to Max and company, and the cost of providing power at Green Road was judged as prohibitive. And so I dutifully went back to people and said, we'll have that discussion this year as part of budget, right? Whether or not we're going to provide the same level of services at different locations. Is that not a budget discussion? That is what we are talking about right now. Do we want to put in the budget money to do these things. We can have a policy discussion about it like uh, to come, but that is fundamentally a budget discussion to me. And like this idea that we're gonna have everything neat and tidy in a bow, in, summer's five months away, four months, five months away. We're not gonna have this solved. So like treat this as an emergency it is. We need to be planning for it now. We need to be putting money in it now. Even if we don't have the perfect policy decision worked out, we need to be dealing with this now. Not three months when we have some neat and tidy policy, not five months from now when we say, oops, all the space that we thought might exist is once again not here. And we have hundreds of people in our parks. So today I'm asking you for a briefing note. That is it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, Jerry, Jerry's got a comment. Just, just for um, budget committee here. So, I, 
I don't see the motion asking for this to come back to the bow, but is that? I do see that our CAO is here, and uh, so. Uh -oh. <laughs> Would you like no, to speak too? I am, I'm glad I arrived so I can hopefully contribute something helpful to this discussion. Um, just three points, really. One, from a fiscal policy perspective, um, it always makes me uncomfortable trying to budget for something without knowing precisely what we're budgeting for. The second point is that to date we've been successful meeting our um, needs to fund the homelessness strategy as it has changed and evolved by leveraging funding from the provincial government and matching it with ours when we can. And we do have mechanisms within year to work through reserves or to um, fund things through the operating budget, um, you know, uh, through our projected surplus or deficit throughout the year. So uh, I think there's, you know, the discussion about what do we need to plan for for next year, which is a really important topic, and then the matter of how we fund it is a second separate discussion, perhaps. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the CAO just answered a number of my questions because I, I was like, what are our options for funding this? So it sounded like you were looking to have this embedded in the budget for this year, but um, I'm wondering what other options we had, such as reserves, emergency money, matching funds, because I think that, to your point, we've somehow managed to do this to date. So. I, I agree, I'm gonna support your briefing note 100%. I think that we need to be prepared. Like, you know, we, we can't, can't be Groundhog Day again and again and again. It's better to, you know, as, like I said, a stitch in time saves nine. So let's, let's get out ahead of this as we can. So um, I, I, do, I think that's important information to have in the briefing note about how, how this can be funded, whether we need to actually budget it in the, you know, this year or if there's other options. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Stoddard. Just a quick question of confirmation. Are we talking about next year or this summer? Okay, as I heard next year. Okay, thank you very much. And Councillor Mason. Thanks, just so let's, I'd like to move an amendment that we add at the end then as an option over budget in the budget adjustment list bow for the budget committee to consider in the 24-25 budget. Just for clarity, right? Because that was a concern that Jerry raised. Friendly. Is that friendly? friendly All right, so then because, not just because I like you, I'll support it for a bow uh, briefing note. Thank you. Do you have more comments on that, Councillor Mason? No? Okay, so question? Question has been called, we'll vote. It looked like that motion carried. Um, I believe now we're on Councillor Hensby. No. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mancini. Uh, I'm sorry that we're here at extra time, but we, I need to ask these questions. So I, I want to go to just the food program, you know, and, and, and it's great that I heard uh, Bill from the $500 and, the, uh, and down to 250 but I think I heard you say earlier when Councillor Cuddle asked the question about you know, what's that ongoing support financially that's needed? Is that, I heard, I think I heard one million bucks, and then, and, you know, when this whole pro conversation started today, the first thing I wrote down is, what is within our mandate? When I look up, when I pulled up um, Letitia's presentation, um, you know, the, the Food Council, the food grants, we heard people speak about the African Nova Scotia, uh, the Indigenous group, I mean, you know, how much of this is really our mandate? And, and how much of that should be, re you know, what's the province doing on any of that? Are they doing anything at all on these areas? Uh, and so 
I think Councillor Outer talked about concern of duplication. Is there duplication here? Is there conversation with the province? And I'm also concerned the province saying, oh good, the municipality's taking that over. Hey, eventually we'll just give it all to them and let them do it. And so, and I'm very supportive and understanding of the food insecurity that takes, takes place. And I think, Leticia, you know that the efforts I've made personally in some of my communities, and I'm very supportive of that. I'm really concerned that, he, you know, we're, we're, there's a crisis, a food insecurity crisis I get, as there's a homeless crisis, but I'm really getting concerned that we're now in, we're really stepping over the line of a responsibility that's not ours. Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor. I, I would say there's sort of three pieces of this work. There's the advocacy piece, which is looking to the other levels of government for the system change that they need to do around incomes, living wages, uh, you know, some of the big changes that we've been advocating for. And that's part of the role of this work, is bringing people together to increase and elevate that message to those other levels of government and to increase that advocacy. In terms of municipal responsibility, there is a portion of the plan that's really about how do we maximize municipal resources. So, like we talked about the emergency food truck, how do we use something, an asset that we have that might sit idle, how could we use that to support some of the community organizations that are distributing food, that are doing good work, so they can focus on their programming and we can do some of the heavy lifting around the moving of food and, and some food rescue and food waste, which of course is part of our mandate as, as solid waste recovery. There's, you know, there's other things like looking at municipal land for community gardens, community plots, um, you know, some of those things that are looking with the, the assets that we have and how do we maximize them. And then the third piece is really about providing an opportunity and seed funding and that sort of starting piece to bring people together to be able to test ideas, to be able to create these pilots that then can be used to leverage to other levels of government for longer term funding, for larger pots of money to actually make these into more impactful and bigger projects. So sort of the three, three pieces there, that, that has been the role right. that, that the municipality has played in Just Food um, to date has been that helping to support the coordination and to bring others to the table. Uh, similar to what uh, Feed Nova Scotia was speaking about this morning with some of their pilot projects as well. Uh, and, uh, do I still have the time? Sorry. Uh, uh, it, so, uh, you know, we heard Dr. Monica uh, Dutt speak this morning and she said, you know, I, I asked where's the gaps for the province and I asked, you know, where's our role? And I get the emergency food truck without question. I get the expanded community gardens. Uh, I, I do the advocacy, sure. The seed funding, again, we're, uh, in my opinion, we're starting to step over that line. So look, I'll support the work that's going here, especially because we're talking about that the commitment this year has been reduced financially. I think next year when we have this conversation, I'll be looking for what are the results after this year? You know, are we, and originally I think it was $800,000, all this work here, you know, how, how many, you know, how many bellies have been f offered food is what I'm looking for. And so I'm really looking for what, what are those end results by next year. So uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you for- Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Councillor Hensby. Oh, you were done? Good. Quasi. So there are no further uh, names on the list. And so we call for the question. But is there, there is no more motions on the floor though. Oh, the main motion, I thought we already did that. We didn't? Ah. The main motion as amended. Question is called. I thought we already did. Okay. I, so colleagues, we, the Madam Clerk will check back for us. Thank you. So 
this motion for community safety has been voted on and it has passed. No. no. This one? No. I'm just looking at it. No, we haven't voted on the main motion. I think the confusion is starting with transit because we voted on transit as a whole and then came back for co Councillor Mason's two amendments or one amendment. So now we're back on the main motion of community safety that needs to be voted on. We'll take a new vote and we'll just start it now if everyone's ready. The motion has passed, thank you. And so now we can ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved by Councillor Mason and to our valued staff, thank you very much. We really appreciate you staying beyond four. Thank you.